Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1.30 session of the March 9, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for the public, for the, for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. I will note tonight that for item number 26, public comment will be limited to one minute, not the uh, two minute time period. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins. Here. Callan Perry Johnson. Here. Brown. Here. Coming. Here. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Brunner? Present. And Mayor Myers? I'm here. Okay, this afternoon, uh, our first item, number five today, is a presentation by Visit Santa Cruz County. Our presenter today is Maggie Ivey, the CEO of Visit, Visit Santa Cruz County. Uh, welcome, Maggie, and thanks for taking time today to, to come update us on your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Myers and council members. Let me pull up my presentation. Okay. I'm going to take about 10 minutes today to talk about the state of tourism, where we were before COVID, where we are, where we hope to be going. So just as a reminder, we are um, a, we're a nonprofit 501c6. Our mission is to promote the local economy um, by promoting our community as a visitor destination for leisure visitors, domestic international conference and film destination. Our priority has always been and continues to be pushing for high yield overnight business, particularly in a normal year, we'd be looking at non-summer months, but this year it's any day of the year. So we are funded through a tourism marketing district, um, which was formed, uh, the organization I should say was formed in 1988. The district started in 2010 was renewed in 2015. So all of the efforts with Visit Santa Cruz County are funded through this hotel assessment district, which is a countywide district. That's really allowed us to do a number of deep dives over the last few years. We did a rebranding. We've been able to significantly increase our investment in online marketing, which is so important in the travel industry. And we've been able to also, until this year, work closely with Visit California in developing an international market base. This is just a little bit of history of how the TMD collections have gone um, from back in 2013-14. We saw consistent growth again until uh, 1920 when COVID hit. You can see one of the reasons for the growth uh, was new property development. Two of the larger properties are in the city of Santa Cruz. Be that as it may, we really had 10 years of consistent growth in tourism for Santa Cruz, the state, and nationally. In fact, in 2019, 2020, we hit a huge milestone. It was a big year. The state economic county figures told us that consumer spending had reached over a billion dollars. So travel was generating more than a billion dollars in economic impact to our community. 
This, of course, translated into uh, a lot of support for local business as well as the tax base. Um, and again, back in 1819, the city of Santa Cruz had collected more than $10 million in TOT. Um, and then we saw a significant decrease because of the fourth quarter with COVID. And then here you can see just a visual of what happened with the occupancy last year. So significant, significant drop in hotel occupancy. And this is a countywide figure, which tracks very closely. City of Santa Cruz would be right, right here. So as a quick recap, we're talking about what was a billion dollar industry. We've suffered 30 to 50% decreases. We're waiting on the state of California to give an update on the average tourism losses in California. We should get that in the next week. But suffice to say, this is hundreds of millions of dollars in spending that's been lost to our community, our top industry in the city of Santa Cruz. Lodging is down about 30%. And industry predictions are telling us that it'll take two to three years to recover fully. Now, in the middle of all of this, we had to pivot as everybody has, and we really invested heavily in working with the local hotels, as well as the just any of the businesses that needed support. We started the um, safety pledge. We were working with the Economic Recovery Council. We also um, engaged with a, a larger membership with the California Hotel and Lodging Association which provided the opportunity for all of our hotels to participate in the clean and safe program. Um, so I would say the hotel industry, because it stayed open throughout COVID, has been really a leader in developing safety standards, and our local properties are no exception. The membership with uh, California Hotel and Lodging Association also provided a lot of PPP supplies for our local hotels, which was really welcomed. Another piece of the safety pledge was making sure that that information was available online, that on the website we were talking about travel advisories, uh, and then what's open? What can you actually expect to find if you're in Santa Cruz? And then finally, we were able to produce a commercial for local television, again, to support the idea of clean and safe of support your local businesses, but also do it safely. And I wanted to share that with all of you. To cruise safely. Your favorite local businesses are ready to welcome you back. Support your community. Take the pledge to help keep yourself and others healthy. Wear your mask. Okay, so just looking at in general terms uh, what's been happening the last few years in terms of our programming, as I mentioned earlier, heavy investment online in all online marketing, including the website, which is our primary tool for providing information inspiring travel and helping visitors to be able to easily book their travel. You can see the traffic on the website pretty consistently increasing year to year. We did a new launch back in 1617, and in 1819 we were able to surpass uh, a million visits to the website in a year. And then again, we look at 1920 and severe decreases again based on that fourth quarter with COVID. A lot of investment in social media. Social media is just custom made for Santa Cruz. We have so many stories to tell. We have so many niche concepts, whether we're talking about cuisine, outdoor activities is a big focus right now, LGBTQ, uh, it, arts, you know, it really it allows us to dig deep into our t uh, storytelling. We use a lot of blogs, oops, excuse me. We use a lot of blogs to help bolster this program. And here's a chart that shows you just the growth over the last few years. We have over 100,000 social media followers all, all combined. Email marketing continues to be a 
big part of our programming. We've segmented our email list. We get to talk to our interested households who have opted into this list about their specific interests. And in a normal year, we're communicating with them two to three times a month. Old school PR, working with travel media, still a big part of what we do. And then again, a normal year, we get between seven and $10 million in tracked coverage. So we're not letting go of this. It's definitely slowed down this year, but we have those relationships and we look forward to rebooting them. The international was, has been very exciting. It's on pause right now, uh, but through surveying, we were able to see over a five-year period an increase in our leisure visitation base from 8% international up to 13%. So very exciting. Again, we look forward to restarting this program, but it won't be happening in 2021. And then again, meetings. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that in California, there are no, there is no guidance for meetings and events. So even if we were talking about something in the future, um, there's nothing in place for meeting planners. This is challenging. We're waiting to hear from the governor's office on this, hopefully as we move into the better tiered areas. Um, but suffice to say, we work with the conference hotels like the Dream Inn and Hotel Paradox. We go to trade shows, we host meeting planners, we do site tours, all that good stuff, and help to establish our community as a great place for meetings, especially important in the non-summer season. That's great business for us. And finally, where we're going from here. So good news today, we're moving to the red tier tomorrow. Uh, I understand from sitting on the ERC that it is quite possible by early April we may be in the orange tier, so fingers crossed, looking good. Um, we're preparing for recovery. Um, everything is gonna be staged under Let's Cruise Safely and safety protocols and continuing to work with the businesses on these concepts. We've got a lot of tried and true digital efforts that we'll be doubling down on when the time is right in our drive market. So looking at um, really the two to three hour drive market, regional, that's where it's gonna be and it's gonna be about your domestic leisure market. Social media will continue to play a big part. Again, you know, we really want to be drilling down on the safety measures. Don't let go of those masks, social distance, enjoy yourself, participate in safe and fun things to do in Santa Cruz. And then finally, I'm going to show you the uh, commercial that we have prepared. <laughs>
um, and there was some concern, frankly, with locals on whether or not, you know, that was, was good or bad, but um, I think your help with um, a lot of the messaging and being really present and available to help with guidance um, was really helpful during that time so that we, you know, we were able to, to communicate to people when they come to Santa Cruz, here's how we'd like you to be with your mask and social distancing. So I really appreciate you guys um, in a time when, uh, you know, revenues were sort of contracting that you guys were still willing to put out the kinds of communications and the kinds of information that we needed to have people who were going to be here anyway, it's going to be coming anyway. So maybe they were just day visitors, but it, I think it was very helpful to have your your uh, ability and your partnership in doing that so that, you know, we weren't just trying to do that at a local government level. So I just want to recognize that because you were very much part and parcel in trying to really um, get the messaging out there that we needed both during COVID, but also during the, um, during the uh, wildfires as well. So we had a, a rough um, year all the way around and your messaging and your ability to access the millions of people who look at the, at your materials is really helpful during those kinds of things as well. And I just also want to <clears throat> recognize your leadership in, in really helping with find, um, finding evacuation um, abilities for people in hotels and, and all the work you guys did during the evacuation period as well for, for our whole community as well. So thank you for everything you did offline um, that was keeping you busy all summer long. So I'll open it up to council member uh, questions or comments. Um, council member Cummings and then council member Brown. <clears throat> Thank you for that presentation um, and all the hard work that Santa Cruz does to help drive our economy. Um, I noticed that you uh, had explicitly called out targeting um, communities that were LGBTQ, and I was just wondering if there's any targeted efforts to encourage people of color to come to Santa Cruz, and also whether your materials are offered in English and Spanish, um, especially since you're saying that kind of target demographic is, you know, two to three hours away from Santa Cruz and knowing um, the high Latino population that we have in parts of our area. I'm just wondering if, you know, for example, those commercials or other materials, if those are also um, provided in Spanish. Good question. You know, we, we aren't, we haven't started the process of translation of the overall website. We, we find that the majority of our domestic market is is english speaking but it's it's certainly something that we should be looking at absolutely we have such deep content on the site so that would definitely require a, a, a particular strategy um, in terms of investment you know it's a heavy investment to do that um, but i think it's it's good to bring it up and we need to continue to look at ways to represent diversity um, in terms of um, looking at uh, diversity in Black Lives Matter and other populations in our area, you know, we just really try in all of our creative materials to make sure that we're representative of the communities that want to visit Santa Cruz. So we continue to make that a commitment um, in, our, in our video production, in our um, storytelling, in our photography, and so it's just an ongoing effort, yeah. Member Brown. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Maggie, for the presentation and thank you for all of your work. Um, I, it was, uh, you know, really, it was really wonderful for me to be able to serve on, on the board and I learned a lot um, about kind of all of the work that goes into uh, creating this, you know, this really vibrant and um, I, I'd say pretty welcoming um, sense of our, you know, our, our community and, and inviting people to come here. And so I, I really appreciate that. I, I definitely want to give you kudos, major kudos for uh, all of the work that you've done in the face of multiple crises uh, this past year and, you know, just the ability to get creative and be nimble and really roll up your sleeves and kind of figure out how to move forward. Um, under those conditions is, is just really um, phenomenal. So thank you. Um, I, I've, since uh, Councilmember Cummings brought it up, I, you know, it's, 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 I understand the challenges with the translation, and I'm just, you know, hoping that maybe some of the higher level content or something like there might be a place to start where people would have a way into at least kind of um, 
be you know feel feel like they could um, learn a little bit about and then you know there's other ways to kind of get more information into uh, Spanish speakers hands but and so that I'll just say that it would that would be great to see um, and then finally uh, just thank you and the board for you know allowing me to participate and um, so I'm I'm not uh, leaving the board because I want to per se it um, I just have a conflict with my new teaching schedule, so I'm really glad that um, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled to pass the torch on to Council Member Watkins and Vice Mayor Brunner. I think they'll bring a lot to the the table as well. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from Council Members at this time? I am not seeing any. So Maggie, again, thank you for coming and updating us and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a much better year ahead. It might be a little slow off the start, but um, hopefully we're over the hump of COVID and we can welcome people back. So thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, we'll move on to announcements, statements of disqualifications, additions and deletions, and oral communications announcement. Uh, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers eight through 26 on your agenda, on our agenda. I'd like to ask uh, the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, we'll move on to, I'd like to ask the clerk, city clerk to announce any additions and deletions to the agenda today. Um, there were no additions or deletions of items, but I do wanna um, point out that there was a last minute update this morning to the packet to reflect the change um, in the fiscal impact section of item 20. Okay, thank you. Next, I'll uh, make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communication will occur at 6.30 p.m. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in at 6.30 p.m. And then I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Myers, members of the City Council. So after, this morning, the Council met in closed session at 10.30 uh, a.m. Uh, by Zoom to discuss the following items. The first item was uh, uh, public employment involving the uh, City Manager recruitment. The second item was a conference with legal counsel regarding liability claims. The first claim was uh, the claim of the anti-police terror project et al. Um, and that is also listed on your consent agenda this afternoon as item number 14. Second claim was the claim of Joshua Ney. Uh, there were no reportable actions uh, taken in the closed session. Uh, the third item was significant uh, or anticipated litigation. Two items involving significant exposure to litigation and one item considering initiation of litigation. Uh, there was no reportable action on those items. Lastly, there were two items of uh, existing litigation. First item was a matter in the, uh, currently pending in the U.S. District Court entitled Santa Cruz Homeless Union et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, the council received a report from and gave directions to the City Attorney's Office on that item. Second item, don't morph the wharf et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz was continued to a subsequent meeting. Thank you, Mr. Kandati. I'll now turn um, the, uh, I'll call on the city manager um, for our next item, item number six, um, for the city manager to report and provide updates on city events and business items, including um, COVID-19, the CZU lightning complex fly, fire and other events. 
Let's welcome our team. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, I've got three items to report on. Um, I'll start uh, by building on the uh, the comments from uh, Maggie Ivey from the CDC with respect to the uh, fiscal uh, conditions that we've uh, experienced as a result of the pandemic. And uh, like the tourism industry, the city has really been hard hit. Uh, we've lost about an estimated $21 million in revenues as a result of the pandemic. However, um, there is a bit of good news. So I wanted to share that in that the, at the federal level looks now like the stimulus package will go through and it will include funding for municipalities and local governments. Um, so we anticipate receiving in the order of $14 million over two payments. Uh, we don't know the exact details yet of that, but it is uh, uh, will be uh, enough to be able to make a big difference in terms of addressing our uh, uh, providing stability uh, and, and giving us time to address our structural budget problem and also to uh, really prevent some essential uh, cuts in essential services. So that's, that's a bit of good news. Uh, next step in that process is for the, now that the Senate's uh, approved that, it goes back to the House and, uh, and then after the House approves it, it'll go to the President and that's expected to happen uh, by this week. Uh, they do have a deadline of, I believe, of March 14th, but it's anticipated that it all might happen by the end of this week. So that's, that's good news. Um, the second item uh, relates to um, COVID-19, um, and then after that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our uh, fire chief, uh, Jason Hyduk, who uh, receives a, a daily or every weekly Tuesday morning briefings on COVID uh, situation locally, so he has the latest information on that. But before I turn it over to him, just wanted to also let you know that the the governor uh, also signed an executive order extending the authorization for local governments to halt evictions for commercial renters impacted by COVID-19 through June 30th of this year. And so in response to that, we will be bringing back to you, because that expires at the end of March, so we will be bringing back to you an ordinance uh, to be able to uh, do that, to extend the uh, commercial renters' uh, evictions. Uh, and so that the uh, uh, protections uh, and so that will be on your next uh, agenda on March 23rd. So with that, I'll next turn it over to our uh, fire chief for an update on the COVID-19 situation, which is improved. Go ahead, Jason. Hey, Mayor, City Council, uh, Jason Hyduk and Bonnie Bush is going to be walking us through a couple PowerPoint slides. And I'm gonna re be referring to the county website because they um, have the best information for this uh, on a call this morning. The really good news is that you can see from this graph that our number of cases is just dropped significantly, and that's why we're moving into the red tier. Um, and if this trend continues, we could um, be moving into a less restrictive tier in a few weeks following those guidelines, and this has widespread impacts, not just in the city, but across the entire county for businesses, for uh, students, for everyone who lives here. And so this is really good news. Um, and hopefully that this trend uh, continues in this direction. Next slide. So I put this up um, just to show that uh, back in January when we were having this huge spike, it wasn't just the overall case numbers, it was the impact on our local healthcare system. And our hospitals were full, they were reaching capacity, they were expanding their ICU uh, usage. And we were in getting close to 100 people hospitalized. We were in the 60s and 80s. And now we're down into the single digits as far as number of people who are in the ICU who are in, in the hospital. And that's just because of the impacts of uh, vaccination, but also just the actions individually and what they've done to limit the spread within our community. Um, and that's really good news. Uh, the effort uh, that the county health officer has been doing is you know, to prevent disease and to prevent death. And again, we're heading in the right direction. Next slide. So again, this is um, a slide that shows where we are relative to uh, other places in the state as far as our county. Um, and we started off really below everyone else and then we slowly crept up. And what I take from this slide is that uh, that curve went up and now it's flattening out and we're starting to drop down, which is really good. Uh, from the 58 counties in the state, we are six as far as the number of vaccines distributed per capita. So even though uh, I know that there's people who are frustrated with that process, uh, we are doing much better than a number of our uh, other counties uh, in the state. Um, and I, I think after this morning listening in 
with the uh, Johansson or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a single shot uh, vaccine. It doesn't require two. That is beginning to come into the county and we should see uh, the impacts of that uh, accelerate rapidly. Um, but we are doing good. Uh, we could be doing better, but um, everything uh, is heading in the right direction. Next slide. So how to get a vaccine appointment. Um, this is from the county and what, there's, what this shows here is currently we're in phase 1B, which expands the number of people uh, who are eligible to get vaccinated. And this is how they're distri distributing the vaccine. Uh, and this is the number of people that they have within the county. So 70% of the uh, available vaccines are um, given to individuals 65 and older. They're now moving into uh, emergency services, agricultural and uh, food service workers, 20%, and then education and childcare. There's been a really significant push in the last week or two to, uh, to vaccinate our educators, to get them back in school. Um, and I would expect that in the next few weeks, we'll probably get more definitive timelines for what that looks like. If you want to get a vaccine, the, the two main sources uh, for people to access locally would be to santacruzhealth.org, the coronavirus vaccine, or the state program, which is my turn, where you can register and when you become eligible, they'll contact you. Uh, the county is also out doing outreach to those um, portions of our community that may not have as easy access to healthcare. So that is one of their primary goals, uh, those, those who are most vulnerable, um, and they are doing that access. After March 15th, um, they expect to radically expand the criteria for who is eligible to get the vaccine as well as having more vaccine um, available to give. Right now, they're really limited on the supply coming in, um, but they've been pushing it out as quickly as, as possible. So I would urge anyone to go to the santacruzhealth.org uh, the corona, coronavirus vaccine or go to my turn uh, for the state uh, vaccination to, to sign up and see where you fall within that eligibility to make sure that you are aware of where you can get a vaccine, when you can get a vaccine, and I would urge everyone to get a vaccine. I know that everyone's probably read about the CDC guidelines that were just released uh, about how people who are vaccinated can intermingle without spreading uh, coronavirus. Um, and as we get further and further into this, um, I, I think more guidelines will come out and we can get back to normal uh, quicker, which was uh, kind of the goal here. Next slide. So even though we have more vaccines, even though our case numbers are falling, even though we have less hospitalizations, we still have uh, the risk of transmission of the COVID vaccine and specifically with some of the variants that have come out. And so, uh, Continue to do the things that work, which is washing your hands, wearing a mask, keeping your distance. Don't go, don't go to work. Don't go to uh, school. Don't go to someone's house if you're sick. And keep doing those things. We'll continue to keep the numbers uh, dropping, which will get our entire community back to normal sooner. Um, and that's what I have for you today. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thanks. Uh... Jason and, or excuse me, thanks Keith. And uh, we really appreciate you um, providing all those updates today and, and super excited about the, all that good news. Um, Council Member Cummings. And Chief, thanks for that presentation. I didn't quite catch it. So could you speak a little bit more to um, when we're expected to move into the red tier? And we're, in the red, we're in the red tier. Um, I think it goes into effect tomorrow, but uh, effectively today, we are in the red tier for all the parameters. We missed it last week by one-tenth on the adjusted equity score. Uh, we had to be at 5.2, we were at 5.3. So all of our numbers are really dropping week to week. Um, and so we will be moving into the red tier and all the associated uh, restrictions that for businesses and, and whatnot will be lifted. Um, but they do want to keep pushing that uh, just because those restrictions are being lifted that we're not out of the woods yet. So to continue, you know, your distancing and your masking, um, and that will get us back to normal. So just to follow up with that, um, oh, two questions, two follow-up questions. One, um, you said last time we were at 5.3, we need to be at 5.2. Do you know where we're at kind of now? Do those numbers substantially drop or? Yeah, I, I don't have the, that exact adjusted equity uh, score in front of me, but I do know that um, the numbers have dropped precipitously over the last week. Um, um, and, and here we go. So 
So yeah, we've dropped, uh, we're dropping over a point, so we're you know close to four or so. Great, and I guess my last question, if, if we have you know small business owners or people reaching out to us about being in the red tier, is it safe to tell them that we've, we're moving into that today or should we tell them as of tomorrow? Um, I think I'm going to defer to Bonnie Lipskin on uh, what the business impacts are for the actual tiers and the restrictions on the business. I believe they give a little bit of notice before they're going to uh, put restrictions in place and also some notice before they lift those restrictions just to give people time to be prepared. And really quickly before Bonnie moves into uh, explaining the red tier for businesses, uh, it's officially at midnight uh, uh, tonight is when it, the red tier goes into effect. So. Go ahead, Bonnie. Great, thank you, and good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Um, what I briefly um, put up on the screen was our uh, county um, blueprint for a safer re re economy weekly report that we prepare on behalf of the ERC. And um, basically right now, over the last week, we've dropped adjusted daily new cases per 100,000 by 1.2, um, and so we're well into the metrics for the red tier. Um, also, the positivity test, um, we've reduced that by another percent over the last week. And Dr. Newell um, had made, uh, you know, comments that, if, you know, if we continue on this downward trend, we potentially could be um, in Tier 3, which is an orange moderate tier, potentially by the end of March, beginning of April, which is a really good sign. So we do have to be in this current red tier for two weeks and meet the um, metrics for the next lower tier, which is that orange tier, before we move into it. But what that means um, starting basically effectively tomorrow is that restaurants can reopen at 25% capacity um, indoors um, or 100 people, whichever is fewer. Um, all retail um, can expand to 50% capacity, gyms and fitness centers, 10% um, capacity, museums, aquariums, 25% capacity, movie theaters can reopen at 25% capacity. Um, so it, hotels with um, lodging and indoor fitness centers, uh, so hotels are already open, but the uh, fitness centers can have a 10% capacity. So uh, it does, it, it means quite a lot for our local business community to be in the red tier, and obviously when we go to the orange tier, even more so. So this is definitely good news uh, for our community, and we'll just continue to support the campaigns that are out there about, you know, safely um, visiting, uh, you know, all of our businesses, um, which is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Council Member Golder. Um, in regards to the vaccination of the Santa Cruz City Schools teachers and staff, I just wanted to just really applaud the efforts of Dignity Health and partnering with Santa Cruz City Schools and ensuring that everybody gets vaccinated so we can get schools open um, as soon as possible. So everybody, including you know some of the retired teachers and the school board members and everybody that comes on campus, so that I'm just I was blown away with the effort and how quickly they were able to to give those extra doses to um, school staff. So thank you to everyone who worked on that. Any other comments or questions from council on this? Anything else, Martine, on your on your list for today? And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, um, Chief and um, Bonnie, for, for providing really good news. Um, so uh, things are things are moving the way we places do we, that we would like them to move. Um, next is the. Um, I'll call on the clerk, city clerk, to provide any updates to the meeting calendar for the council. There are no updates. Okay. Okay. We will now move on to our consent agenda. And these are items 8 through 21 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time for you to call in if you want to comment on items 8 through 21. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand, and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Again, this is for items eight through 21, which is our consent agenda today. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any item? Councilmember Cummings and Councilmember Brown. 
I had a comment on 10 and a question on uh, 18. Comment on 10 and a question on 18? Correct. Right? Okay. And Council Member Brown? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to register uh, no vote on item number nine, but I'll just, that's, I don't have any questions. Okay. Any other council members requesting uh, to pull any items? Okay. So no items have been pulled. And we will now go to uh, public comments. Is this, um, Bonnie, I'm just gonna check in with you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think typically you would have um, council member coming, make his comments and then right. the question. Right, let's do that. Council member coming, do you have a comment on number 10 and a, a question on 18? Uh, item number 10 is the minutes of the February 23rd city council meeting. Sure, so item 10, I just wanted to um, make sure the public was aware and for council members that um, on item on the item that was related to homelessness, I think there was a, uh, I mean, we were trying to work through a lot of information, but I think there was, um, an item within that where I was hoping to make changes to the hours for camping, and I think it just ended up being associated with the uh, the transitional encampments of the sanction encampments. And so, since we're going to be hearing that again tonight, I'll make some adjustments to that because I don't think it was clearly captured. But just wanted to point that out um, because it did come up. And then um, for item number eighteen. I just had a question for Public Works. I know this has come up in the past, and so I just want to continue to kind of see where progress is being made. But uh, I know back in 2019, one of the questions that came up is, you know, where kind of is the industry at when we're talking about refuse trucks? Where is the industry at for having electrical or hybrid um, refuse trucks so we can continue moving our fleet more away from fossil fuel vehicles and more towards uh, electrical and cleaner? vehicles and so I just wanted to see if there's any update on where things are moving with, within that industry. Sure. Uh, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, I'm happy to uh, address that question. That's a good one. Um, electric refuse trucks are evolving and they're starting to be um, more mainstream. Um, in fact, we have received a grant a $400,000 airboard grant and a, an additional $200,000 uh, VW uh, grant towards our, um, an electric refuse truck. And we're working out the specifications right now before we place that order. Um, there's a couple things that are unique to electric vehicles, um, especially a refuse truck. I mean, a range is obviously one, but the refuse truck also uses the battery to operate the, the arms. And so it's not just how far you travel, but how many loads that you take or how many um, containers that you lift and dump, and then how do you charge it? So we're working through all those details. Um, we we will learn a lot on our first purchase. Um, we're setting up the charging station, and we feel that'll be an effective uh, use for us. We'll, we'll gather a lot of information. And the, the industry is still evolving. Um, as batteries get better, we'll see that the, um, the range will increase and the cost will come down. So um, we're happy to take this first step, but we're not ready to convert the entire fleet at this point. Um, as we saw in Texas, when they lost power, they sh their electric vehicles shut down and they weren't able to operate. So um, with the, the PSP events and those type of things, we'll have to be looking at battery backups so to make sure that we can always operate um, in case of an extended shutdown. And again, all that all that's around battery technology. So we are continuing to operate and follow that, and we're excited to get our new vehicle, our first vehicle, and, and try it out and, and learn how it goes. Great, well, it's good to hear an update about where the city's going with regard to electric refuse vehicles, so thanks for that. And sure. yeah, I guess we'll, we'll stay tuned to see how things go. Okay, great. 
And that concludes all my questions and comments, Mayor. Oh, and Donna, you're muted, by the way. I'd like to now invite members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda. Now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And I'll start with Mr. Brett Garrett. Go ahead, Brett. Hi, I was confused about whether I can use Zoom or whether I have to use my phone, but now I see you're taking me on Zoom, so thank you. Um, and I appreciate uh, Council Member Cummings um, asking about the electric garbage trucks. I, I'm really happy that the city has one electric garbage truck on the way. Um, I do feel that um, anything we can do to accelerate the electrification, we should do. Um, even with the so-called renewable diesel, um, a diesel truck I don't think is consistent with the city's climate goals, and I think the diesel trucks will swiftly become stranded assets. Um, we should not purchase more diesel garbage trucks until we get some experience with the electric truck and see how it goes. Um, I want to point out today's item 25 is a legislative agenda which supports municipal fleet electrification. So I mean, we've got fleet electrification on the agenda today, which includes electrification of garbage trucks. Um, electric trucks will last longer and they'll be more efficient with lower maintenance costs. Our residents deserve the experience of a quieter, um, quieter alternative to diesel and CNG garbage trucks. And I believe the costs are declining and there will be likely more funding opportunities to support fleet electrification in the future. I don't see that these uh, diesel trucks are urgently needed right now. It's kind of a strategy that says seven years is the optimum time. But I think things are changing as, as we realize that buying new diesel trucks now, they will basically be obsolete in seven years when, when scheduled to be resold. Um, so I strongly recommend to either delay or reduce this purchase or go ahead and buy another electric truck at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up is Beverly Dejo. You should be unmuted. Yes, thank you. Hi, this is Beverly Dejo of the Electric Auto Association of the Central Coast. I'm actually the president. and. Um, I follow with Brett Garrett's comments. We have a deep concern for any new purchase of diesel. So not only is diesel fossil fuel, but it is the most toxic um, in terms of health reasons. Um, it, the particulates in diesel are, are especially dangerous. And um, I do appreciate that you are considering it, and I know that you do have the grants for for the one garbage truck. Um, I happen to know that uh, Tom Habashi, the CEO of our 3CE Central Coast Community Energy, uh, has uh, spoken uh, as this uh, about garbage trucks, electric garbage trucks, as being a favorite uh, project of his, so I know there would be funding there, and I think there would be funding also, again, from MBARD. Um, so I also urge you to please wait on this, because um, we, I think that you have them for, I thought that you had them for longer than seven years, but even so, it just is not the time to be buying another electric, uh, another diesel truck, really, with all of our climate goals and with the necessity of of addressing climate change, this really is not the time to be buying another diesel vehicle. Um, as far as uh, range, the um, the vehicles have sufficient range because they're mostly used in the neighborhoods. They don't, they're not going long distances, so they have sufficient range. And during a PSPS event, um, gas pumps are also shut down because they're run by electricity as well. So, um, and Anyway, I, I urge you to please consider not going ahead and buying these these um, 
diesel garbage trucks. It's just completely counter to our entire climate action plan. Thank you for considering. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking today. Okay, I'm not seeing any other members of the public um, wanting to speak on our consent agenda, so I will go ahead and move Mayor. on to... Really quick, oh. sorry. Um, I just want to see if Steve LaBerge is logged in. He had sent an email saying he intended to speak on item 13, but I don't see him listed, so <clears throat> if you are here, is go ahead Steve and press Steve LaBerge available um, if you're... If you're Steve LaBerge, please raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. I'm not seeing anybody, are you? Nope. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, we will bring um, it back um, to our next item, which is item number 22 on our well, we consent need, we public need hearing. We, we need a vote. Oh, I'm sorry, consent. you're right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for catching that. Okay. I'm now looking for a motion on the consent agenda. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll move the consent agenda. I'm wondering though, and I'm sorry that this is now kind of taking it out of order, but uh, given the um, the points that were made by members of the public, you know, I have the same questions that Council Member Cummings had, and I understand the the challenges and kind of waiting to see with the technology. But I'm just wondering if could we pull that item for a separate vote? I'd like to um, vote on that separately. Um, but otherwise, I I move the consent agenda with the exception of item 18. Okay. Okay, and um, Bonnie, I'm seeing someone with their hands up now in the attendees. Is that Mr. LaBerge? I'm not sure. Do you want me to unmute them? Yeah. This is L Mr. LaBerge. You can speak if you're... Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Oh, yep. thank you very much. We can hear you. Steve Hi, this is Steve LaBerge. I'm speaking to item 13. I'm the chair of the board of CFSC, and I'm here with Paul O'Brien, our secretary treasurer. And CFSC would like to thank the city council for its commitment to providing support for psychiatrically disabled adults. As the city analyst report notes on the Van Ness property. Excuse me, CFSC Mr. LaBerge. Excuse me, um, I believe we have this on another item today on our agenda. Are you speaking um, concerning the, the... The Van Ness one? Oh, that was on consent. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you so much. So we, you know, CFSC has a $165,000 obligation to the state housing and community development and our second obligation of 103000 to the city of Santa Cruz. And we just wanted to explain that 222 Van Ness Avenue property is a beautiful seven bedroom house on the west side of the town providing housing for eight low income tenants. The house is 90 years old with extensive and expensive maintenance responsibilities. Providing mental health housing at Van Ness has been a labor of love for CFSC since we bought the property for that purpose in 1989. However, it is only a break even project at best as the costs are high and the state mandates a minimum operating reserve. In the past, the city has forgiven interest payments to help support our ability to provide desperately needed mental health housing. The present city council clearly understands the very pressing immediate need for mental health housing in our community. Forgiving the deferred loan interest to the end of the loan would not have a financial impact on the city today, but would ensure that in 30 years, CFSC would be able to continue to provide low-income mental health housing at Van Ness Avenue. A future city council may not have the same commitment to mental health housing that is shared by the present council. If 3% interest is attached to our loan extension, $90,000 in interest will be due in 2049. If that interest due was demanded in 2049, this precious housing resource would be lost. Loan interest forgiveness would ensure the continued economic viability of Van Ness for mental health housing. 
So we thank you once again for your continued support of our efforts to provide sustainable, quality, low-income mental health housing in the city of Santa Cruz. We just ask that the city council consider forgiving that, that loan interest at the end of this 30-year loan extension in 2049. Thank you, Mr. LaBerge. Okay, I have a motion by, thank you. I have a motion by council member Brown and a second by, did I get a second on that? Council member Watkins. For the consent agenda, uh, and we'll, uh, <clears throat> Minus items, minus um, ex with the exception to, for item 18. So I'll go ahead and call for a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Um, and I just wanna note that you have a no vote on item nine. Correct, okay. Thanks. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We will now uh, come back to item number 18, which Council Member Brown requested to be pulled. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, this is one that I, I struggle with here. I understand the um, the immediate needs of public works, and I understand the limitations of the current technology. Um, and at the same time, I recognize that uh, to make this kind of investment in new diesel equipment is really counter to our climate action goals. And so I would like to make a motion to defer the decision on this item and ask staff to return with uh, a more detailed report on the feasibility of alternative uh, refuse technology, so electric or hybrid technologies. Um, I'll leave it there. That's my motion. And is there a second to the motion? Okay, not seeing a second. That uh, item will not, oh, I'm sorry. Council Member Cummings? No, I just wanted to make a comment on the item. Um, just uh, to acknowledge the concerns of the community, to acknowledge the concerns of my colleague. I do think though that, um, you know, we are you know, in need of refuse trucks to get garbage from people's houses to our dumps and to sort that garbage accordingly, you know, getting recycling processes and things like that. I think that that has to be taken into account so that we don't run ourselves into a situation where we're kind of pushing our, our current vehicles to their limit and then you know, potentially having breakdowns that then result in higher costs associated with, you know, trying to, whether it's rent vehicles or we're in desperate situations where we need to buy whatever we can so that we can ensure that we're getting our trash moved. So, uh, I appreciate the update that we received, and I think that, that that we're a lot further along than we were two years ago with this process of trying to get electric vehicles, but I'm not, I'd like to see us, you know, our, our public works department remain efficient with trying to mitigate impacts of trash. And so for now, I think that it'd be good to continue moving forward, but if we can have updates regularly on progress towards hybrid and electric vehicles, I think that that would be very much appreciated by the council and the community. Thank you, council member Cummings. Okay, so I will, so Bonnie, we need to pass that item, right? I will look for well, we an, need, uh, that, motion. That, that motion failed, so now we need another motion. Oh, yeah, a motion to pass item. Yeah, so I'm looking for a motion to um, approve uh, item number 18 on the consent agenda. Uh, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Cummings. I move. I'll move the item. I'll second. Okay. Uh, we will go. We have a, a motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member 
uh, coming uh, for item number 18 on our consent agenda. And can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Calantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to our consent public hearing, which is item number 22 on today's agenda. This is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-02, environmentally acceptable food packaging and products. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If there are any members of the public, excuse me, I'll go ahead and open this up um, if there are any questions or comments um, from council on this item. So again, this is the second reading of the environmentally acceptable food packaging and products. Mm -hmm. Council Member Golder. So it's, it's not really, um, you know, I, I was thinking about it during when Maggie was giving her presentation. It's not really part of this ordinance, but something that I'd love to see in the future. Um, you know those itty bitty like hotel shampoos and lotions? There's some places where I've traveled where those are just not allowed and they've got, you know, bulk products. And like for us progressive and green as Santa Cruz is, I'm really surprised we don't have something in place, you know, preventing that kind of single-use plastic waste that we have um, in our uh, tourism industry. And so just throwing it out there. <laughs> oh, great. And I and maybe staff might have some clarifying uh, description on that. Um, Leslie O'Malley's here, um, and she's our staff uh, with regards to this. And then I see that Council Member Cummings has a comment or question as well. Leslie, I don't know if you want to clarify efforts on on the on the single use uh, hotel, you know, uh, shampoos, et cetera. Sure, uh, Leslie O'Malley, Waste Production Program Manager for Resource Recovery. Uh, prior council did uh, look at this issue before um, the county has passed the measures uh, banning the single use uh, single little bottles that you're referring to in hotels. And uh, our feeling was when we checked into it is that it wasn't an, as big of an issue then and there seems to be a real trend industry-wide to move away from um, the individual bottles into more bulk processing. Um, so uh, it certainly could be revisited in the future. Um, COVID has certainly changed things, um, but we haven't looked into it uh, since prior council's interest in that. Thank you, Leslie. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Leslie, I had a hard time hearing you, but I was, my understanding, and I don't know if you mentioned it right now, is that the county made an effort towards eliminating these single-use plastic bottles in, in the hotels. Is that true? And I, I, I couldn't catch to see if you had said that or not. Leslie, you're no, muted. No, you're not muted. Better? Yeah, that's better. You're, you are a little bit hard to, to hear. So sorry. Um, so yeah, so the county has passed um, their ordinance to ban single-use shampoo and conditioner bottles uh, in hotels. Uh, when we looked at the issue, there seemed to be an industry trend in eliminating those and going towards bulk, and there certainly has been a reset during COVID. Um, and we can we look at the issue, but prior council decided not to pursue this as an issue of concern. Thank you. I just wanted to, I, I couldn't hear. Sorry. Yeah, but well, thank you. And, uh, and yeah, I just wanted to ask that to follow up on Council Member Golder's question. So, thanks. Thank you. Any, okay. Any other questions by council members? Seeing any hands raised? Um, so I will now invite members of the public to speak to item number 22 on the consent agenda, 
public uh, consent public hearing agenda. Now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Are there any members of the public that want to speak to this item? If so, you should press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Seeing none, I will go ahead and bring this back to council and I would be looking for a motion on item 22. It's a pretty much a dead tie, but we'll go with uh, Renee, uh, excuse me, Council Member Golder. I'll make a motion to um, accept the ordinance 2021-02, amending the charter, the whole rest. Of <laughs> Do I need to read the whole thing or is that okay? No, I think, I think we're good on that. <laughs> and a second? I'll second. Okay. So I have a motion by council member Golder, seconded by council member Cummings um, to adopt ordinance number 2021-02, environmentally acceptable food packaging and products. And could I have a roll call vote, please? I'm sorry, council member Golder, did you have a question? No, okay. Roll call vote, please, Bonnie. Council member Watkins. Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to our general business um, items, items for today. And next up is item number 23, which is the Santa Cruz Economic Development Strategy. And today we'll have Rebecca Unit, um, the business liaison for the Economic Development Department, um, present the report. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. And I'll actually hand it off to Bonnie to introduce the item for us and our team. Uh, great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor, members of the council, and, and Rebecca is going to be giving a, a good portion of the presentation today, as will um, our consultants um, at Strategic Economics. So I first just wanted to start out um, by uh, giving you just a very brief background before I turn it over um, to Derek. And um, this has been a long time in the making. We were wrapping up this uh, report. Uh, right before the pandemic hit last March. So we decided to delay it, um, both so that we could more effectively respond to the COVID crisis and um, immediate uh, needs in our business community, but also so that we could recalibrate the report and specifically have in sort of the longer term COVID recovery um, element. So that's what you see before you today now that we're going to go over is um, an economic development strategy, which includes a one to two year sort of COVID recovery period, as well as a longer term up to five year sort of strategy, ED strategy for the city. It's important for me to mention that this is an economic development strategy. You know, our department is called economic development, but that includes four distinct divisions. This is really focused on our business division within our department. So I wanna, wanted to frame that first before uh, turning it over to our consultants. Um, our consultant strategic economics, they're gonna give a little bit of their background today. They're gonna talk about the process, um, the outreach, um, some of the data, some of their findings uh, and recommendations. And then Rebecca is going to go specifically over some of our goals and strategies sort of by industry sector. And then I'll finish um, the presentation by just talking about how this relates to our interim recovery plan and immediate next steps. Um, so with that, I'd um, first like to just introduce and thank um, our partners at Strategic Economics. And um, we have um, here on the panel today, um, we have Sujata um, Shariva Stava um, from Str uh, Strategic Economics, and she's available for questions. Um, we have Derek Braun. Um, who will be giving the presentation, the main portion of the presentation today, and then Jesse Brown, who was also engaged with us um, through the course of our work with Strategic Economics. 
And um, on our ED sort of business development team, I want to acknowledge Rebecca and Nathan Q. Um, and I'm not quite sure if Nathan is um, on today. If he is, if he could pop on his camera. I just want to introduce um, Nathan because I don't think the council has um, met him before. And he is our economic development coordinator and he does behind the scenes. He does a lot of work here at ED. And what you will recognize as some of his work is a lot of the social media work as well as our weekly uh, blueprint reports, which you briefly saw on screen today. So I wanted to welcome Nathan officially to the council. Thank you, so I look forward to working with you guys in the future. Happy to be part of the team. Welcome, and, Nathan. And with that, I think I will turn it over to Derek Braun at Strategic Economics. Thank you very much, Bonnie, and thank you to the mayor and council members for the opportunity to present this work. Uh, uh, so I just want to open with uh, a little overview of strategic economics. Uh, we are an economic development and land use economics consulting firm based out of Berkeley, California. Uh, and we've completed a number of economic development and retail strategies throughout the Bay Area, including a number of cities just over the hill in Silicon Valley. Uh, and we're currently wrapping up work as well on, in Alameda, City of Alameda economic recovery strategy from the COVID pandemic. Next slide. So I just want to provide a little overview of our process and approach to the background analysis information that I'm going to share. Uh, and we use this information to then develop the goals and strategies in the economic development strategy document. You know, our goal really was to build on, to identify and build on the existing strengths and opportunities in Santa Cruz. Uh, one part of this was data analysis, performing economic um, data analysis, looking at industry performance and business performance in the city. We looked at uh, real estate market data as well and examined uh, some sales uh, tax revenue information for sales tax, transient occupancy tax, admission tax to gauge how the, some of those industries were performing in the city. We also had a process of outreach to key stakeholders to really get on the ground information. So we conducted a series of focus groups with various businesses and uh, partner organizations with economic development and city department staff as well. As Bonnie mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic struck during the midst of this process. So we did have a moment of retrenchment and looking at some of the uh, survey results and looking at some of the key trends and issues that were arising as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this whole process went through a city staff input and review and our deliverables include a background report for the analysis and drafts of the economic development strategy. Next slide, please. So I just want to take a moment to thank all the stakeholders in Santa Cruz who participated in this process through those focus groups and some follow-up interviews that I mentioned. There's a whole lot on this slide, and I just really appreciate all the time and, and input that was shared. Next slide. So I, now we're getting into the sort of meat of the, the background findings that resulted from this study. Um, I'm going to sprinkle in some COVID impact information throughout. But as far as the impacts on uh, the city and its support for businesses, I think none of this will come as a surprise that you know, we, you're all well aware of the tax revenue situation resulting from uh, the pandemic and the effect on the city's budget in the near future. Uh, this will, of course, have impacts on the capacity of city staff and some of the city's partner organizations of workforce development and business support going forward. But I just want to call it how critical it is that uh, you know there's there's a short-term focus of the strategy on assisting businesses to sustain operations and recover, uh, and it's going to be really important to dedicate some support to ensure that you know, businesses can bounce back faster in Santa Cruz. Next slide. So as far as the, the tourism and hotel findings, uh, you just heard some of this from Maggie Ivy, but there was really strong job growth and strong performance of hotels and of uh, visitor destinations in Santa Cruz prior to the pandemic. About 23% of the city's jobs are in some way related to tourism and hotels, although this also includes restaurants that are serving local residents. Uh, really, the market is heavily driven by Bay Area and California residents. About 37% of visitors come from the Bay Area as of about 2016, according to Visit Santa Cruz County. Uh, and there's, there is a highly seasonal leisure-based uh, tourism industry in Santa Cruz, and so there's uh, this longer term effort to try to diversify some of the visitor segments and maybe was speaking to that earlier as well. We can really see in the transient occupancy tax revenues chart on the right 
um, the third quarter of the year, 2018 is just a, an example of this, um, third quarter of the year and some of the second quarter really outperformed the uh, off-season quarters really dramatically. We also found that some older hotels in Santa Cruz do require some updates, have undergone some disinvestment. It's a little challenging in the city because there is so much demand in the summer season that sometimes uh, the, the hotels don't need to reinvest to attract some of that demand. Next slide, please. Now, you just heard a more detailed rundown of, of hotel and tourism impacts and outlook uh, from Maggie, but uh, we find that generally Santa Cruz is well positioned for recovery, at least on the basis of having those uh, that two-hour drive time visitor market segment. And really, the, the chart down below shows the hotel occupancy, year-over-year -year percent change in hotel occupancy from in 2020 through January 2021. And what's interesting to note here is how in September of January 2020, the hotel occupancy which is just one of many indicators, but hotel occupancy actually was about the same as the September for the prior year. Um, and so much of that is because of the emphasis in that drive time market. But as Maggie said, there's a lot of competition for it now. And there will need to be this longer term process to diversify some of these market segments to attract uh, more visitors in the off peak seasons. We looked at small businesses and commercial districts in Santa Cruz, and you know, about 70% of Santa Cruz businesses have fewer than uh, 10 employees. So small businesses really are the lifeblood of Santa Cruz. Uh, we, in our conversations with a lot of small business owners, we found there are challenges with accessing city services or knowing who to call for maintenance of public spaces or how to uh, learn how to address homelessness issues impacting businesses. There are also challenges raised around traffic congestion uh, and therefore uh, customers not being willing to drive as far or take the time to go to businesses. Uh, there's opportunities for transportation and pedestrian bike improvements to improve this access. And we also heard about parking challenges in some of the light industrial districts, like the West Side Industrial District, where more customer facing uses have grown and there's more parking demand now. Next slide, please. As far as COVID-19, small businesses have, of course, been heavily impacted. They've had to pivot their business models to e-commerce, curbside pickup, different mixes of products and services. Um, they're, at the same time, they're dealing with additional costs for health and safety, cleaning and mass compliance measures while experiencing reduced revenues from capacity and operations limits. This, of course, leads to what we're all familiar with at this point, with the eviction risks and rent burdens and the risk of temporary and permanent closure. So this speaks to the need for ongoing financial and technical assistance support uh, to help these businesses come out of the pandemic uh, in good condition or better condition. In terms of the retail and shopping districts, specifically downtown and east side midtown areas, we saw there's the, if this is being shared across the nation, the shift towards experiential uh, storefronts, that is to say away from selling apparel and hard goods and soft goods and more towards uh, things like restaurants and dining and entertainment and uh, fitness and services. You can see this in the red line in the chart showing rapid growth in the restaurant and hotel sales tax revenue category since the Great Recession. Uh, we found that as a result of this trend, there's a need to kind of expand the definition of anchors in downtown. You're not likely to get that big destination store anymore, but instead you should, the strategy now is to go after some other uses that might attract a lot of foot traffic, such as medical offices, major entertainment destinations, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot, there's a demand for quite a bit of office space in downtown these days, which is uh, at a level previously unseen, at least before the pandemic. We also found that the east side and midtown area could function better as a cohesive retail destination, potentially, if designed for improved shopping between different storefronts. And next slide, please. Looking at the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on retail, we've seen the short term, we're all familiar with the, the impacts in personal services, dining and soft goods. We have seen that grocery stores, convenience stores, um, they, they've done very well during this period with people cooking from home and doing more at home, drug stores perform well. Uh, long term, we expect essentially a return to several of the longer term trends, returning demand for personal services and restaurants while the stores that compete against online shopping will continue to be challenged in that, in that way. If anything, this has accelerated the shift towards e-commerce quite a bit. For education workforce and commutes, we found that 
You know, about 75% of the workforce in Santa Cruz comes from outside the city itself, while about 25% of the city's residents commute over the hill to jobs in the Bay Area. Um, we heard from every single employer just about that high housing costs are a top workforce attraction and retention concern in the city. I can't emphasize how, how many times this came up. Um, the city has a robust network of workforce development organizations and business support organizations, and there are uh, there's a very good relationship between business development and those organizations. Next slide. Now, I'm going to talk about a few specialized industry, industry sectors we identified in Santa Cruz. These are sectors that uh, we found are especially concentrated in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, they have grown rapidly in most cases. They have a lot of growth potential in most cases. And they also reflect some of the city's past priorities and plans and policy focus areas. Altogether, these five sectors constitute about 18% of total jobs. And they have all grown faster over this 2009 to 2018 period than the city as a whole. Employment growth is about 23% over that period. Um, and except for biotech and life sciences, which had a slower growth rate. But I'll walk through these one at a time. So for biotech and life sciences, this is a very small, but very unique and concentrated cluster in Santa Cruz, but really supported by a lot of assets in the city. There's, uh, of course, UC Santa Cruz with its Genomics Institute and also the Startup Sandbox Incubator. The sector is growing a little more slowly and is relatively small compared to the biotech industry you find in the Bay Area, but still this is a very unique niche that Santa Cruz has. Technology and innovation jobs experienced rapid growth over the past decade. Uh, now, Santa Cruz, in many ways, is less competitive for these jobs in the Bay Area just because it's further away from the venture capital and the total magnitude, just the sheer number of people who work in the sector is, is relatively small compared to the Bay Area. But this is a sector that has a lot of ongoing growth potential in Santa Cruz because there are so many workers uh, in this sector who live locally in Santa Cruz and they seek to start businesses or would prefer to work closer to home in San Cruz. Next slide, please. So this is a good segue into the office impact from COVID-19. And you know, currently most office workers are working remotely, but long-term we will see this return to workers wanting collaborative work environments and businesses wanting collaborative work environments. So we do expect most workers to return in person at least part of the time. And this trend could really favor Santa Cruz because there's going to be greater potential for satellite offices, co-working spaces, or even just workers working from home more often who might then keep their dollars in the community itself instead of going elsewhere. The sports and outdoor recreation sector is incredibly important in Santa Cruz. It's a global brand name for, for sports and outdoor recreation. And uh, so it's a very highly concentrated and rapidly growing sector that attracts a lot of out outside spending and investment. There are some challenges looming just with the limited availability of light industrial space. And really a big thing that we found in Santa Cruz is, is uh, very strong demand, very low vacancy rates for light industrial space. And another competitor for that space is this artisanal production. Uh, this is your specialty food and beverage companies, coffee roasters, breweries, wineries, um, any kind of small maker. These, these uh, businesses do also require smaller and flexible industrial spaces. Next slide. Finally, last but not least, uh, one of the topic areas that we really drilled down on is city services and processes. Uh, we found that there are a number of business owners did mention that they were unsure about how to access city resources or had some frustrations with prior experiences about approvals and permitting and development requirements and issues that arise as a result of community opposition being able to throw up obstacles. This came up in the context of projects such as tenant improvements, parking modification, signage, temporary structures, and outdoor seating and lighting. Now, staff has been doing and the city has been doing a good job of proactively trying to address some of the obstacles and trying to streamline and clarify uh, and, and resolve some of these concerns. It's possible to some extent this is perception based on past experiences, but it is a perception that is out there. Uh, and lastly, uh, there was, we had some discussions about how the economic development department, business development can support other departments. There's some new opportunities for interdepartmental coordination and business outreach. 
uh, as part of some of the future sustainability projects that the city is taking on. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, so that was a really good overview of a lot of the um, study and data that we reviewed in terms of developing our actual economic development strategies. Um, so this document uh, that we have attached in your packet is a five-year implementation plan um, guiding the work of the economic development uh, business development is vision. Um, and so the first two years of this work were really focused on COVID-19 recovery. Um, we see that taking us through to the end of 2022. Um, and then we'll be shifting over to more of the post-recovery effort. So beginning in 2022, ideally through um, the end of 2025. Um, the strategy also includes a lot of work that we do uh, on the day-to-day. -day. This is sort of our ongoing efforts that we continue to do. And it's really important to the basis of our um, our role in the city, and so we see those efforts, um, you know, living on beyond this strategy, um, but just wanted to set the stage for the timing of implementation for this. Um, so the document is divided into seven top criteria uh, categories, and I'll talk through each of those uh, categories for you, um, but they're laid out with specific goals, strategies, and actions. Um, within those categories um, and you'll see in the document that there's a matrix in terms of the timing of each of those activities, uh, who's working on those, where they're located, um, and uh, how we intend to track those activities as well. Um, so I'll just give a high level overview of uh, what ended up being 44 strategies that we're excited to take on over the next five years here. Uh, so our first category, um, which is the most important and um, the activity that we're focused the most on right now is COVID-19 pandemic business support and recovery. Um, so the main goals of this is continuing to monitor, um, monitor the existing needs of businesses, um, looking at ways to provide continued assistance, uh, new tools. Uh, you know, some examples of this is our temporary outdoor expansion program that's been incredibly successful. Um, and we're continuing through October of this year. Um, we're also looking at opportunities to position businesses to recover quickly. Um, and so as part of this work, uh, you know, we've been maintaining our business resources landing page on the ChooSantaCruz.com website, our economic development website, um, and businesses can access that at ChooSantaCruz.com slash coronavirus. Um, so maintaining all of that information around changing state regulations, uh, health requirements, where to get a vaccine, how to safely reopen your business, um, and the different support uh, tools that we have available. Um, we've also had our existing financial and technical assistance resources um, that will continue through this strategy. So our Santa Cruz Resilience Microloan Program that we launched last year, um, and the Get Virtual Program, which we're providing funding to to help businesses uh, get online, get some e-commerce uh, tools to compete on that larger scale. And we've heard some really great success from businesses that have participated in that. Um, so continuing to support that and really seeing that as a recovery tool, um, a way for businesses to um, move out of sort of the crisis response and into growing their business even stronger um, as we recover. And then we're looking at the new opportunities under this category of um, we are participating in a countywide revolving loan program, which we're calling Grow Santa Cruz County, uh, partnering with National Development Council. That was a $2.75 million EDA loan uh, from federal government. Um, so that's going to provide more capital to businesses countywide. And um, we're working with all of the jurisdictions in the county, as well as the Small Business Development Center. Um, so it's a really good opportunity and really came out of the collaboration that we kicked off um, in response to the pandemic and some bi-weekly meetings that we're holding with all of our jurisdiction partners um, and support services that are responding to businesses' needs. Um, another opportunity that we're looking at is potentially a second round of that resilience microloan funding. Uh, we've been doing a lot of outreach right now, um, working with the DTA and through our newsletters and through the Economic Recovery Council um, to gauge the need for businesses. So what are the gaps that still exist in the funding that's available, who might not be receiving um, funding for whatever reason, uh, time, you know, the time that they've been in business or their type of business or things like that. Um, so seeing where we can really have an impact, um, you know, where the programs aren't meeting their needs. Uh, so our second category um, is focused around tourism and hospitality. Um, as we know that this, this is a 
key part of our um, local economy. Um, and it was one that has, you know, been really hard hit under the pandemic. And so looking at ways to um, continue to stabilize this industry, um, look at ways to uh, work on the shoulder and off peak seasons, um, diversifying the market, similar to what was discussed earlier with Maggie Ivey, uh, making sure that we're reaching our drive markets and also reaching different demographics and making sure that how we're marketing our area is attracting new visitors um, to our space and that we're being inclusive and in who we're inviting here. Um, and then expanding resources to um, promote and enhance tourism and visitation, and also looking at uh, revisioning the Civic Center and some activation of our city-owned public spaces. So um, as business development, just providing support for some of those larger projects that we have going on in the city um, and ways that we can involve the business community in those activations. Um, just some examples of things that we've already done. Um, we were flexible in our TOT and admissions tax um, collections in response to the pandemic, uh, just recognizing the real impact that those businesses were experiencing and changing the collection timeline for that. Um, we've been supportive of Visit Santa Cruz and the Let's Cruise Safely campaign and the safety pledge. Um, and then we're also, something that we're looking to more long-term is um, potential state and federal funding opportunities um, to help mitigate the impacts of sea level rise and looking at ways to support um, some of those businesses who might be uh, needing to adapt to the changing climate, um, so keeping that on our horizon. For the third category, um, this is our small businesses and commercial districts. Um, so this is really focused on the day-to-day -day work that we do in the business development division. Uh, we are sort of the front line, friendly face at City Hall for businesses, helping them navigate the process, uh, creating a welcoming environment to them. Um, so we're really looking at um, improving those processes, improving the information that we're sharing to businesses, making sure that we have that available on our website, that we're creating easy to access handouts and that our colleagues in different departments know uh, that we are an available resource if they get a question from a business um, that they might not be able to meet. Um, and then it's also looking at um, how do we support our businesses in the built environment? So uh, improving streetscape, um, working on pedestrian, bicycle access, making sure that our commercial districts are a welcoming environment, people can get to them easily, can uh, have an enjoyable experience when they're accessing them. Um, we're also looking at a little bit of the wayfinding piece. So we've you've seen our beautiful new wayfinding signs that are out there. So looking at expanding on that. And uh, yeah, Amanda Rotella, shout out to her for the excellent work on that project. Um, and looking at ways to bring that down to the pedestrian level. Um, so getting more branding into our um, commercial districts and more placemaking happening. Um, so, so similarly, I mentioned earlier, um, just continuing to rely on our partners in the community. So this is a small sampling of some of the business support organizations that we work with. Um, and we've had a great relationship with them uh, pre-pandemic and it's just gotten stronger through the coordination efforts that we've all been involved in. Um, so just continuing those uh, regular meetings with them and coordination and creating a program specific to our business needs going forward. Um, so some of the specific areas that we've looked at too, uh, we work really closely with the downtown, but also focusing on our midtown uh, business districts that's really grown and they've got a nicely organized group of businesses that are doing collective marketing. So supporting their efforts um, and meeting the needs uh, that they have in the streetscapes where we can play a role as the city. Um, and similarly with the West Side, um, helping to cultivate some organization of those businesses and, and finding what needs they have um, to help make that commercial district even stronger. Um, in terms of retail and shopping districts, this is our fourth category. Um, this is more focused on uh, the business attraction and retention side of things. So looking at what is our business mix downtown, what are you missing that maybe you can't find when you're shopping downtown and how can we um, attract this business to meet that need there? Um, it's also uh, an opportunity for us to tackle, um, you know, some of the vacant storefronts that we have. We're working on some programs uh, to create maybe an incubation or um, some sort of subsidized space program um, to 
provide opportunity for uh, woman-owned and BIPOC businesses to have, you know, their storefront downtown um, and trying to reduce some of those barriers to access in those spaces. And Bonnie will talk a little bit more about that um, when we get into the interim recovery plan tie-in. Um, but just really taking the chance to look at the opportunities that we have um, with the current state of some of our vacancies and ways that we can find those new anchors and create some new attraction into our shopping district. And then on our education and workforce uh, section, this is really focused on uh, relying on our partners. So workforce development at the county level, partnering with UCSC, Cabrillo College, um, all of those partners who can help us create uh, workforce development, workforce retention programs, um, looking at ways that we can um, you know, broaden our employment base and really provide uh, workers with the skills that they need to get into some of these higher wage uh, jobs and to support the industries that we have here who are having trouble retaining their employees um, for whatever reason, uh, and largely one of those major reasons is the workforce housing piece. So being able to support from the business development side, um, building more workforce housing, supporting employers who are looking at ways to maybe partner with others um, and just meeting those needs. Uh, that was something that we've heard for a long time and it was really present in our outreach uh, most recently for this. So being able to support uh, those workforce housing developments. Um, and then for the specialized industry sectors uh, topic, this is um, something that we might not think about too much in terms of Santa Cruz when you think of us as a tourism place, but we also have all these really incredible uh, burgeoning businesses and um, they have a lot of space needs. So we uh, have some limited industrial space and so we've seen a lot of businesses struggle to um, grow here in Santa Cruz or um, you know, we, we've struggled to retain some of them just because of the lack of industrial space. So looking at um, how we can support the, you know, remodel of existing spaces, more development of it, um, and also just what partnerships we might be able to create between businesses and between the university um, so we can really retain, retain those businesses here. And then finally, our city services and processes, as uh, is something that Derek touched on towards the end of his presentation. Um, and this is also something we've been working on extensively over the past couple of years. And um, we have really strong partnerships with our colleagues in planning and all of our different departments that touch the permitting process. Um, so just continuing that work. Um, my position was actually created business liaison uh, to meet this need. Um, and so being able to um, track where people are in the process, get an understanding from maybe economic development where we're outside of the permit system and weigh in on you know, what that experience is for businesses so we can make sure that our marketing materials and our um, applications and our processes uh, make sense to the community um, and that they're able to get into them quickly and efficiently. Um, and also making sure that we're putting out enough information. You know, I don't think that we can over communicate what our processes are um, and how people can get help. So just continuing to do that work is very, very important. Um, and then in terms of tracking our success, uh, we will be monitoring these seven economic development indicators, um, new business licenses, sales tax revenue, POT, building permits, employment and unemployment rate, real estate market data, and discontinued business licenses. Uh, this aligns with some of the tracking that we're doing through the interim recovery plan. Um, and it'll just give us an, a way to track on a quarterly basis um, how we're performing, how the local economy is performing, um, where are some areas of needs as we move uh, through this strategy over the next five years. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Bonnie to talk about some of the overlap between this strategy and the interim recovery plan. Great, thanks Rebecca. And b before I, so it's right in front of you, before I go into too much detail, I did wanna back up just a second and talk about the overall needs that led to um, what's in the interim recovery plan and what's in sort of our goals and our strategies going forward. And as Derek indicated for the preparation and sort of the, the data and the outreach related to um, the ED strategy, 
similarly, um, during COVID, we've had this regular sort of feedback process in which we've been working collaboratively, as Rebecca mentioned, both with you know our neighboring jurisdictions, but with all of the organizations that Rebecca showed in that slide to make sure that we're getting real-time information about what our business needs are. So. Uh, we have actually participated uh, through our various partners and our own in the downtown ERC um, with over four surveys um, over the last year to our business community that really gave us comprehensive feedback on what the needs are and sort of drilling down on what can actually, as a city institution, economic development provide. So uh, when we go into some of the more near-term specific projects in the downtown and citywide that are reflected in the interim recovery plan and that we'll come back to you in the next couple months ahead as each program and project is ready to move forward for your consideration. And we'll give you more background on how we got to these, um, how we got to these points. But specifically, some of the top needs that have come out um, from the survey, um, you're going to see, you know, as uh, our city manager mentioned earlier, you know, this afternoon, sort of that support for commercial evictions, you know, with the governor um, recently enacted the executive order allowing local jurisdictions to extend at a local level commercial, the moratorium on commercial evictions through the end of June. This is something that uh, repeatedly on outreach, we received feedback on, on this need for support to not be evicted, to not be evicted and also to have rent support. Um, similarly, um, you've seen, we took to council um, at the last council meeting support for Senate Bill 314, the Restaurant and Bar Recovery Act. Um, and that's something similarly that we received feedback from a lot of uh, the restaurants on just that needing that ease of being able to get permitting for outdoor expansion during the pandemic and beyond um, for recovery and for uh, trying to re recoup some of the loss um, that they've experienced. So you'll see some of these that aren't specific programs, but they're real-time needs that we're addressing um, through coming to council for consideration. Um, we're working on a few things. Um, a lot of the feedback we've received is on outdoor dining, uh, making permanent uh, permit uh, and reduced regulations on how to streamline sort of the permanent parklet program. Uh, low cost, low barrier access to capital is even with the PPP loans um, that are available, we'll um, have more coming on that. There's still that need for gap financing and for low cost, low barrier interest financing. So that leads a lot both to um, our NDC uh, Growth Santa Cruz program that we're expanding countywide uh, through the EDA grant that we collectively uh, received. So we're pretty excited about that. And then contemplating doing the round two of the um, uh, specifically of our microloan resilience program based on feedback. Um, marketing signage, both signage um, that were open. A lot of businesses have requested that need as well as signage that says, and wear your mask and be safe. Um, so these are different things that we're working on with our partnering organizations, including the Downtown Association, Visit Santa Cruz, and through the ERC, and that you'll see some policy uh, changes coming and recommendations coming in the months ahead. Um, as Rebecca mentioned a few minutes ago, you've um, heard about sort of uh, the need to do a, uh, sort of a, a pop-up program or a vacant storefront program, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But those are sort of the short list of some of the needs that have been expressed to us, um, and that both is reflected in the data that we have available, as well as the specific sort of stakeholder group and survey feedback that we've received. Um, so. Uh, that's sort of with that sort of quick overview, um, I wanted to talk just very briefly about what's in the interim recovery plan in the focus areas um, that's responsive to these needs. And specifically, as, as you're aware, you know, the three focus areas in the interim recovery plan are fiscal sustainability, uh, downtown and other business investment, and infrastructure. And so the four specific things that we have in this plan that relates to that, that are current projects that are underway or ongoing, of course, is the work master plan, business support, and infrastructure. And of course, you approved today two uh, grant applications that we'll be submitting to uh, do some pretty serious expansion of public access on the wharf. Um, our library mixed use affordable housing project is another one of those that touches on several of these categories, both, you know, reactivating and reinvesting in public spaces in our downtown, as well as providing critical affordable housing. Um, that uh, project, in addition to Pack Station South um, and our Metro Pack Station North, 
you know, collectively has the opportunity to bring up to, you know, between 250 and 300 affordable housing units in the downtown. So this both gets at addressing uh, some of the critical need we have for affordable housing and the high cost of housing in our community, but it also starts touching on some of the workforce housing and the inclusionary ordinance modifications that we've taken to council within the last few months, specifically the school district employer-sponsored housing and more to come on that. Uh, wayfinding, as Rebecca mentioned, with a shout out to Amanda, who's been working on that project. You do see now those signs citywide and some of our gateway signs. Next step on that, next on that, is doing some specific follow-up work on specific banner work across in our commercial areas around the city, as well as some of the gateway signage, for example, on the wharf, um, and that we need to go through a public process um, to really vision what that signage will look like. These are all sort of infrastructure enhancements that you'll see in the coming years. Uh, next slide. Uh, so first I wanna talk about some of the citywide projects and programs that we're proposing as a response to the ED strategy as well as the um, assessments or needs assessment that we did. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, permanent outdoor expansion parklet program, we have a very successful temporary program and the overwhelming feedback we get is, can we streamline a permanent program to make it much more accessible? How do you reduce the overall cost of what a permanent parklet and what those costs would be, which can be anywhere from you know, 40,000, you know, in some cases up to 80,000 or more to create a permanent parklet that has you know, a substructure, you know, steel or wood frame base and that's safe to the to the public. That's a high point of entry, and it's it's cost prohibitive for many businesses, certainly in this current climate. So we've been doing outreach. We have a, a very specific survey for restaurants um, that's out right now, and we're getting feedback from them and from designers, and actually getting some cost estimates on several template designs to be able to put together sort of a package program that's hopefully user friendly. That we've sort of pre vetted internally across uh, you know our internal departments. Uh, both planning, building, public works, um, and a fire from a safety perspective so that we can hit the ground running with this program and potentially even source some of the materials or provide some small grants to sort of you know, offset some of the cost of businesses and restaurants in this time being able to expand. So that's a program we're hoping to bring forward in the next month or two for you. As, as you're aware, we currently have the temporary permits go until October of this year, but we wanna make sure we get this program out so that businesses have time to apply and get that in place before our current temporary program expires. Uh, Rebecca already mentioned our Growth Student Santa Cruz Loan Program. We're pretty excited about that. Um, and then the potential second round of our microloan resilience funding. So we want to come forward to you and have a little analysis of some of the feedback we've received. We've done that briefly before um, and some of the needs assessment, looking at some of the new stimulus funding that's coming out, uh, similar to the 28.6 billion um, that's coming out specifically for restaurant relief. We really wanna look at what that available funding is and make sure that we're presenting something for your consideration that's not um, being met in another, in another capacity. Um, additionally, we're looking at some of the feedback we have is that need for commercial district marketing. You know, we have several very successful, you know, downtown is, is one everyone's familiar with, but our sort of burgeoning midtown, you know, some call it east, you know, east side midtown um, shopping area, as well as, you know, a developing shopping area on our west side and the Swift Street Courtyard area and um, also on Delaware. So really trying to support them. Some of that includes investing in some infrastructure, particularly on the west side, um, which is primarily, you know, an industrial area. So if we want to do, for example, banners, we need to make sure the poles are there to accept the brackets for the infrastructure, things like that. Um, but uh, shop local campaigns that we'll be working on with some of our area partners, both on the downtown and the east side, as well as through the ERC um, and Visit Santa Cruz. And then one program that you may have just started hearing about that will come before you in a, just a larger capacity soon is our CARD program, which is sort of that intersection between within economic development with our arts division. And this is a city arts recovery design program, which is a pilot grant program. And we've been working with the Arts Council about helping us with this program. And what's really interesting about this program is this both helps and the goal is to help some of our you know, our very vibrant um, artists and um, Santa Cruz is known as sort of the creativity, you know, sort of, you know, of the area 
cultural center and our artists are no exception. We have an amazing artist community in Santa Cruz and the Arts and Recovery Program is basically a call to artists to respond, to help us respond um, to recovery efforts through art. And so that could look anything like some activation of our vacant storefronts downtown, some really creative um, murals. It could be street performances that help activate spaces. There's just a, a, a sort of a limitless ideas of how we could use this pilot grant program to help with some of our recovery efforts. So we're pretty excited about this. And um, one of the elements that you'll hear a little bit more when we when we bring this forward in more detail is that this has sort of three uh, program themes as part of it. It's um, arts and economic recovery, um, arts and community connectedness and restorative justice, and arts and public health safety. So those are our themes for this program. And when we get uh, proposals, um, there will be a panel selection, and then those proposals will be invited to more fully present their, their projects. So hopefully we'll be able to fund a few of those um, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming months and year. And uh, finally, specifically for the downtown, in addition to the citywide uh, projects that I mentioned, the vacant storefront activations in our master lease program is something that we've been uh, working on, you know, I'd say over the last month, we've been meeting uh, with a, a both our downtown brokers, some of the property owners, and getting feedback, um, and also talking with Event Santa Cruz and a couple other local sort of consultants on how best to partner to make this program successful. So we're pretty excited. We're hoping to bring this forward to you within the next month, um, month and a half. And the concept is that we get you know up to 10 vacant storefronts, primarily on Pacific Avenue, where we guarantee a certain cost per square foot. And then we're responsible and take on some of the liability. Uh, we're responsible for curating those spaces and getting getting the tenants in there and the activation. So the majority of them would be retail pop-ups. Uh, there may be a few, a couple that are really trying to bring in some activity, that experiential retail um, that Derek was mentioning earlier as well. So for example, we might even have a pop-up little mini performing um, you know, art sort of art recording studio or something like that, or some of the ideas that have been have been popping up. So, uh, we'll come back to you shortly with that program. I will say that a couple of these programs do have a cost to them, uh, you know, a, a, a not insubstantial. And uh, the the reason why we're still proposing that we invest in a, some of these programs, or is that effect that it has on the surrounding businesses? So, for example, in a downtown like ours that is incredibly vibrant, um, when you have a number of vacancies in the downtown. Town. It has that effect overall on those, you know, our incredibly local independent uh, sort of tenants and retailers that are open in our restaurants. You know, they're, they're struggling. They need the support. They need that vibrancy. They need that activity. The more our community and visitors see how active our downtown is, the better all of our businesses, retailers, restaurants will do. So by filling those vacant spaces, uh, filling even just the storefronts, if we don't have them all filled with pop-ups on a six-month basis, just getting them activated, getting activities, uh, really just bringing activities to downtown is really going to help considerably. So we're pretty, um, pretty gung-ho on this, and uh, we'll present this um, to you shortly. Um, I already mentioned marketing, sort of wayfinding, beautification. We have some major infrastructure projects in our CIP budget that have been bond funded. So some of those are funding for some of the larger infrastructure projects. Um, Rebecca mentioned a revisioning of the library civic core project. We have kicked that off. Um, what that is specifically is a commitment that we made to council over last summer to look at the existing library site and looking sort of in the context of a large sort of civic center of the city hall campus and sort of that civic center to our downtown of what that could look like in the future. So that will be a public process that we're kicking off. Lower Pacific Avenue improvements, downtown beautification, and downtown alley improvements are all bond-funded projects that we have in the CIP. And in, with the current sort of lens on COVID recovery, um, it's always been a, uh, we will get to these uh, infrastructure projects, and now the urgency is really here that we get to these projects within the next year to two as part of COVID recovery efforts to really reinvest in our downtown and link these with some of the affordable housing and market rate projects that are currently underway. So that's a, and I know that was a lot, um, the projects that are in our interim recovery plan and um, that are relate to our economic development strategy. And we're excited to present this to you today. And um, all of us are here to hopefully answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bonnie, Rebecca, um, Derek, and uh, 
it, yeah, obviously you guys uh, don't have enough to do, and you're obviously underachievers based on everything we just heard. No, um, yeah, just uh, very, uh, very comprehensive and um, just really thankful um, that we have your team working on this. Um, myself and the other three mayors meet um, every every other week, and um, um, they're just, you know, the, the cities in Santa Cruz County, the other three cities, they're just um, very jealous that we actually have an economic development department. I mean, uh, this is a, a, a quite an opportunity for us as a small city, and, um, and Bonnie, you and your team are doing a, an amazing job. So I will go ahead and open it to council questions and comments. And I've got council member Cummings, council member Golder and, and vice mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor. And thanks for that presentation. That's a lot uh, to take in. I just want to get a little bit of background. I, for whatever reason, I'm trying to think back to, you know, my early times on council. I don't feel like I ever heard anything about this plan kind of moving forward with the, you know, getting a consultant and, kind of where we're at today and so i feel like that's why i feel like it, for me it's like a lot and so i'm just wondering if you could speak a little to kind of how this came about to kind of where we are today and it looks like some of it was through you know there's a 2017 2019 plan so this might have come out of that so i'm wondering if you could just provide us with an update on kind of how this all came about sure and that and that's a great question um yes um we did have a previous plan and we at that time it was a work plan um and as we went through it and we were looking at the next period and it, it was pre-covid you know we thought that it was really important with such a diverse economy that we have locally to make sure that um we were uh, fully addressing the needs and uh, not missing any opportunities um, for supporting our businesses and our industries that we have here locally. And so um, that was the rationale behind um, going out and partnering. Um, and we put, you know, we did a public process, a request for proposals, and went through the process of selecting strategic economics. And, um, it, you know, as I said, it really was to come and would have come uh, I think in, in early 2020, but for the delay of the pandemic. And so um, that's why there was a bit of a gap between our work plan and um, our new um, ED strategy. But just recognizing what the needs are locally and wanting to make sure that we're fully addressing those and understand um, what both the needs are as well as the opportunities. Great, thanks. And then I do have, have a number of questions I'm gonna try to tie some of them together so that, you know, there's, it's not a question of going on and on forever. Um, first question, you know, this is a pretty, I feel like the topics that were brought to us were fairly broad, so I'm just kind of curious what the prioritization will be, or is there going to be a process for kind of prioritizing um, when certain things will be worked on and kind of how that's going to fit into this? Because it's a long, it's like a five-year plan, right? So. That's right. And so our prioritization is really focusing for the next one to two years on COVID recovery and for those major initiatives that um, intersect, you know, sort of that are our nexus with an interim recovery plan. So if you look at the projects in the interim recovery plan, and you'll see, you know, sort of the downtown recovery that's specific to COVID recovery and some of the projects that I mentioned in the last few slides, those are our priority projects for the next two years. Um, some of the infrastructure projects we're trying to time with some of the downtown development to be the least disruptive um, for our businesses downtown. So we have, uh, for example, we have uh, bond funds set aside for beautification. So whether it's, you know, working on sidewalks, working on paseos, uh, street trees, um, overall sort of enhancement of street furniture downtown, we're trying to time those um, to be the least impactful um, with the uh, surrounding development. So we'll be coming forward to you, um, you know, as these as these projects come forward. I will say, you know, part part of our issue, and certainly because of the pandemic, uh, you know, and as, as Derek mentioned earlier, we do have some capacity issues. You know, I, I wish we could take these all forward at once, but we are a small team, um, so there may be some opportunities um, that we present to you to be able to move some of these forward, and we'll talk about how how we move those forward and and, and what's involved in that. So those will be some decision points for you, I would say, over the next six months to a year. The, 
some of the larger ones around the industries, if they're not time specific and when we have goals in them. I mean, we meet regularly with both our partners with the university, you know, ongoing and sort of the tech bioscience, you know, as those opportunities arise, you know, we support both the organizations and are working with, you know, constantly applying for grants with other organizations. So some of those will be, if we get grant funded, we'll be going full steam ahead on some of these other initiatives as well. Thank you. Um, my next question, one of the comments that I heard come up was um, around the commercial eviction protection. Is that something that council will need to take action on? Or because I think what I understood from when you were speaking was that the governor has allowed for local jurisdictions to make that extension and the governor didn't make that extension statewide. And so is that something that we will need to have come back and to extend? Yeah, so that is our understanding and, and um, Tony's words were out of an abundance of caution. We want to take a city specific uh, um, action on this. We had a previous action that we took back in June, which allowed us to extend um, our current protections as long as the state authorized us to do so. Um, but we want to make sure that there's no question that we're supporting it, which is why we want to take a specific action. I think Tony's on, so I'll let him answer that more directly. No, oh, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's pretty, uh, there's a pretty good argument that the ordinance that was adopted by the council in June was extended by the governor's subsequent order. I think it was 80-20. Um, um, but we just don't want there to be any question about that. So we're recommending that it be brought back to deal specifically with commercial uh, tenancies as opposed to the way it was originally drafted. It applied to both residential and commercial. And so I guess my, the follow-up question to that is, are we anticipating that's gonna come back at the next meeting? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, my next question was around um, some of the workforce development piece. And so I'm just curious if, if you all been in, connect, in contact with some of the local unions around kind of what they're doing around workforce development as it relates to the trades, because um, those are well-paying jobs and I know that they've expressed for a lot of time that they struggle with bringing more young people into those these days. So I just wondered if that's on the on the list too for groups to engage with. Yeah, and actually Rosemary, if she's on, um, just uh, sent us an email today that she's been, um, that it looks like we may be moving forward um, with a special support uh, on, for workforce development with, um, let's see, I'm mean, gonna see if I can pull it up. Rosemary, are you on? So we have sort of, while I'm waiting to pull this up, um, we have been engaged um, internally as we were talking, you know, uh, you know, a number of months ago about sort of project labor agreements and workforce development and a series of meetings um, with businesses and with that need both for, you know, um, apprenticeship and workforce development. So that's part of the scope for the year ahead is specifically to look at that and look at what trades and what tra what technical assistance programs, you know, whether it's through, you know, Cabrillo, UCSC, uh, CSU, and, and B of, of being able to support that. So that is something that we'll be working on in the year ahead. Um, let's see. Yes, so this is Civic Spark Fellow. So it looks like we're moving up in the process to have a Civic Spark uh, Fellow whose scope for the next year will be workforce development. So we'll all be sort of working on that together. Thanks, that's great. Um, I heard there was a term that was mentioned that was, I wasn't familiar with, and I wonder if community members <laughs> might, be, um, might not be familiar with it as well. But when you refer to light industrial space, I'm just kind of curious what that refers to. Sure, uh, that's a reference to, as opposed to like some sort of uh, heavy manufacturing space, it's uh, more of a research and development or flexible use space that's still um, not finished out to a high degree. It could be used for you know, those smaller artisan, maker, food production, small scale kind of operations. Great, thanks. And I'll just follow up with a few comments because I know um, we're probably running out of time and I have so many questions, but um, I know 
you know, to the points that you that were being made around, um, you know, businesses in other parts outside of the downtown. I know there's been some, and there's been some community members on the west side interested in creating of a west side business district. And so it'd be great to kind of get a sense of kind of how that's moving. Um, I know in particular the, the new owner of Mission West was interested in trying to set something up. So if there's a way to kind of get an update on either that or maybe, you know, have further outreach to understand, you know, what can be done to support that effort, that'd be great. Um, I've been hearing a lot about people moving out. I know there's, a, there's this issue around kind of workforce retention. And I've been hearing a lot about how um, a lot of folks have been moving to California because of COVID and the cost of living. And so I don't know how that's impacted our community, but it might be worth, there's a way that we can kind of try to capture some information on whether we're seeing um, an out, you know, an outflow of people out of the community and whether that's kind of matched with the influx of new residents coming in that might be interested to understand how that might be impacting our workforce. Um, I know that Get Virtual was mentioned. <laughs> My understanding from last year was that Get Virtual was really there to support existing businesses, and I wonder if there might be an opportunity to support people who want to kick their businesses off and how that can fit in also with the um, pop-ups. So it'd be great to just get some feedback and feedback on that. Um, I noticed that cannabis wasn't mentioned um, in terms of specialized industries, and with that industry growing, rapidly i'm just you know rather than increasing retail i think there's a lot of different aspects within that market that we could probably you know around manufacturing that might fit well within um you know kind of the growth of the industry and also just you know seizing the opportunity given that santa cruz has had a long history and the fight for um the legalization of cannabis so how we can kind of work to build that in um and as i mentioned not so much I think we have plenty of retail, but then, you know, around manufacturing, testing, all those other kinds of aspects of the industry that are needed. Um, and then again, just kudos on the outdoor parklets and keep and like really supporting businesses with that because so many businesses have been able to kind of, you know, float through COVID with that. And I, I just imagine that it's only going to help with tourism and everything moving forward to really have that kind of outdoor experience in our community. And so with that, I will uh, yield my time to other council members. Council member Golder. Thanks to Bonnie and the team for that comprehensive presentation. And I know you have tons on your plate, but I just had one thought of something that was maybe left out, an area of town that will be emerging um, as we move forward. And that's the corridor along the rail trail. I mean, um, I just was thinking like if anyone's walked the High Line in New York where there's public art and there's, you know, gardens with native plants and there's, you know, little cafes with food for sale or things like that. And so I just think um, to that end, if, if, and, I, and I don't want to throw one more thing on your plate, but if it comes up where the, the, you know, the, there's opportunities to redevelop areas along that corridor to uh, make it more you know, green friendly for biking and walking. And you know, I, I, would, I would like to see that too. Yeah, I would re be remiss if I didn't mention at this point since um, another division of our apartment worked uh, long and hard on our Rail Trail Arts Master Plan. So that is a, a plan that we have, and um, that is something that you will see as each segment goes goes forward. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, I have uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Watkins. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the economic development team, uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, Dave McCormick, Nathan Q, Rebecca Unit. I mean, truly the front line for small businesses and very responsive. I've been uh, working with them through a lot of these initiatives. And uh, thank you to Strategic Economics for adjusting and working with the department. Uh, really to align with the COVID-19 goals and strategies and um, and implementing it with interim recovery plan and focus for our small businesses and, you know, our business support sector. So um, I'm very excited about the City Arts Recovery Design, uh, the CARD pilot uh, grant program. 
and the collaboration with the arts and the local artists in, reco in our recovery efforts. I think that's very exciting. Uh, Bonnie, is that uh, opening up uh, Friday, March 12th? Was, do you know when that opens up or where there's information about that? Yeah, Kathy Mintz, um, it currently is managing our arts, arts program and um, I believe it is, she just sent me an updated timeline, so I'm checking it through right now, but I believe it is March 12th. Um, so we are looking at, you know, part of the process will be the call to artists for proposal, and that's sort of part of the first step. So Wednesday, May 12th, is, it will actually go to the Arts Commission, so that will be the first public meeting will be Wednesday, May 12th. And um, then the, uh, we'll have an orientation in early April, um, for artists so that they know, kind of understand the program, the pilot program, and um, then we'll have a panel review starting in mid-April, and by May, um, we should actually have the final list of recommendations for um, the pilot. Great, thank you. I think these, um, all of these, I think there's, what, seven categories here, um, very thorough and uh, very hopeful and promising. So um, I'd be happy to make a motion to accept the Santa Cruz Economic Development Strategy Report. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Is there a second for that motion? Council Member Brown? Yeah, I'm happy to second. Um, and since I'm up next, just ask, I have a, just a couple of questions. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's involved in this, who knew all of this was going on, like right right here next door at, the, at City Hall, and I've been over to your offices, and um, it's, I'm just amazed by uh, what you all do, accomplish, uh, you know, and, and the planning that goes into this, but also all of the kind of action, on, you know, on the ground with businesses. <laughs> um, and so I just, I wanted to ask a little bit about the, um, the in light industry, just to follow up on that. <laughs> um, so we have limited space um, available, I get that, but we do have, it seems to me there's a lot of land over on the west side in particular in that industrial zone, and so I'm just wondering as part of this process, I imagine there have been conversations about developing those spaces that, that don't aren't built out but are exist, right? <laughs> Um, less so in Harvey West. And so I'm just wondering if there's like discussions with the property owners or potential developers about what, you know, what, what would need, be needed to kind of make that, that kind of development happen over on the west side. Uh, so that's one question. And then with respect to the downtown storefronts, I'm so excited to hear um, about uh, the plans that you have or the, the work that you're doing in that arena. Um, yeah, because it's definitely a concern that I've had and I know others have had, uh, you know, what's going to happen with the, you know, the empty storefronts. And um, so my, I guess I, the question I have is um, in terms of work with commercial landlords, how that's going, is there, um, you know, because it's just a different kind of relationship um, with businesses being in and out and, you know, the um, financial feasibility of that and all of those other things. So I'm just wondering if you, if you could talk a little bit more about that. And since I just thought of it, I'm also going to ask if there's any conversation about uh, what's going to happen with the Cinema 9 space, because that's a pretty big space. I'll, I'll talk about Cinema 9 first because we we have been engaged uh, since the uh, sort of announcement first came out and surprised everyone every one of us, including the owner. Although I will say, with trends nationally, wasn't a complete surprise, but it was a surprise that we didn't hear about it in advance. So um, we have been in discussions with Sayufi about Cinema 9, and um, you know I have mentioned this previously, but they do have direct theater experience. They used to own Century 21. And um, so they're contemplating, you know, looking at long-term theater trends. Um, they're contemplating, do they try to get another theater operator? Do they do it themselves? Or do they, you know, look at the future and, you know, come up with a different uses for that space? And so they're kind of entertaining and evaluating everything right now. 
Um, we've connected them to a few and sort of working with our downtown association and our very actively engaged, you know, community have uh, connected them to a few um, pretty exciting uses and they've toured the spaces they're talking through. And, um, you know, one of the things, if it does uh, ultimately go through as a theater, is that they will want to serve, which you'll see, you know, in theaters across the country now, we're kind of slow in coming forward to this, having that ability to serve mm -hmm. Uh, more regular food service and sort of accompanying wine and beer. So that's sort of a requirement for theaters because that's one thing that sets them apart from necessarily Netflix at home. It's that sort of concept of, you know, being able to have that more greater experience for theaters. So for theaters to survive, they're really going to need that. We did take that ordinance. Um, Rebecca worked a lot on that right sort of pre-pandemic um, to the council and actually Marty Ackerman worked on it with our theaters as well. So. Um, we do have that ability to do that now, but they, you know, individual theaters will still need to get that permit. So we have, have told them we're happy to work on them with that to uh, make that happen. So I think our priority number one is still to see if there's any viability for a, a theater for maintaining a theater. That's our number one priority. Um, these other uses, just because of what that draw still, I think, has and that impact in a downtown. You know, that space is 20,000 square feet. It's huge. Um, so, you know, we really need to be thoughtful about if it's not a theater, what is it then? Um, so those are ongoing conversations. Stay tuned. We're also specifically looking at Palace and sort of the combined use of the space and what physical changes, you know, uh, tenant improvements could potentially could be that could be kind of interesting. So um, that's um, on that. On the downtown storefront, as I said, we have been talking through both what, um, from a perspective, from a landlord, are they willing to take that risk? I mean, that's why we're really approaching those that are vacant, and we're really looking at a six-month increment. So basically, you, we get it in there. We're curating um, both sort of either new concepts that have great business plans. Um, we're reducing the risk for the landlord by guaranteeing a certain dollar per square foot, and then the rest of it can be a percent on sales. So the, the, there's the potential there for the landlord to get almost full market rent, but that reduces both the risk on the landlord side as well as the risk for the new business of trying to start a new business during the current sort of pandemic environment. But it's intentionally only six months because, you know, if they're doing really well, you don't really need the city in there anymore. And we'll, we'll get out and they'll, they'll continue on and, uh, you know, we'll support, we'll support the program elsewhere. But the idea is to really get that activation in downtown and really try to help jumpstart the recovery. And then finally, you asked a question about light industrial. And, you know, some of the spaces, particularly, you know, as we see in like the Delaware edition, you know, some of these things have projects there, you know, really well poised, you know, you see the activity with Venus, you know, in Delaware and some of the other uses. Um, I think they're well poised to be able to move forward in some of those areas, further development on the Swiss Street Courtyard. I do think, though, it's a balance because we do want to preserve certain amount of light industrial manufacturing. You know, the recent announcement of Joby, you know, aviation, I, you know, I want to, you know, there's any opportunity to get, you know, a portion of that 5,000, 500,000 square foot manufacturing facility, you know, on the west side, you know, I want to make, you know, be able to help make that happen. So I think we really are trying to balance sort of the need of emerging areas and recognizing that we still need to balance for some of these other uses um, that are still viable uses and really contribute a lot to the local economy, both, um, you know, in jobs as well as revenue. And Re Rebecca, you may want to add to that. Yeah, I think you covered that really well. Um, I'd also just add that some of the properties on the west side do have some environmental overlays that we have to contend with um, that you know might not be obvious to the naked eye, um, but there are some some issues there. Um, but definitely working with those uh, property owners to see you know what potential projects we could have, um, and also just looking at some of our existing industrial properties and is there redevelopment potential there or ways to sort of reconfigure those spaces um, for the changing business operations. Um, and I, I think too on the Delaware edition, um, we're always balancing sort of some of the development fees that come with new tenants, um, some of those impacts. So working with the property owners and the tenants to see how we can support, um, you know, traffic impact fees come to mind and things like that. So. Um, there's some implications that can slow some of that progress, um, but we're definitely uh, there in those conversations. I'm happy to support. Okay. Any, uh, uh, 
Yeah, I've got other council members. I just had a question about the process because I thought I heard a motion in a second and we haven't gone out to public comment yet. Yeah, I realize that. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'm trying to just make sure every council member's got time to ask questions or make comments and then we'll go out to public process, out to public comment. Council member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor, and I um, I appreciate, as everybody else has already shared, just our you know economic development team. The wayfinding signs are awesome, and the report is really thorough. And I um, just also want to call out that I think it really does follow a lot of the best practices in terms of just this constant feedback loop and um, adaptability, really, as we move forward with these uncertain times. I guess my question is. Um, Slightly a comment and a question, and I know that we could probably spend a lot of time because economic development is so critical, but I'll um, keep it to this one. Is one thing that we know is women have been um, disproportionately impacted by this economic recession, and primarily women of color and in the tourism and um, hospitality type industries, which we have. And I know that that is something that as a nation we need to focus on in terms of big structural change, and I'm all for that 100%. And um, sometimes change can start local if we can see what we can do here locally. And so I'm wondering how, um, you know, how that has come about in terms of your thoughts or what you've heard back from some of the business sectors and how at some point we can not necessarily change what we have here, but maybe, um, add to it some sort of priority uh, focus area on supporting women and women of color in our economic development strategies. Child care is an essential component of that. And I know we also have a lot of vacant spaces and child care facilities are um, limited and difficult. So just kind of wanting to hear what you guys maybe heard from our business community and some thoughts you might have on this topic. Yeah, I'll start out and then Rebecca may want to, to add some to that. You know, we did have, um, you know, as one of the categories for our resilience microloans uh, for women um, and and that was, and BIPOC. And so that was 50, I think it was like 56, 57% of our loan recipients met one or both of those categories. So um, that was definitely a focus um, that's become a focus as we're sort of moving forward. We're having that lens both from the IRP standpoint, but all the work that we're doing. We're really you know, working as a city, as a city team to try to integrate sort of these practices um, and lens as we look at programs and projects going forward. Um, so you'll see that in our card program, our arts and recovery design pilot project as well, as just one of the themes that we're inviting um, for applicants um, going forward. So that's just something that we're trying to integrate in all the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kalantar Johnson. Yes, thank you. I'd like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues and thank you and your team for this um, incredible work and the report. Um, a lot of exciting pieces. I was really excited to see the workforce development portion and linkages to career pathways. Um, so I had a question about that and then a comment. Um, just in terms of career pathways, are we looking at um, connecting with our university and colleges or are we going back into the uh, maybe not K through 12, but the 9th through 12th education system and, and the CTEs that are part of our education system. So how does that look? That's the question. And then I'll wait for your answer and then I have another comment. I'm actually going to defer first to strategic economics on sort of overall trends and what they're seeing. And, um, and then we'll go kind of go from there. Okay. So right, so for workforce development strategies, um, they uh, we are looking at things that go all the way from working with youth in internships and mentoring opportunities and creating those longer term career pathways and certainly adult education is a component of that too. So we would see the school district as, as being a really important partner um, as well as Cabrillo College and some of the other workforce development organizations that are already in Santa Cruz and the labor organizations as well. So I think that the way we had been looking at this is just, um, you know, again, this is contingent on capacity and um, opportunity to implement, but really thinking about starting to have those conversations in partnership with these other organizations to develop those projects and initiatives and 
have more of a convening role in coordinating with all of these different organizations. And I would just add uh, to that that if we're successful, and it seems like we're on track to give the civic, um, to receive a Civic Spark Fellow, it is a full-time position focused on workforce development. So mm. I think we'll have that opportunity to really work on the scope and make sure we're addressing what the needs are of our community. Great, thank you. Um, so um, my other sort of comment question is um, thinking about youth and the needs of youth and how they can contribute as we are re-envisioning our um, retail and our downtown and our midtown west uh, east side space. Um, uh, something council member coming said sort of just brought this, this thought process on around our um, growing cannabis industry. Um, and, and we know that there's revenue that can be generated there as well as our alcohol industry. Um, and I would hope that we can balance um, oversaturation and and um, not go in that direction, uh, you know, to ensure that, that access and availability of substances to our underage youth is not increased through this new, you know, this new path that we may be taking. Um, I mean, I think, I think we can balance, I think we can do both, but just wanted to really call that piece out. The numbers show that we have some of the highest rates of binge drinking and um, cannabis use among our underage youth here in our in our county so as we are envisioning what the retail and what the direction can be um what are the needs of the youth how can they contribute to this and um, ensuring that we don't increase access and availability thank you so much for your work okay thank you. um i'm just going to do a time check we're running about 15 minutes late on the item but um we have a cushion um between uh, we're just eating into our little bit of a dinner break that we have, and I do know we have a pretty big item uh, behind us, uh, behind this item. Um, Council Member Cummings, did you have any more comments or questions? Okay. I'll, I'll um, I off. just like. So, sorry, I'll just hold my okay. question until after we hear from the public. Okay. And I will open it up to the public. Is there anyone in the public that would like to make comments? Now is the time for members of the public who are interested in speaking to the council on item number 23, the Santa Cruz Economic Development Strategy. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a present, excuse me. If you are, uh, here, I see some hands raising. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And I see a caller number with the phone number ending in 5362. Go ahead and welcome. Just press, there you go. We can, you are available. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, uh, Judy Grunstra. And um, a lot of uh, material has been presented to you this evening. Um, and um, this continues to be a top-down process. And I'd like to remind council that not everyone's on board with 100% of these plans, specifically the wharf, the farmer's market move, the process that arrived at the necessity and wisdom of demolishing a library that can, in fact, be renovated. So please don't dismiss the positive alternatives that uh, many community members are trying to present to you, a uh, different vision of downtown. Uh, don't think of this as being obstructionism, uh, but rather real concern for the future livability of Santa Cruz uh, downtown and the value of public space, uh, which is contributes a great deal to a community's health, physical health, mental health, and economic health. Uh, so, you know, many people have different ideas of what uh, can be downtown there. Um, and uh, Bonnie referred to the disruption of downtown, and I had thought about what that's going to be like uh, in the coming months and years when there's a great, you know, number of uh, large projects going in and that is going to definitely be destructive to downtown businesses so uh, hopefully there'll be some coordination there about you know 
that won't just keep people out of downtown. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Thank you. Next up, I have a caller with the name of Rosa. Please go ahead and press star nine and star, star nine to unmute, excuse me, uh, star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead, please. Um, Mayor, I, I tried to unmute her and it says I have to promote her to a panelist, so I'm gonna do that, give her one second. Okay. She's gonna be show up in as a, as a panelist, Bonnie? That's right. Hi, I'm on the computer, is that okay? Yes, that is fine, go ahead. I just yes, wanna say, um, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I just want to say that um, I like that you have an economic development plan. I like that um, that you have staff and uh, to to work on that. I like that you have all these beautiful pictures in your background that show Santa Cruz, the lovely Santa Cruz that it is, with the trees and the hills and the ocean. And I like the way that you're thinking about housing for families here. And I like that you're thinking about the design and addressing the needs of the community. I want you to all remember that when I speak on item agenda 24. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public who want to address the council on item number 23, the Santa Cruz Economic Development Strategy. I am not seeing any additional hands, so I'll bring it back to council. Um, if you don't mind, council member Cummings, I might just say a couple of things. Um, I had one question um, regarding some of the data in the report. Um, one thing struck me uh, in the some of the data in the back of the report, it looks to me like, um, you know, we have about 63,000 uh, residents, um, and it looks like we pretty much are right around 29,000 folks are employed. And so I'm just curious, is that, um, so, you know, that in some, some ways that would be concerning that half your half your residents um, are not employed. Um, so I'm just curious, is that a reflection on um, sort of the, you know, the, the amount of, for example, people who maybe are retired living here, or is it um, the fact that, you know, in many ways we have some of our population is obviously made up of, of students that may be, you know, full-time going to school. I'm just curious if you could, uh, just speak to that. So I'm looking at figure 13, which is on page 48 of the report, and it's a little table that says um, workers employed, it's talking about commute patterns, but I was just kind of struck by the uh, number of workers versus what I know of as our population. Just curious about that. And um, if you could speak to that just very, very briefly. I guess that's for Derek. <laughs> Sure, that's a good question. Uh, and so I don't know the exact breakdown of, of uh, who might not, you know, might be included in working and not working in Santa Cruz, but I think you just hit on a lot of the, uh, the big ideas. I mean, so anyone under 16 wouldn't be working. Most people under really, you know, 20, the early 20s wouldn't be working uh, or would have part-time jobs. There's a lot of students in Santa Cruz, as you said, and then uh, anyone uh, who's retired obviously wouldn't be included in that number. So that, those would be the typical causes. And so your 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 analysis of our sort of our economic base, it, you're not showing that we are. It doesn't appear that we're underemployed by any means. I mean, it does seem like our employment base is, is fairly strong. Um, just curious about that. Those who want right. a job seem to be pretty well able to get a job, in other words. Yes, yeah, and I haven't seen the latest unemployment numbers for Santa Cruz, but my understanding is that it's been pretty, pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I just wanted to just clarify that. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I'm also just very interested in um, really understanding um, how we can attract more green jobs. Um, Bonnie, to your point, uh, really understanding what 
uh, what opportunities might be there and making sure that we retain those that light industrial space. I mean, so much of it used to be over in Harvey West. That's largely, um, uh, you, you know, using, it's been used, I know, by a lot of cannabis businesses, which is great. And obviously some schools have moved into those, into those buildings as well. So it does seem like light industrial is a really important focus area for us as we move, move forward. And um, so I'm really, I was really excited to see that kind of come out in, in the uh, plan. And I uh, just want to thank you and all your staff for the thoroughness of the plan. Um, I does, it does seem to provide us a really uh, clear roadmap. And um, so thank you for, for that. Uh, Council Member Cummings, did you have additional comments? Yes, thank you. I just had one quick question as it relates to the civic. If we end up receiving a civic sparks fellow, is that work plan also going to come back to the council or would it be better for us you know around workforce development if we're going to um make any recommendations that we make those today i you know this is rosemary uh submitted this and she she is you know really taking that on so i don't want to speak for rosemary i'm just looking at the communication that came today on it i imagine um you know this part of this was coming out of the work that you know, she was really doing with you when you were mayor and sort of following up on that work and moving forward and sort of recognizing that's a real need, I think, for long term, for, you know, some of the trades that we have in the community and that real need, um, particularly in, you know, in water and public works, et cetera, to have, have those trained in apprenticeships. So I, I you know, I, I believe that this is something that you will have, you know, future opportunity to weigh in for sure. I don't think it's just we hit the ground running and you hear about it when it's done. I, I, I think that there will be engagement. Great. That's all I had. And thank you all for all your hard work and for bringing this forward. And, and I just wanted to take a, a second to, to, you know, thank Strategic Economics again, um, but also to acknowledge, you know, the hard work that Rebecca, you know, put into sort of finalizing this report and bringing it forward and some of the, the supporting team that you don't hear about. Because we are a small team and we are really trying to focus that this was the business aspect and not the whole department. But because of the nature of our department being so small, it really is almost everyone in our department is helping implement you know, these programs and projects as we go forward. So I definitely want to have a shout out to our, enti our entire department. And then from there, you know, we don't do it alone. So it's our partners, it's our community, it's the internal, you know, our other departments within the city. So we're all, we're all doing this together and we're, um, that's what makes it all possible. So thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you to your team. So I have a motion from Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Watkins. And Bonnie, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. And the motion is to accept the Santa Cruz Economic Development Strategy Report. All right, thank you. Um, Council Member Watkins? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And um, it is 417. I know we have a number of people who have been waiting on I the next item. Um, I'd like to give the council about five minutes. We've been sitting for since 1030. So I'd like to give us about, um, let's take five, let's take 10 minutes. Um, I know we could all use that for just a short break, um, and we'll reconvene at 4, 4.25, 4.27, actually. I mean, yeah, 4.27. Thanks. Ten minutes, everybody. Council members or <clears throat> excuse me, when council members return, if you wouldn't mind, just turn on your camera. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. Okay. 
Uh, next up on our agenda is going to be item number 24, which is the objective development standards test fits and general plan slash zoning reconciliation and community engagement. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in uh, using the instructions on your screen. The order of this item will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Okay, and today our uh, presenter is Sarah Noyce. Uh, she's a senior planner with our planning department and Matt Van Hoy with, is also presenting today uh, and he is a principal planner. So welcome Sarah and Matt. Hi, good afternoon council members. Can everyone hear me? I'm using a new microphone today. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so this is a project that we have been working on for um, a few months now. And uh, we are coming back at this point in time because um, the last time when we were at the city council in um, January of 2020, sort of talking about the scope of this project to develop objective zoning standards. Um, and there was, there has been and continues to be this sort of question about whether the city should also be engaging in a project to um, amend the general plan. At that point in time, we talked about how um, doing this first step of the process and creating these, um, what we call a test fit, that would be a good time to check in again about potentially pursuing a project to amend the general plan. So that's why we're back today. And um, I will go ahead and share my screen so we can get into it. Okay. So um, we're going to be talking today both about the outcomes of our test fit analysis and the recommendation of the planning commission based on that analysis. And we're also gonna be covering the community engagement strategy that we are um, is planning to use with doing this project to update our zoning code and create objective zoning standards for multifamily housing. So just a little more background, because I understand we have um, a bunch of new folks who, who may not have been following this project from, you know, back since August or perhaps earlier than that. Um, and we also have two new council members I want to acknowledge that we're, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So a little bit of background. The city has uh, an adopted general plan. It's the 2030 general plan. Uh, it was adopted in 2012. And that is the general plan that's in effect and um, regulates land use development in the city. Currently, the city's zoning code doesn't implement the general plan. Typically, there is a period of time after a general plan is adopted while a city is you know, adopting a new zoning ordinance to implement the general plan. Locally, that effort was called the Corridors Plan. And um, you know, it ran into a lot of concerns in the community. People were really concerned about the amount of change that was included in the general plan and um, really weren't happy with the direction that that plan was going. So um, there hasn't been much work done on that since 2017. And officially in August of 2019, the city council um, canceled that project, directed staff to piece work on it, and to begin a new effort to reconcile you know, the change areas, the mismatch that we have between our general plan and our zoning code. Um, that coincided with some state law changes. Um, SB 330, the Housing Crisis Act, passed at, in September of 2019. And that's a law that really um, limits the discretion that local jurisdictions have in approving housing projects. So in October of 2019, we got direction from the city council to pursue a grant to create objective development standards. So um, we went ahead and um, you know, submitted our grant application, got our funding resources, and then just as we were getting ready to launch our RFP, um, that was in the spring of 2020. And that spring of 2020 didn't really go the way any of us expected it to go. So it took us a while to really to get our RFP out and get our um, consultant team on board. We did select a great consultant team in the summer of 2020. We're working with urban planning partners as our prime consultant doing the um, planning and urban design and overall project management. Strategic economics is on our team to, to support the economic analysis components. And we're all, they're also working with InterEthnica, who is um, a community outreach firm that really focuses on making sure that 
uh, outreach is both language translated and also culturally appropriate to um, reach diverse populations. So we're really excited about working with this team. So what is an objective standard? We use this uh, term a lot. So this is a, um, a tool that we are gonna be creating that is responsive to the Housing Crisis Act. That, that act, SB 330, says that an objective standard involves no personal judgment. So it's, it's not a matter of reducing shading. It's a matter of shading shall not exceed 30% of the neighboring property on you know, December 15th of a given year. So it, it's delineated very um, clearly. So it can be known in advance by both the decision maker and by the project applicant. And the idea behind us that the state is pushing is that the number of um, housing units that are planned for every jurisdiction in the state may actually get built. Um, that is sort of an ongoing issue that the state is trying to address is the total number of housing units um, that are being built each year in the state. Ideally, that also then increases having these objective standards, increases certainty for both the community and for developers. So if we all know exactly what the standards are, then we all know what we should be expecting on um, a given piece of property. So locally, when we were thinking about how we we're gonna do this project here in Santa Cruz, um, we're focusing on zoning standards for multifamily housing. Um, and, and we are focusing also specifically on we want to make sure these standards work for rental housing. They'll apply to both rental and for sale housing, um, but we are um, most concerned with being sure that they pencil out for rental projects. Um, we also are bringing an equity and social justice lens to this work. There is a lot of history in zoning that has created really unjust outcomes, and we think this is one tool that can help address that. And we're also going to be focusing on equity through our community engagement process and really focusing on reaching populations that haven't been included in past planning work. So I'll talk about that more towards the end of our um, my presentation today. Um, I do also want to mention we are focused on equity and on smoothing the um, you know, smoothing the process for multifamily housing development to help the city meet its housing goals. And I do want to acknowledge that this project itself doesn't involve changing any of the maps about where that housing would happen or how much housing might happen on one property versus another. That would be another project to make changes to the map. So I put this picture on here just to give an example of the specificity that we could get with objective standards. So this is an excerpt from the city's downtown plan. This is already in place downtown. But it talks about, you know, putting a minimum recess, you know, that's no more than, you know, 40% from one end of the building to the other. It talks about the top floor being 60% of the area um, of the floor below and not more than 60% of the building length. So you really, you can see how these types of standards can really be written in a very specific way that um, can really dictate the form of a building and really help a city Gain, some, gain back some control over the urban design that we have kind of lost by um, not being able to use our um, design review processes that we have previously relied on. So um, I mentioned that we're not making any changes to the map. So I just wanted to share this map in particular. This is the general plan mixed use the, um, land use designation. These are the areas that were designated for change in the 2030 general plan. And these are the areas that, you are, that we hear concerns about from the community. And primarily, we hear concerns about this mixed use high density designation, which is the um, which are the parcels that are shown in brown. You'll see that they're concentrated along Soquel Avenue and then in two nodes on Water Street. Um, and this land use designation allows um, a more intense development than we allow anywhere else in the city except downtown. So, um, the two, I'm gonna explain in a minute what a 2.75 FAR is, um, but just to be clear that like these, these are the maps, these are the areas that were designated for change. The areas that are shown in white here mostly didn't change between um, the 1990 general plan and the, and the current general plan that we have. Um, I'd also just like to note, um, I think in the letter it mentioned that the uh, mixed use of visitor commercial it mentioned that Ocean Street was designated for mixed use medium density. And I'd also just like to note that Ocean Street also has a, um, that darker orange color is mixed use visitor commercial, which does also allow up to a 2.75 FAR. So both the orange and the brown parcels allow this like more intense level of development than we allow elsewhere in the city. So um, why do we do test it? 
you know, why is this part of the process in developing new zoning standards? Um, so first of all, we just as planners and consultants, we want to understand does zoning and the standards that are in the general plan, um, do they work together? You know, can we actually reach these maximum capacities that we're required to sort of accommodate under SB 330? Um, because once we understand if what, you know, what we have, then we can kind of understand if we, you know, might need to be amending the general plan because really 2.75 FAR um, is like w bigger than anything we've seen anywhere, bigger than what we have downtown. Like, we, you know, until we put these things together with all of the zoning standards, so the setbacks, the parking requirements, the, um, you know, shading standards that we do have already in our code, until we put all those things together, we don't really have a sense of how they work together. So um, we wanted to spend a little time focusing specifically on this MXHD designation. We know it's been um, um, the focus of a lot of the concerns from the community. So there are two pieces that we look at. We look at a physical component, so looking at a sort of just a basic building envelope of like how could you fit a building on a piece of property with these standards and just sort of a basic layout, like could you get cars in and out, could you meet parking standards. And then there's an economic component. So assuming that you can lay out a physical site, um, what's the cost per unit? Um, and then is that a cost that could be managed in the local housing market? Um, and then as you start to, you know, consider different scenarios, how do that, how do those different scenarios affect the cost per unit? Um, so we looked at all of that as part of this process. And um, just mentioning again, we focused on rental housing specifically, and for the purposes of this um, exercise, we are looking at non-density bonus projects. So density bonus just introduces a whole other host of complications, and um, we are really focusing on what's our base project, what's our, what are our base standards that, um, how can we get those to work for development? So the results of that analysis, we looked at MXHD, which all of those sites in the general plan carry a zoning of community commercial. So um, laying all of those, laying, we, we looked at two sites, a large site and a small site, and doing just some basic, you know, like I described, basic building envelope layout, you can reach the 2.75 FAR. Um, the caveat is that four stories would be required, and currently the zoning only allows three. Um, also, you know, we noticed that the in on both the large site and the small site um, that we looked at, the residential units were really subsidizing the commercial component in the mixed use products that we tested. So we looked at a mixed use concept and then residential only concept on both a large and a small site. And in both cases, the mixed use aspect um, added to the cost of the units. Ultimately, residential developments were less expensive to develop. So that's something we want to be thinking about as we're as we're thinking about you know how much in these mixed use districts. We do want to keep commercial space. You know, preserving space for local businesses is important to us, and it's one of the goals set by the council. Um, and so, what's that right amount to preserve for local businesses for commercial and retail development um, on these sites? So, um, we also noticed that you know, small sites, just generally small sites, are harder to develop. They have you know more of the site gets taken up in setbacks. They're harder to park and just maneuver and just you know physically fit everything on a smaller site. Um, and in this test, it, it kind of turned out that some of those may really not work very well for mixed use. It, they may not support, um, they may not be very likely to develop, I guess, to redevelop if we're um, really committed to keeping mixed use on all of those properties. Um, we also noticed <laughs> our uh, parking requirements for commercial are still pretty high. We just went through a process to reduce our parking requirements for um, residential uses. And so, you know, those standards are really pretty much in line with best practices in the state and the region and, you know, seem to work pretty well in these scenarios, but those requirements for retail parking are still pretty high and may need some attention through this. And I included this picture here. This is a project at 350 Ocean that's currently under construction. Um, and this is a, an affordable housing project and it complies with the Ocean Street area plan. Um, and current, I, I believe this complies with, actually, I think this was, I believe this complies with, with current zoning, but I, I actually might be wrong about that because it is an affordable housing project, but it does comply with the Ocean Street area plan. So, um, in discussing these tested results with the planning commission, and we did, you know, sort of the whole deep dive with them and like went into all the nitty gritty details. 
um, the conclusion that you know we as staff and they as the planning commission came to is that um, essentially reducing this 2.75 FAR could make housing development more challenging. Um, based on the price points that the units were hitting at, at, on these sites, um, it seemed like any reduction to that 2.75 FAR, so allowing like the highest number of units to spread the cost over of developing the property. I mean, the, the prices started to shift from, you know, from like 400,000 below 400,000 um, up to $530,000 per unit just to develop. So um, that's just, that's a higher price point than we think Santa Cruz could really support. And it's not really, it's not the housing that we're, you know, most desperate to produce is that higher end housing. So um, as we reduce the FAR, the cost per unit goes up. So that's just, um, when we think about potentially reducing the intensity on these sites, uh, that is the reality of it, that that would make development probably more difficult to accommodate. So the Planning Commission is recommending that we complete the zoning first, this work on zoning and creating these objective standards before we consider moving into doing a general plan land use amendment that would move some of that intensity around in the city. Um, Doing this project on objective standards is going to provide more insight, and it'll be really, which will be really useful if we move into a, um, you know, if the council does decide to move into a general plan amendment process. Um, and also, it's possible, you know, as we were looking at these test bits, it's it's possible that zoning could produce outcomes that are acceptable to the community. Um, and you know, this project is on an eight month is slated to be completed in November of this year, so that's eight months from now. Um, and, you know, so potentially within eight months, we could have a set of standards um, in place that would apply to all new development and could really, um, you know, start shaping this urban design and gaining back some of this control that we've kind of lost to SB 330. So um, I also wanted to show this project. This is the project at um, Soquel and Trevisan or Soquel and um, Hageman. Avenue, and um, this is a project that is was proposed under the current standards for CC zoning. So this is not a site that um, was designated for change in the general plan. Um, and so this is a three-story tall structure, and I, this project is currently not moving forward because they can't figure out the financing. So to me, this is just the further evidence that like these lower intensity sites are just really challenging right now, you know, given the current cost of construction, the current price for housing units, it's just um, developers are having a hard time making that line up. So um, I don't know if this project is actually gonna happen because they've extended their permit twice. Anyway, we'll get into it, but just an example, this is a three-story tall structure and it's, it's challenging right now for the developer to sort of figure out how to get this developed. So, how are we going to get to these equitable outcomes we were talking about? How are we going to develop these objective standards for our um, community? Um, when we started working with urban planning partners, one of the reasons we selected them as our vendor was that their RFP really talked about taking a social justice lens to zoning. And so one of the key pieces that that means is um, including voices that have been missing either through you know, self-selection or outright exclusion in the past. So who has been missing from local land use discussions? We identified three priority um, uh, demographic groups that we're gonna focus our efforts on. It's the Latinx community, low and moderate income households, and university students. And then how do we ensure that they're involved? Well, we're gonna make targeted smaller meetings to meet with those folks. We're also collecting um, you know, demographic info at every one of our engagement events to just see who we're meeting and who we're missing. Um, so that if we need to create a focus group with university students, because none of them came to our webinar, so we can set that up and do that and make that happen and make sure that those voices are included in this process. So we're also focusing on making sure that meetings are convenient, culturally appropriate, providing stipends and, and, stipends and incentives to participate. And we're working with several partner organizations in the community. Excuse me, we're working with um, Barrios Unidos to reach our Latinx community. We're working with the UCSC student government, and we're also reaching out to um, 
we're working with Catholic charities and CAB to reach sort of the, the, our lower income community members. So part of, and for the next, we also wanna make sure we're providing our community with information, information about the constraints and opportunities related to housing. So ensuring that people are really informed about the topic so that the feedback they provide can really be implemented and used in the process. Um, and then we also just wanna to add to the discussion on housing. So there are equity elements to housing development that are um, reflected in state law. There are also components of housing developments that are not, um, not aesthetic. And we also wanna bring in this piece about systemic racism and privilege. And we're getting ready to have our first community event later this week where we're gonna be making this presentation about, you know, what is the history of zoning? How did we get to this place where we are? nationwide, in statewide, locally, what's the history behind that? Who was it designed to serve? And how, how do we step into that history and own it and move forward with it? So there are four phases of our community engagement process. Um, first is to inform, listen, and understand. So we're gonna be um, helping the community learn about what, what objective standards are, learn about the state law that we're operating within, and then hearing what the community concerns are. And um, so we can start to um, think about how we might be able to address some of those concerns as, as we develop the standards themselves. Then we'll move into defining and measuring community character. So really drilling into like, what is it that makes Santa Cruz special? What are the features of our area that we wanna preserve and reflect in new buildings? Um, you know, what are the most important things that we wanna see when we see some of these really key opportunity sites redevelop, you know? Um, we wanna make sure that they reflect where Santa Cruz is going. Um, so then our third, the third phase is to shape and refine the objective standards. So once we've sort of gotten this feedback from folks um, that they've been able to give to us in an informed manner, um, we'll develop these set of standards and then we'll um, you know, preview the work and bring it back to the community and make some further refinements before bringing it through to public hearing. And then we have a fourth phase, which is our ongoing effort, which is maintaining a website and um, keeping that content there updated and relevant for folks. So we're hopeful that the community engagement outcomes will be the following, that the discussion about housing in Santa Cruz connects the project to state housing le legislation, systemic racism, and non-aesthetic elements of what makes Santa Cruz Santa Cruz. Um, this is, this is a, a reach goal, I have to say. Like, I'm really excited about this. This is um, something we have not really attempted to do with zoning before, to really connect it back to this history and to these other equity features about housing. I also think it's really important for the city to be reaching in this way. And um, I, I'm i optimistic about where we're gonna get with this. Um, number two, we wanna ensure that voices of underrepresented populations have been included and heard and reflected in the final product. We want to, um, number three, we're hopeful that the community understands what an objective standard is and why they're important, how they're used, and um, what they can do and what they can't do. And then fourth, we want to be sure that the community sees their input reflected in the final objective zoning standards when they're integrated into the municipal code. So with that, our, the Planning Commission has made this recommendation that the city council make a motion directing planning and community development staff to complete the objective standards for multifamily and mixed use housing projects before pursuing any action to amend the land use pattern established by the adopted 2030 general plan and provide comment and feedback on the community engagement strategy. So staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. I'll go ahead and open it up for council uh, questions at this time. I have council member Golder. Okay, so thank you for that presentation. I was just wondering when you said provide stipends for community participation, what, what does that mean? Um, so, essentially paying people for, to participate. So um, that could be in the form of a raffle. So we have a meeting on Thursday coming up and we're doing two raffles. We're raffling off a, a $25 gift card to the Verb and $100 to Newly. 
Um, it may also be that certain focus groups, we might actually provide people with like $50 gift cards for participating in a focus group. Okay, um, and then one thing I know that, you know, uh, people probably from my base would have to say about um, your, your process, and I think it all sounds great. It's just the the one component I think that people might have a problem with is uh, the the the, the, um, the university students, and that a lot of them might just be here for two to four years, and then having this long term impact on land use mm -hmm. um, when you know unless. It, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you were going to provide some background and things like that, but they might not have the um, knowledge mm -hmm. that that um, somebody that's been in the community for decades would have. And so I would appreciate, um, you know, making sure that these focus groups are balanced and, um, and, and stop. you know, I don't know any other way to say that, but, the, but mm -hmm. you know, Sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. If I could just respond real briefly. Um, you know, yeah, I, university students, these are typically younger folks. They've probably not been involved with the city before. Who knows if they're even going to stay in Santa Cruz. And we're going to have a student population here for the foreseeable decades. And so we want to understand what are the unique housing needs that students have, that maybe families have different needs. Um, sure. We need to no, know. Yeah, I understand that. I just, yeah. I get what you're yeah. saying. I get where you're going. I just, um, I'm, I'm cautious. I'm a little cautious about okay. that. Okay. Council Member Colin Perry Johnson. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm really, really glad to see the um, equity and social justice approach and lens that we're taking with this process. Um, I have some specific questions around the outreach and engagement. Um, are maybe I should just ask them all first. If that's going to be more effic efficient. Um, are are Cabrillo College community college students in, um, as part of the university students? Um, those are oftentimes our um, local youth who have grown up here and will like maybe will stay here. Um, I, I, I'm a transplant, but um, uh, so our community college is included in that. Um, I saw in the report that interactive website is part of the outreach and engagement. Will that also be in Spanish? Um, is social media uh, a part of the approach in order to engage the younger youth population? Um, I saw that stipends uh, were offered for Latinx community, but I'm not sure um, that I saw that it was for low income community members as well. Might have been in there and I might have just missed it. And I'm looking at the questions I wrote them out. I think those are my, my specific questions around outreach engagement for now. Sure. Um, so those are all really good questions. Thank you. For those. Thank you. Um, so um, Carrillo College, yes, those are Carrillo College students are included in university students. We were careful not to say UCSB students. And this, thank you for your question because it reminds me that so far we have really only connected with UCSB. Mm. So um, we do need to make an effort to outreach to Cabrillo um, student body folks as well. So thank you for that reminder. Um, the website will be available in Spanish. The whole city website actually can be translated into Spanish. And so within that, um, you know, it'll be available in Spanish. All of our publicity materials and, um, you know, anything we publish hard copies. Um, it's available in both English and Spanish. We've already created one um, like housing 101 guide that's essentially like a bunch of terminology pieces so folks can start to get the vocabulary that we use in this line of work and that's been translated in English and Spanish. Um, so we will continue to work on that. I don't think that every single document we produce is gonna be available in Spanish, but these, the big key primary ones will be. And um, our, at our outreach events, so like, I mentioned we're having an event this Thursday, that's the English language event. And then um, that event involves some community speakers um, who are giving a presentation about the history of housing policy. And um, the Spanish language event is gonna be two weeks after that on the 24th of March. And that gives us time to dub their portion of the presentation into Spanish so that we can ensure that exactly the same information is presented to both um, groups of folks who participate. And then social 
media, we are using social media to do publicity for our events and then also thinking about, um, you know, this next phase of the project when we move into sort of um, defining the character of Santa Cruz, a lot of that is going to be done online and using social media tools to um, either push people to surveys or like bring the survey into um, Facebook or we're exploring what all the various options are and like how we can be sure that we're able to get the data out. But that is the, that is the goal and the intention mm -hmm. is to make sure that we're using those so that we can um, reach these new constituencies. Great. Just, just a quick follow-up question. Um, but do our English events have simultaneous interpretation availability? No. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, so this event, this first event that we're doing, we are not providing that because we're doing a separate standalone um, Spanish language event. Both events will be fully recorded and then provided available on our website for anyone who's unable to attend. So we are only offering them one time. Um, so, so we're going to make sure that they're recorded and then when it's posted, it's posted in like, you know, bite size, like useful increments of time. So it's not just like here's a one and a half hour webinar of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but so we have in the past, sometimes when we do live meetings, we'll provide simultaneous translation. And it's a, it's a little bit um, uncertain how effective that is. And we actually think that what might be more effective is creating meetings that are specifically for that population. And then going and working with community organizations that are already plugged in there to provide them and really just make a meeting that's just for them. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great, thank you so much. I have Council Member Brown, Council Member Cummings, and then Council Member Watkins. Thank you. Uh, so, I also have some questions, or I guess they're questions at the moment, uh, around the outreach process, and Council Member Kalantari Johnson got some of those answered, so thank you. Um, in terms of, just as a follow-up to the outreach process to targeted communities, um, you mentioned some some organizations that are going to be helping with that, and I think that's great. Uh, you know, they're all quite capable and knowledgeable. Uh, I'm wondering if, um, because it seems to me that casting as wide a net as possible will be important, and I know that's your intention. So if, for, if we have recommendations on other stakeholders or, or representative groups that might be able to help with that kind of outreach, how, would we just send them to you, Sarah? Yes. Okay. And that you can incorporate that into the, the plan? And just yes. This book. Okay, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, and this is more, this is not so much a process question, but um, I, I have a question around the objective standards uh, you know, uh, the, our ability to, how it is that we, you know, are constrained and have what kind of possibilities we have in that process. And so I'm going to have a lot more questions about that later on down the road or, and comments. Um, mm -hmm. But just wondering um, in terms of how you are approaching the, because I hear webinars and I think that's a one-way transfer of information. And um, I know that there's other other stuff that's going to happen, but um, how you're approaching, like setting the table for those conversations to give folks who, who participate kind of um, a wide latitude to, to get creative to, in, in their input about how to do this. Um, because uh, most of the information we get is kind of says, well, you kind of can't almost do anything, <laughs> right? And, and so it's hard to think about how to, um, within that framework, um, you know, really come up with, uh, you know, create and have some creative thinking. So I'm just wondering if you have, like, how you're thinking about that element of the outreach process, how to set the table for those conversations. So there's a couple of things, so there's a couple of things there. Um, so first of all, um, you know, you all have heard a lot about by now SB 330 and kind of have an understanding of what it does, what it's intended to do, what it actually does, and, you know, all that stuff. So, so our first step is to make sure that our community members all sh kind of share that understanding. So this first, this first step is really about informing. We want to create an informed population that can provide informed feedback. So that's 
you know, one component of it is understanding these state laws and, and the effect that they have on um, how we have done development up until now, you know, because it is a change. It is different. Even if something meets the standards today, the way it's processed and the outcomes are a little different than they were two or three years ago. Um, so that's why this, you know, that, so we're starting, yes, this is a webinar, this is the one way, like, push out of information. We're launching our website as pushing out of information. And so ideally, through the next phase of the, of the, um, of the project where we start to define that community character, um, we're going to be asking people to really think about their neighborhoods. Like, what is it that you love about your neighborhood? What is it that you love about another neighborhood where maybe you don't live but you like wish you could you know tell me about all of those defining characteristics and as we get those um you know we're working with this with a really great team with a really great urban designer and there will be processes sometimes there'll be like small group meetings where we can really like take so you know all of you have been informed you've been part of our process and like we've been hearing these things from you know other members of the public we're trying to address all these things and we've kind of come up with like a couple different ways that we could maybe address it and we'll discuss those with like a focus group of folks and kind of get some feedback to, to guide the process so not everything this process you know partly because it has a different focus partly because it's you know we're, we're life in a pandemic it's not our traditional outreach process you know we're not just having like a bunch a big series of community workshops um, and so we're making some trade-offs. So there are going to be there are going to be some times where you know people will provide feedback, and then you know the next time maybe they personally are involved is when we have a draft of the standard, and then we're getting feedback about that. So I think some of that is you know so some of that's going to be happening in smaller group conversations and behind the scenes. And I want to be really clear that um, you know there will be big community outreach about when we have a draft. Of these standards so that we can take all of that feedback you know you told us what was important to you about santa cruz and um you know we put that together with these other like kind of um what's the word i'm looking for like almost mathematical standards that we have to make them kind of comply with and then we talked to some different focus groups of people about what was preferable and this is this is where we are so broader community like did we get it right did we get it wrong did you you know what do we need to refine so um i'm hopeful that we can still get there and you know i do want to acknowledge this is you know we have eight months to get this done and we have a lot of work to do so um some of that work is going to have to be done by smaller groups of folks rather than bringing everything that we have every step of the process to the whole broad community council member cummings Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. My first question um, I'm just, is related to the retail parking requirement. And so I'm just curious, um, is this an opportunity where we can address that? Because I have heard, you know, for example, there are certain types of businesses in the community where, you know, having that retail requirement may not be if, if it's universally applied, there are certain businesses that might be exempt. So, for example, you know, requiring, you know, bars to maintain a certain number of parking spaces. Well, you know, I think we could all agree that we we would like to discourage people from drinking and driving. So, if you have an establishment like that that's trying to open, you know, why would you require them to have parking spaces, which ultimately could be encouraging more people to drive? Mm -hmm. And so, and then also, you know, in thinking about yeah, I'm thinking in particular about the east side and, you know, and even the west side to some extent. But, you know, we have businesses in these districts and there's an opportunity kind of for this shared kind of parking model. You know, how can we try to, you know, better refine our retail parking requirements so that, you know, similar to what we did with residential, we can kind of minimize either the cost or try to get businesses to kind of work together to absorb those costs so that they're, they're less for businesses moving forward. And so is this process or as part of the objective standards are we able to get at that yes so when we um when we first brought the contract forward to the council for approval we had had um 
two tasks in there related to parking that we had marked as optional because we were like, you know, we just updated our parking standards. Like maybe we don't need to do this big parking analysis. And then we got to, you know, this point in the process, well, you know, when this was at the staff stage with the test bits, and we were like, yeah, I think we should go ahead and do those parking standards because, you know, clearly that it really affects some of these mixed use projects in like a really substantial way. It's like on the large site, you had to add a whole level of parking, like a whole floor of the building got used up for parking. I mean, and that's like on that large site we analyzed, that was like 48 housing units that you couldn't build because you had to park the retail space that we had included. So um, yes, we will be looking at that. Great. Um, just a couple comments. One, I think it's really good that you're incorporating students and young people who are normally excluded from, well, who are normally not as engaged in these conversations because I think it is really important to understand if we're gonna keep a university in our community, how are students being impacted? And I know that, you know, there's a lot of people who come from outside of Santa Cruz, they go to UCSC, they end up staying and really contributing to the economy and to the culture of this community. And so um, I think it's really important that, that they're also included in these conversations because, you know, just because somebody comes from somewhere else doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna leave. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the other piece of that is, um, I appreciate the equity social justice lens on zoning and the outreach to um, kind of marginalized voices. I would encourage maybe also reaching out to the NAACP and then the Santa Cruz County Black Coalition for Justice and Racial Equity, ensuring that we're including the black voices. And, and I think also just reaching out to other um, groups that may fall under the kind of black, the black indigenous um, people of color category, because I feel like oftentimes, I think that if you directly reach out to those groups, there's a higher likelihood that you'll have more people from those groups actually engaging. And so whether that's people from our Muslim community, our black community, our Latino community, our LGBTQ community, really targeting those, the groups that do work with those members of our community could be a really good way of making sure that their voices are included in these conversations rather than just a broad kind of come one, come all approach. Yeah, that's really good feedback, thank you. And um, those are all my comments, so thank you. Great. Council Member Watkins. Thank you, I think a lot of my questions and comments and um, sort of appreciation of the social justice approach to this, as well as the acknowledgement of history and um, sort of redlining and what that's meant for equity, you know, in our in our community, but beyond that is so important. So thank you for, for including that. Um, one other suggested, suggested group is the ELAC, you know, the English Learner Advisory um, Committees at the schools will help okay. assist some of the families. Yeah, okay. and, um, and, and certainly the um, community bridges, right, down in the, in the Beach Blocks community. But I can email you if I have more suggestions. I guess I have a question in regards to when, um, when this strategy is fully implemented and then ultimately adopted, in the interim, what are some of the tools that we could use or look at to help kind of mitigate some of the concerns that we've heard from the community around certain developments that are under the sort of standards we have now, if, if any, or have you thought of any? Yeah, so um, I was wondering when this question would come up. I know we got a fair amount of correspondence. I imagine there are several folks on the line that are waiting to talk um, about 831 Water. Um, that is the project that submitted um, it made, made it clear they're, they're planning to apply. I, from what I understand, their preliminary application isn't exactly complete yet, but isn't far away from being complete. Um, and so what are our options for addressing um, not just that property, but other properties that might be sort of next in line for that kind of development? So um, I'm gonna invite <laughs> the planning director and assistant planning director to jump in if I misspeak, but I'm gonna take a shot at this. So at this point in time, there is not a lot that, so we do not have a lot of tools available to us. The state law is really clear that when um, a preliminary application is deemed complete, that whatever standards are in place at that moment in time are the standards that apply to the project. Um, and then add on to that, the additional piece that, um, of density bonus law, which gives developers certain, um, 
certain rights and entitlements under the law to ask for concessions and to get bonuses in height, bonuses in floor area ratio, um, bonuses in the number of units. Um, our discretion around those projects is extremely limited. So um, in terms of looking at a question that I saw come up a couple of times in the correspondence that I read was, um, could we look at like spot rezonings or like spot general plan land use designation amendments? Um, those are tools that exist and um, a process to amend those, these maps that we have is not a quick process. Um, you know, we'd be looking for receiving sites for that development capacity. Um, we'd be then working with those receiving neighborhoods also about what was changing in their neighborhood. Um, there would be environmental review involved. Um, so, you know, this project is gonna be done in eight months, maybe nine if we split to the, you know, if we miss a meeting date in November and split to December. But um, I can't imagine amending our general plans faster than that. Typically an amendment to the general plan, I would think even if it's like really focused and really limited, I would expect it to take 12 to 18 months. It's just because of the environmental review that's involved more than anything else. Um, I mean, and also that's a really big community conversation to sort of switch that around. So um, the tools that we have are really the tools that we're gonna be working with. And, um, you know, we do have things like, you know, tools like development agreements that we can sometimes use as like incentives for developers to adjust things or change things around. Um, but they have to wanna do that. And under SB 330, they can get their approval without doing that. So it's, um, you know, our, our options really are not many, unfortunately, that's just the reality of it. My regret with this project is that the pandemic hit and it's, you know, I wish we were finishing now. I feel that was the timeline we were supposed to be on and pandemic life made everything go slower. So um, it's just where we are. I appreciate that. Thank you for your, for your response to that. But yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I just a um, couple of quick comments to, um, to the point of um, some of your uh, outreach. Um, I would probably add COPA to your list as oh, a, another a group. One. And um, probably the diversity center as well would be. Oh, I'm not familiar with them. The diversity or, center is the main LGBTQ group. Oh, um, that are, they had space downtown here at one they, time. Okay. Yeah, now they're over on Soquel. Um, so you. that would be the, yeah, those would be the two. And then there's, there's also the um, GLBTQ plus alliance in town as well. So just a couple of, of groups that okay. probably give you some real input um, from that community. Wonderful. And I think I'll save any other comments for after public comments. So uh, I just wanna make sure uh, no other, other uh, council members at this time have comments, or excuse me, questions. Looks like we're good to go, okay. We'll move over to public comment. So uh, now we will take public comment on item number 24. If you are interested in commenting on objective standard test fits and general plan slash zoning reconciliation and community engagement, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I have a number of folks with their hands up. The first person to speak is Sue Terrence. Hello. Um, I would like very quickly to ask uh, for a clarification. Do we have any objective standards in place at all in this interim period before we uh, um, get new objective standards? Ms. Terrence, I'll, what I'll do is um, we'll log that question and typically we don't have staff answer questions during um, public comment, but we'll certainly add that to the list and I'm sure staff would be happy to answer that. Okay, then I would like to ask, um, you know, our current standards say that 55 units is the maximum number of units on uh, an acre this site at 831 is 0.9, not even an acre. 
um, current standards are 39 feet. This project is 59 feet. Our neighborhood is in favor of development, affordable development. We would support 100% affordable units here. Ms. But Chair, these are units that are 342 square feet. We don't really um, believe that it's going to serve the workforce that desperately needs housing yes. in this community. Um, Ms. Terrence, I'm just going to we, we, can't, we can't take public comment on the project at, at Water Street. We, are, we can only take pu public oh. comment on the, on the, develop, on the um, objective standards item. We can't take public comment on okay. an item not on the agenda. Thank you. So we also understand that, um, you know, we are in this never, never land um, before objective standards are in place, but the community needs to be assured about the health and safety of the developments um, before they're okayed. If there are serious and valid and justified concerns about hydrology and geology, the city would be remiss in abrogating, abrogating their responsibilities for protecting the people who are here we want the development that's Thank safe. Thank you very much. So I'll, next uh, speaker will be uh, ending in 6424. And I just want to remind folks that um, maybe some folks are here to discuss the water sheet project, but unfortunately we really need to, to leave, keep your um, qu uh, comments to the objective standards. So go ahead. Hey there, uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld. First, I just wanted to uh, thank the staff for a really well thought out uh, uh, pr a presentation. Um, I, I really wanted to echo the importance of uh, the equity lens that's uh, being addressed here. Um, I also wanted to comment that I think uh, we we really need, desperately need to uh, uh, start with objective standards uh, before we get into any sort of general plan amendments. Um, uh, as the staff mentioned, that well, years for uh, general plan amendments to be adopted, we're already set to be doing a housing element update in a couple years anyway, and uh, we need objective standards before that. I definitely encourage you all to support moving forward with the standards right away. I also wanted to um, comment that uh, in addition to having you know an equity lens in terms of outreach, I think it's really important to make sure that the uh, uh, with a commitment to equity, uh, making sure that renters are accounted for in this process and uh, making sure that uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, the voices of people who are underrepresented are actually heard um, and, and not just reached out to. And so um, like have some sort of review process where you can ensure that the, the um, uh, overall perspective um, and the, the engagement in the community is equitable and not just the effort to engage the community. Um, and along those lines, uh, the, the objective standards uh, affirmatively, uh, affirmatively further fair housing is really important. Um, and uh, uh, so that uh, everyone across the, the community spectrum can um, uh, uh, live in Santa Cruz and um, uh, be part of this valuable process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up I have uh, B. Madison. Hello there. Thank you, uh, Mayor Myers, and thank you, Sarah, for a um, very well thought out presentation. I was a little dismayed to hear um, that you were um, not sad, but disappointed that the uh, project wasn't done in nine, nine months, but maybe I'm missing the whole point. I'd just like to, um, one thing, can I request that the city council please publish how many people are uh, participating in this meeting as a matter of public record? And then um, with regards to what I've kind, kind of come to realize is a huge new wave of high density development in our town. 
I'd like to remind City Council respectively that in addition to the challenges you face with addressing new state laws that push to mandate an explosion of high density here, you're still hired by, voted into, and expected to, to take into account your existing constituents and residents. In the words of some of your own charter language, something like uh, maintain and protect existing neighborhoods. So um, I think, again, I'll keep it short, the objective standards need to be defined um, specifically before any new development um, is really allowed to go through. And I know you're under pressure, but um, we as a city and we citizens hope that, you know, we are able to be the masters of our own destiny with regards to new state laws or ordinances being def defined and defended. So um, respectfully, I'd like to think that public input still matters and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is uh, phone number ending in 8480. Good afternoon, Mayor Myers and members of council. Uh, this is Doug Engford. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. There can be no doubt or debate that Santa, Santa Cruz needs and wants affordable housing developed respectfully, responsibly, and well integrated with our neighborhoods. And similarly, there's no doubt that objective development standards will get us there eventually. So we also need some immediate action. Until we have developed, agreed upon, and implemented standards, the general plan governs development in town. And that general plan reflects higher intensities than will the final standards. And, and time is of the essence. We learned just last night that Mr. Novin, the developer of the 60-foot, five-story, density bonus-driven monstrosity proposed at 831 Water Street, will apply for SB 35 streamlining for that project, circumventing our public processes and CEQA. Without action now, we can expect to see more abominations like 831 Water on any property currently zoned for mixed use or community commercial. That's all along Mission, Soquel, Water, and South Branch of 40 often immediately adjacent to R1 zone single story homes. The resulting aberrant and irresponsible pattern does not reflect council's direction to staff to quote, preserve and protect residential neighborhood areas and existing city businesses as the city's highest level policy priority. Now we can hope that development doesn't happen quickly or that other parcels are owned by more responsible developers than Mr. Novin, or that this planning process through standards happens more quickly than anything we've ever done before but hope is not a strategy. 831 Water Street can be the unifying threat that the city needs in order to be able to quickly, cooperatively, and effectively to put into effect both these interim tools and the objective standards. As Ben Franklin said, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Please don't fail us. For more about 831 Water, visit 831responsibledevelopment.org. Thank you all so much for your service. Thank you. Next up is 2850. Three ending phone number and just a reminder just uh, try not to, to get too far into 831 water thank you hi Lyra Filippini here firstly thank you for prioritizing community engagement in this process of establishing the much needed objective standards due to these state housing crisis laws the future landscape of our city depends on how these standards are set and it is imperative that those who live here and are investing in this community have a direct voice in any set framework that will dictate how our city will then grow up. For this upcoming community engagement plan and process, I'd like to note that your current partner in this process, Urban Planning Partners, Inc., explicitly attempts to direct the community to remove subjective aesthetic viewpoints in the process they currently outline. This is in both how they like to, us to assess the community character of our city and is also part of how they plan to measure the project's overall success. I believe this particular steering by urban planning partners to be problematic. Community involvement is in its very nature using subjects to give their subjective feedback. In this case, to engage in a process of setting standards that then become objective in their future application of streamlining development. Aesthetics are an important part of this process. They are an established part of subjective cultural identity and also intricately related to the psychological parameter of place attachment and mental health. Can we ask Sarah's question, what makes Santa Cruz special without allowing aesthetics as part of that conversation? All 
of this is imperative to keep in mind if an end goal of this process is community support in these objective standards and a lessening of community objection in future development proposals, as well as the importance to an adherence to your honorable health in all policies track record. Overall, I am optimistic about this process, and I look forward to improvements to it as it progresses. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next up is Guy Lasnier. Just press star six to unmute yourself. There, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, I don't know if I'm repeating myself, but thank you for the excellent presentation earlier. I understand a whole lot more about it. My name is Guy Lanier, and I live on Belvedere Terrace, and I know all you council members are committed to doing what's right for Santa Cruz, and you care about our community's character. That's why you're there, right? In the face of new state mandates that severely tie your hands, it is critical that we have objective standards to harmonize the general plan and zoning. But in the interim, I urge the city to use every tool in its kit to not let the community's character erode. And I draw your attention to the prime example already mentioned, 831 water, 151 units stack six stories high on less than an acre, immediately adjacent to a modest neighborhood. It is a key opportunity site, but the proposed project clearly does not reflect the city's planning goals or processes. Right location, wrong project. I recognize getting objective standards may take some time until then, to protect, your, to protect your legacy and the community's character, there are many possibilities that you can direct staff to create, such as spot zoning changes. Remember, we have this existing low density land use locations that can net to zero for total residential capacity. Change density calculations to avoid 831 Water Street situations require visual representations such as story, below, story poles or balloons. Even if this ultimately delays the objective standards, the city will be protected against a proliferation of grandfathered out of scale developments, just like 831 Water. It's just the first of what could be several similar projects over the next four years. Before you know it, we could easily end up with three blocks of 60 foot buildings all immediately adjacent to R1 single family homes. A lack of action now will establish a development pattern that is inconsistent with council direction in 2019 and with the community's vision, a pattern we will then have to live with for generations. Thanks very much for your service and thanks for the time. Thank you very much. Next up we have a phone number ending in 3487. Yeah, hi, my name is Justin Bortnick and I'm a resident here in Santa Cruz, uh, born and raised here and actually attended Brant's 40 Elementary uh, right there in front of the 831 Water Street project. And uh, today I just wanted to reflect on, you know, the uh, presentation we saw today from Sarah was well detailed and thought through. Uh, I did wonder just about the easements and how that's reflected in a proposed six story building if that does shade out the entire neighborhood of Belvedere Terrace, would that uh, still receive approval potentially at, at this point? Because that's a huge concern with the six story we, building and we, residents yeah, right next to that. We can't respond to any uh, comments on the 831 project and uh, staff really can't respond to questions during public comment, but you're welcome to to continue and, and, you know, again, we're talking about the objective standards. So I'm sorry to interrupt. But and that, those objective standards include the shading pro, uh, process, right? Of, of the easement and the overhang into other expanding neighborhoods. Is that correct? And I know you're not allowed to respond to comments. So um, uh, from what I understood, that was correct, that there is supposed to be standards that are being upheld to a three-story building has a very different shade covering than a six-story building. I think we can all agree to that. So if the standards proposed uh, were already approved, this building would then have to fall under those alignments. But today they're going to try to circumvent that and uh, unfortunately that puts this neighborhood and Belvedere Terrace, one of my, you know, where I was really uh, grew up playing in the neighborhood and running around with my friends on that street. So I just think that uh, having a huge shade covering on all those neighbors just doesn't really serve any purpose. And also there just is no place to park for these huge residential uh, compounds. So like with the, any of the proposed uh, deployments across SoCal and up Water Street, 
I, I am unaware of where the extra parking is. I know that they're planning on building parking into some of these structures, but there's really no proposed way of handling the parking in the rest of the neighborhoods. And, and that's already an issue with all the UCSC residents and the different uh, people that do frequent these neighborhoods. The parking is a, is a struggle along that entire corridor. So I'm really curious to see where all this extra parking is gonna come from to serve all this high density uh, housing. I uh, appreciate you guys once again and all your service that you guys provide for the community. Thanks very much. Next up, I have Kathy. Okay, I want to unmute. You are, we can hear you. Okay, you great. Go. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just lost my train of thought, but I just wanted to say something. I am outraged that these objective standards, which the staff uh, planning has known about for several years now, and because of COVID, Somehow it hasn't reached the point where they've developed and saw this through and this should have been done. And <clears throat> we're facing, we're gonna slaughter a lamb. That's what we're gonna do to give this up. And I'm looking, for, I'm looking at you, our city council. I don't know how you can streamline a general plan amendment. I don't know if it needs an EIR, how you can do that. Uh, but I think that there must be something that you can do to protect neighborhoods from monster, monster projects that have no, uh, that have no, that it, leave all the character, leave, it's, it's like we have a missile coming towards us and we need to stop that. And I, I would like I would be saying that we have no tools, I don't believe that. I think we have the courage enough, to, we have courage to take courage and go maybe against what the Planning Commission um, uh, uh, um, suggested and not go for the general plan amendment, but I think you can streamline that and give staff report, the staff direction to say, okay, let's, let's, let's come back in two weeks and change this and get this done. All you need to do is change height and mass. That would take care of it. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up we have uh, Kyle Kelly. Hey all, this is Kyle Kelly. Uh, give me a second here. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you so much for, for codifying objective standards. Um, I realize for a lot of the community, this is probably confusing, um, but I think I'll end up seeing at the end of the day to get to control a little bit more about how things will end up looking and feeling. Uh, one thing that I wanna make sure that we do as we do the upcoming process is that we try to steer away from using uh, phrases such as community character uh, and neighborhood and which is a long and well-documented history up. of being a dog whistle for perpetuating segregation and exclusionary zoning. Um, um, the, the, the last piece that was, we try to break away from using phrases such as community character, uh, which has a long and well-documented history of being used as a dog whistle for perpetuating segregation and exclusionary zoning. Uh, you know, a lot of the existing character of many of our communities is directly linked to the racist history of California planning policy, including Jim Crow era segregation and anti which will allow people to uh, decide how the, how the look and feel of buildings will go while still allowing for, for renters and for people to be able and, and build, a, build a better community over time. Uh, so thanks for getting through this process and for including a lot more voices. Thank you. Next up, we have my CL, and then next will be Rosa. Good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Mike Young. I do not live in the city, but I live in Live Oak. And it's very disheartening to hear that you have no objective standards and that it's gone on for a couple years or more 
without having objective standards. Uh, that's my only comment, and it's very disappointing, and I can't believe you guys sat on it for that long, COVID or not. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have Rosa and then David. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, I got on last time with Agenda 23 to talk about the beautiful picture that you show in your backgrounds and the beautiful stuff. Well, that beauty is going to end if we don't have some kind of objective standards before the project in A31. And listen, I'm outraged too that you have not done it. And you're responsible. So now you get Tony, your attorney, you do whatever you have to do, and you find some loophole to get us out of this mess. I voted for you people. I need you to work for us. We don't want San Jose, downtown San Jose, right behind our homes. So please do something. Thank you. Next up is David. He's right here in Rosa. Okay. Thanks for your very comprehensive presentation earlier. I think we can all agree that we need objective standards for housing that tie in the general plan with the zoning code. This is to prevent us from being victims to the whims of developers in Sacramento. They were supposed to be done by late 2020 but that date has come and gone. It may take a while before they're developed in reality. In the meantime, though, the city needs to take immediate action to protect its planning goals against mandates by the state. Perhaps some general plan amendments or other actions in advance of developing the objective development standards. For example, the spot rezonings mentioned earlier would be a good first start. Or perhaps we can change density calculations to avoid over-the-top development proposals like the development currently planned for 831 Water Street with over 150 units on less than one acre. Many of these units less than 400 square feet. The use of story poles or balloons to give the public a better idea of just how large these proposed developments may be is another good idea. This becomes increasingly important because the 831 Water Street developer is pursuing SB 35 streamlined approval for his development. If we don't act fast, we may facilitate a development pattern inconsistent with the direction the city council took in 2019 with help from input from the community and affect Santa Cruz for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm not seeing any other members of the public, so I'm going to turn this back to council. I'm going to do a time check. Um, it's 545, and we have an item uh, starting at 630 this evening. So um, just want to let council know we're running, we're running about 45 minutes late. Um, and then we still have one more item, which I understand from staff should be fairly quick. So just want to keep, keep track of time. And um, I'm uh, happy to open this back up to council's uh, comments and deliberation. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, so I have a couple of comments that I'd like to make before we go ahead. I, I think that at this point, uh, moving forward with staff recommendation makes sense, um, but I do have some comments uh, related to uh, some of the concerns raised by the community as well as questions uh, around affordable housing and how it is that we um, situate, uh, you know, try to use the objective standards to the extent possible to promote affordable housing rather than just density housing. Um, so with respect to the questions around uh, the kind of interim tools, you know, I think Sarah, thank you for um, kind of laying out what those might be and for folks who uh, weighed in asking us to, to think about implementing some of those sooner than later. Um, you know, I, I agree. I think that there are things we could do, but in terms of spot zoning and some of these other tools, it seems to me that they 
really, you know, those decisions need to be made in context, um, in particular, you know, in particular context. So I, I, it would be hard to, you know, I, I'd like to respond to that today, but I, I, I'm just having a hard time thinking of a way to provide that kind of direction um, without something more concrete. Um, I think that the comment about use of story polls is a really important one. I, you know, this is something that, um, you know, would would measure pretty objectively what, you know, these buildings are going to, what they're going to look like and how they'll feel, right? So I think that that's the kind of thing that we ought to also be considering. That's not what's on the table here right now. Um, but I did want to make those comments with respect to how we, um, Develop those those objective standards to to most uh, you know to get us towards that goal that we laid out of um, you know of you know protecting you know neighborhood uh, you know or neighborhood compatibility. I won't use the word character, um, but um, you know compatibility with neighborhoods and uh, promoting affordable housing. I mean those are really important goals and objectives, and I don't want them to get lost in this process of trying to figure out how we um, can just jam as many units <laughs> into, you know, the most density into the current general plan um, uh, framework. So, but that's a matter of political will. And, you know, it, it, for folks who are concerned about this, I really encourage you to get involved in the objective standards planning process um, and comment on projects when appropriate. Um, I. My question uh, and it is about the some of the discussion at the planning commission in the agenda report. Uh, there's a reference to um, in, an interest that the, the planning commission had in um, ensuring that while inclusionary zoning is not the topic at hand, it is outside the scope of object, objective standards. Um, it it is important and it's an important piece of that, um, I think initial uh, learning, you know, teaching process and trying to provide information for folks who are gonna be engaging in this process. Um, I know that they sort of recommended that that was part of the initial uh, outreach and education process. And uh, I, it wasn't a, a motion, but I'm just wondering if um, where that's at, or uh, Sarah, can you maybe speak to like, is that going to be clearly encapsulated in what you what you do, or would it be helpful to provide that direction today? Um, so, explaining what inclusionary housing is, what it does, kind of how it works, that is part of the inform portion of this, um, you know, our outreach engagement strategy. Um, you know, we're making sure that folks understand those terms and, and then um, as part of the webinar, we'll talk about how, you know, part of what the webinar covers is like, you know, housing policy is like all these things and this project is really doing this part, but, you know, there are other things that the city has done and in the inclusionary ordinance is a component of that. Um, there are other things the state has done, the density bonus is part of that, you know. Um, so. I think folks will have an understanding of what that tool is. And, you know, we're not going to, at this point in time, we're not planning to go like deep dive on inclusionary because this project isn't scoped to change it. Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure what else to say about that. We both make sure people understand that word and understand how it fits into the housing policy locally. Um, but we're not going to be doing a deep dive into that. And we express that to the planning commissioners as well. Thanks. Yeah, I just, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, and I, I totally understand that, and so I'm not suggesting trying to unpack inclusionary in a, you know, really detailed way, but I guess I'm just trying to think about ways to, kind of going back to my question about setting the table, um, providing information to folks who are going to engage in this process about the prioritization of affordability um, and affordable housing unit production and to ensure that there is that there's some at least some information a basis on which people can begin to think through you know inclusionary as a tool what are some of the other ways mm -hmm. that we can get not just high density and as but, much as possible but actually affordable housing so i'm just trying to like sure figure out how to kind of 
make sure that that is part of the conversation. And I know that part of that's going to you know depend upon who comes to the table. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's just a huge priority for all of us, I think. And um, you know, I, I don't want it to be kind of sidelined because it's not an yeah. objective standard per se. Got it. Um, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so I would say, and this is, you know, I kind of responded to this question with the planning commissioners as well. Um, you know, one one thing that could potentially come out of this process is sort of like ideas for further work, because you know, every time you go out and speak to the community, their blinders aren't on the way that our blinders are on. You know, I'm like, I'm here to talk about zoning. Talk to me about height. Talk to me about FAR. Let's talk about setbacks and setbacks and awnings and windows and materials. And they're like. But let's talk about, you know, how do we ensure that people stay in housing once they get there? And tell me about rent control. And people have all these questions and are making all these connections, right, if they don't do this professionally. And that's um, part of what's so great about working with the community is that they force you to take your blinders off. And so I could see that as, one, as you know, a possible outcome is that we sort of like parking lot, a bunch of items that are out of scope for this project and they are, you know, sort of good ideas for future work. Um, and that, that, that could be sort of one of the one of the final products that we bring back, or like you know other other ideas that we heard from the county from the community. I mean, this is we did that with housing voices, and you know it's been four years, so here we are again. We're hearing new ideas and new um, issues and concerns and thoughts from folks that are along those lines. So we could come back with some kind of list of like next projects might include X Y Z A B C. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, so I'm, I'm, I won't make the motion because I know other people might have things to say, but I'm prepared to make a motion to um, approve the, the staff rec or to move the staff recommendation for outreach. Okay, thank you. Um, I raised my hand. I'm not seeing any other council member hands. Um, I just have a quick question, Sarah. Um, um, I think it's either the bright red or the bright brown. Um, is there any way to break apart? So I'm just curious about whether or not um, the locations in the city that may be in the, the black box period, is there any way that you can look at those sites with your objective stance? Uh, so in other words, um, I think the brown, maybe it's the brown zoning. Um, I can't remember the mixed use uh, exact name on that. Um, the mixed use high density. Do you want to look at the map? Yeah, I'm just curious if is there any way, and I don't know if this is, you know, I, I we're not here to talk about 831, so I'm going to be respectful of that. But I'm just curious about um, development pressures and, frankly, this this unevenness that we're in right now, you know, um, which could mean that based on objective standards outcome, you might have, you know, design, you know, objective standards that make development in neighborhoods amenable over time, but that we're not there yet. And we, we're not going to be there for nine more months. Um, and so I'm just curious um, about whether or not you could break apart your process and maybe look at the mixed use high density. Um, I just don't know if that would be would work or not, but I'm just curious if there's any way to get at some of these concerns. I, I'm hearing the community um, and you're hearing people are, they're frustrated. Um, sure. And I'm just curious if there's any work around or way that we could tackle these as separate um, zoning districts rather than kind of doing the whole process of whether or not you could potentially tackle them one at a time based on the district, based on the zoning. Long rambling yeah. question. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, so I'm gonna have a long rambling response. If yeah. that's okay. I know that we're like short on time here. So yeah. maybe it won't be so rambling. Okay. So let's just recall, the general plan was adopted in 2012. There was a process initiated that would have created zoning standards for this site. That process ran into trouble and it was halted. So it was halted internally in 2017, it was halted officially by the city council in you know, Q3 mm -hmm. of 2019. So um, we don't have standards for these sites and the general plan land use capacity has been established since 2012 when that project was, mm -hmm. when the general plan was adopted. 
um, we're in the situation we are now because the state law has changed out from underneath us. So, um, you know, this idea that we should have been object developing objective standards for the last like three or four years is simply inaccurate. That law did not take effect until the beginning of 2020. So we knew it was coming as of September 2019. We got on the stick getting a grant um, proposal put together so that we could do this project. And then we had a little slowdown with issuing the RFP. I'm not gonna lie, the pandemic hit and I couldn't work full time. So mm -hmm. things were slow. So we finally got our consultant on board in the summer instead of in the spring and we're a couple months behind where we wanted to be. So um, that's just the reality of where we are. And the because the project is funded by a grant, it has a firm end date. We have to finish no later than January of 2022. Um, we have to submit our final billing in February, it's the whole thing. So ideally we're shooting for November of 2021 this year. So eight months from now. Um, thinking about trying to like split out a separate process, it would have to go through all the same steps that we're gonna do to create like all of these zoning standards for all of the um, zone districts and general plan land use designations that carry this multifamily and mixed use. Um, I don't know how we would do that with our current staff resources and work plan because that would essentially be taking this project and turning it into two simultaneous projects that have the same amount of work. Okay, okay. So, I mean, I'm not unsympathetic to folks' concerns. You know, I live in the city. I'm watching this happen, too. I, you know, wish we had different standards. We do. I mean, we have some standards in our code that are objective. We have height limits. We have floor area ratios. Um, we just typically, when it comes to building design and, you know, the ultimate final form and location on a property of a building, we have been using this design review process and just are not allowed to. Right. Um, yeah, no, I'm familiar with that, and I recall the discussion, and thankfully we did get the objective standards because we would be in worse shape moving ahead if we had not, so, and I and I recall the discussion. Um, okay, that, I appreciate the clarification. Um, Council Member Watkins, did you have your hand up or did yeah. I miss you? No, I, I, no, I appreciate the discussion and the interest in wanting to kind of bifurcate those areas um, to kind of come up with a compromise solution given sort of the circumstances we're in today and um, understanding that they're complicated and challenging too. So um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that and I think we want to give justice to the process but clearly I think having something in place would be really beneficial to our community as soon as possible too. So I guess I'll just echo those, those comments and sentiments as well. And Council Member Bruner. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for uh, all of that information and update. And I think the educate and inform portion of the outreach, that piece is really valuable. And the example of the terminology pamphlet, uh, for example, in English and Spanish is great to hear. Um, one of our constituents uh, mentioned subjective feedback is important to inform the objective standards and uh, I think there is some value in that piece um, and housing developed in these multifamily mixed-use zoning districts over the coming years and creating standards um, informed by the Santa Cruz citizens will be key you know so for the city to continue to work on developing objective zoning standards and addressing the priorities of the community um, will be very, very um, necessary. And, um, you know, I'm also happy to make a motion to move forward. Um, I know that uh, Council Member Brown threw it out there already. Maybe what I will do um, just to, to um what I'll do is go ahead and go back with Council Member Brown. I believe she's making a motion to uh, to move the staff staff recommendation. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner, would you want to second that? I'll second. Okay, great. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more um, uh, 
comment from uh, the from the council members. So Bonnie, I'll go ahead. So we have a motion by council member Brown with a second by vice mayor Bruner to, um, to approve the staff recommendation, uh, which is to continue to direct planning and community development staff to complete the objective standards for multifamily mixed use housing projects bef before pursuing any action to amend land use pattern established by the adopted 2030 general plan and provide comment and feedback to the community engagement strategy, which I think we did today. Um, I will go ahead and call for a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? I'm going to vote aye. And that motion passes unanimously. Uh, we will now move on to item. Thank you for everyone in the public that joined us this evening for that. Um, I'm sure we will be seeing you again on uh, other items. Uh, next up on our agenda is item number 25, um, and this is the legislate 20, 2021 Legislative Program Manual and Platform. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if there is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. So I would like to introduce Susie O'Hara, assistant to the city manager, and she will uh, go ahead and give us a presentation on the 2021 legislative program manual and platform. Susie. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Good, good evening, I guess, council. Um, I'm not gonna take a bunch of your time because I know you only have 30 minutes until we go to oral communications and the next item. But I do wanna share a few slides and talk about this year's um, legislative program, which is a program that we are kicking off after several years of, of really not having a formal program. Um, so I'm really happy to be leading this for the city and happy to be sharing with you all the progress. So let me share my screen. Going over the presentation for this, this evening, it's just gonna be a short presentation that really will orient the council to the attached documents in the staff report. Those attached documents um, really do go into depth as to what the program man manual includes as well as the annual platform. Um, so the goals and objectives um, we'll, I'll cover first and then at the end we'll talk about next steps. So the goals and objectives of the legislative program are basically to serve as a basis to proactively engage with policy and legislative initiatives. So as I'm sure each and every one of you are aware and maybe even our newest council members, sometimes we're kind of behind on engaging on uh, bills that are either in committee or um, out on the legislative floor at both the state and the federal levels and have to act quickly to ensure that the city's position is really clear um, as those bills travel through each of the respective uh, bodies at the state and federal level. Our legislative platform and policy manual will really hopefully transform that, pro that process to ensure that not only are we proactive in engaging with our state and federal legislators, but that we understand what is ahead um, in each of those calendar sessions and that we are engaging on things that are really mean um, substantially a lot to the city. Um, that process will be guided by the, plat I'm sorry, by the program manual, which if you had a chance to look through in great detail leading up to this meeting, I know your packet was huge. So um, if you just gl glance through it, that's okay too, because there'll be plenty of time to, to kind of go over it. It really does outline um, how we move forward with uh, lobbying and, and advocating on behalf of the city, who does that between city staff, um, the mayor, the council, as well as our lobbyist firms, and how does that process transpire? 
So that's what's included in the policy, um, I'm sorry, in the program manual. manual. And the platform guides um, the city council and staff on what our, what our priorities are for the year. And as, I, as you can imagine, that's really intertwined with our interim recovery plan. So just to briefly go over the legislative policy manual or program manual, right now each of our departments, as you heard Bonnie mention earlier with the economic um, development strategy, we are individually um, tracking legislation and moving um, forward with lobbying um, at a department level, at a city manager level, at the council level, whenever um, those opportunities arise. And that can lead to some um, lack of coordination and also um, du du duplicative effort on some of those um, that work. So what we're hoping to move from is that disjointed process that can sometimes be very intense um, with regard to staff capacity to a much more integrated program. That is, as I mentioned, integrated with the interim recovery plan. And that would also set forth internal coordination um, for legislative advocacy, um, really understanding uh, our lobbying roles at the city council, city manager, mayor, and department head level, um, how we evaluate legislation to understand how the city fits into its opportunities and challenges, and also the guidelines for lobbying, as I mentioned. The platform, um, what we would move, be moving from is um, somewhat of an unclear position from the city's perspective on up, upcoming legislative bills. Um, that can, as I mentioned, be reactive and sometimes hasty in terms of how we lobby to a clear and transparent city platform for both our internal staff, council, elected officials, and our lobbyists to use. Um, it would align with the interim recovery plan, how our city plans on moving forward in the next 6, 12, 18 months to help our, our community move out of the pandemic and into sustainable recovery from an economic, public health, health and all policies perspective. And then also allows um, this proactive engagement with our state and federal lobbyists, I'm sorry, lobbyists and legislators um, between the mayor's staff and our um, lobbyist firms. So very, very high level, what is included in the legislative priorities? And I wanted to mention that the legislative platform that you saw in draft form in your agenda packet um, was put together uh, with the support of um, a few dele delegate visits um, from Congressman Panetta, Assembly Member Stone, as well as Sen Senator Laird, work with the California Le League of Cities to ensure that um, the league's platforms are pretty, um, pretty much um, included in, in our draft platform, and then looking through what other Bay Area cities and cities similar to Santa Cruz with regard to our economic and pandemic recovery plan, um, and then using all of that information to develop um, this draft platform. It does fit into the priorities of the interim recovery plan, so focused on downtown and business revitalization. As you heard from Bonnie and her team, all of the things that they're working on are gonna require flexibility and revenue, um, really working with our state and federal um, uh, lobbyist firms to ensure that there's a diversification of funding support and small business support. Infrastructure, um, you've heard from uh, Director, Public Works Director Dettel, as well as Water Director Menard that, you know, our capital improvements program, our need for infrastructure improvements is only gonna grow and we really want to ensure that we have redu redundancy and we're focusing focusing on um, a green economy and workforce development as we um, invest in our infrastructure. Fiscal uh, sustainability, you know, ensuring that we are lobbying, especially as we're in um, recovery for as many um, state and federal funds to come to the city in a way that's flexible in their application and can also be used for um, revenue loss. And then lastly, but not least by any means, sustainability and green economy, equ equity and well-being and engaged community. And this really does get around um, advancing our green economy, focusing on climate, climate adaptation um, and action, and then funding um, services for homeless related programs and services. So what I see next steps, um, quarterly update to council probably in the form of an FYI or maybe 
semi-annually coming in front of you to talk about what's happening um, at the state and federal level with lobbying outcomes and any city relevant legislation that we have to pay particular attention to. A semi-annual meeting with our state and federal legislators um, on their priorities and how to integrate our priorities with their work um, in their respective bodies. An invitation to view and participate in any state and federal committee discussions. Um, one of those was a few weeks ago when I sent out an email on uh, a committee discussion at the state assembly with regard to homelessness that I think many folks were able to participate in and got a little, lot of information out of. And then of course, integration of the legislative program into our interim recovery plan um, and ad hoc, revenue ad hoc committee planning. So we would really wanna make sure that as we are thinking um, of new revenue cha uh, channels for the, for the city that we're thinking about how to um, fully leverage our state and federal sources of funding and then also ensuring that those priorities overlap and that we are leaving no stone unturned as we think about how best to engage with our legislative, le legislative program. So that's it for me and I just wanted to thank you for your attention and um, happy to take any questions and also wanna ensure that you guys get a chance to have dinner before you sit down on the, the next meaty topic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Susie. Um, yeah, I'll just make one quick comment. Um, I appreciate um, the report. I think it's really, really thorough. Um, I think this is really over the next four years is probably one of the biggest opportunities we're gonna have for um, a lot of the uh, focuses for the plan, especially infrastructure, um, green economy, climate change. So I'm really, really um, happy. And this is one of my priorities when I came in as mayor was you know, making sure we really know what's out there and really have a, a very focused way to approach it. Um, We've had some really productive really, uh, conversations with our electeds already. <clears throat> so I really wanna thank you for working on this. Um, I just would add um, a couple of ideas for you um, with regards to the downtown. And I, so I'm looking at the draft legislative platform, the, um, the, uh, at the very back part of the, of the report, um, uh, downtown business and revitalization. Um, I would add um, potentially the River Parkway as a, an alternative transportation there as a piece of our downtown that oftentimes I think gets missed, but that alternative transportation aspect and the tie to the coastal area really kind of cements our downtown and its relationship to the places that are near it and provides frankly ways that people can get around without a car. So sometimes um, those things show up in weird places Sometimes it's in infrastructure, other times it could be in downtown. So um, I would just maybe just make a note of that. Um, there is a statewide river parkway program as you're aware of, but maybe just tracking that. And then under infrastructure, um, I always think of, um, of our green belts, our trails and our bikeways and our parks as part of our green infrastructure. And um, just wanna make sure that we don't lose track of um, that green infrastructure aspect and also the way that we do and have managed our flood control uh, channel in the past, which is really a, a model of green infrastructure with regards to flood control um, work. So just wanna make sure that we don't lose that. And then um, finally uh, recognizing uh, under infrastructure, sort of the coastal pieces that we've been working on through Tiffany Weiss West work with um, the resilient coast and just making sure that that doesn't get lost within that infrastructure category. And those are all my comments. Thank you. Uh, question by council members. Everybody's hungry. Uh, <laughs> not seeing any, I'm going to take it out to um, the uh, attendees for this item. So this is going to be item number 25, 2021 legislative program manual and platform. If you are interested in commenting on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear in an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Uh, I have caller ending in 1810. Go ahead, please. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, Garrick Phillip. In general, this legislative action and platform has inherited similar defects to that of health and all policies in that it reflects some leftist globalist dogma formulations which take directives from foreign authorities, half of which aren't democracies, other external authorities, and also parts are radical partisan dogma crafted to appease a body which is not elected as a partisan body, and the authors are unelected city bureaucrats seeking approval for those ideas. The city government is a poor imitation of individuals who themselves are always correct in capitalism, providing what others need, want, or willing to pay for, even as the government is imperfect and be able to divine such, as the people are not of the unanimous opinion or of ability to pay, but in all cases should provide only what the pervasive will of the city public is, not simple slim majority, not unelected city bureaucrats, and not derived from external or council partisan politics. In all cases, it should be things individuals cannot provide for themselves that benefit are accessible to all. The city government strays off this path when it allocates resources to benefit special interests not available to benefit the pervasive population. The city government also strays off this path when it lobbies other authorities on non-local issues. In general, these guiding documents seem slanted toward obtaining more discretionary authority and money, always bigger government. The greater public will is not really prioritized as essential. It pre-prioritizes, is partisan, and non-local issues abound. I think this action list and platform, even the idea of predefining these goals itself, shows a lack of public-specific input. But uh, sure, okay, some items are well-meaning. One example is the equity goal, which simplified is the treating of different people unequally to attempt to make their lives more identical, which means you don't value individual liberty much and have American values upside down favoring group identity socialist tyranny and has no mandatory prioritized place in the land of the free. In simple terms, I'd rather see your policy be rightfully limited to lobby only for what the people pervasively need, want, and either are willing or paid for affecting local city matters. It could be that simply stated. Thank you. Okay, no, I don't see any other hands. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring it back to City Council then. Council Member Brown. Thanks. Uh, so I didn't get my hand up quite in time to ask a question. Um, so just two things. One, I this is great, thank you. And Susie, really appreciate you putting this together in such a comprehensive way. And um, I love the idea that we're gonna kind of get more coordinated and efficient and productive in our uh, advocacy. I um, am, given the conversation of our last agenda item, I, it seems like uh, including something about supporting uh, local control of um, around development in particular would be a useful addition, um, unless there's significant opposition to that. I just hope that we could, we could include that and, um, and then I just had a question about um, for, you know, I know that council members uh, often bring pieces of legislation for support by the council that may fall outside of these three, um, you know, these, these three priority areas. And although one could have find a way to fit them into one of these because they're pretty broad, but I'm just wondering, is, is there any, um, is the intention just to leave that, like if three council members want to bring something we would do that outside of this legislative program. Um, so just wanting to make sure that doesn't get lost. Thanks, Council Member Brown. So the, the issue of local control, I was looking back through the manual and it's, it should be the top, basically the top um, I value uh, at the, in the program manual. So I'll make sure that that's clearly stated um, and universally city jurisdictions with regard to land use um, very much do not want interference with state and federal policies. Um, so I'll include that. In addition um, to, to that, with regard to if three members want to bring an item that is not part of our legislative platform, that is you know, the liberty of the council. And that actually is included in the program manual. So anything that's not previously adopted can come forward with, with council support. Good question, good comment, good catch. Uh, council member Watkins and then council member Cummings. And uh, yeah, we'll try to see when you wrap up. I'll, I'll be quick. I'll just um, say, I think part of the local control component really is our, you know, our relationship with the California League of Cities and just looking at how sort of their strengths and numbers in terms of our advocacy and legislative advocacy and that as, that a, as a pathway potentially. So. 
Thank you, Susie. I think this is really great. Council member coming. Yeah, and I'll just be brief. I just wanted to, um, based on council member Brown's comments, which that, that helped because I was curious about that position as well. And I know that there are oftentimes legislative issues that come up and we're asked by members of the community to take a position. So it was good to hear that, you know, if something like that comes forward, we can still bring that to council and have an agenda to be able to take, you know, express our support for other legislative um, policies that might be coming to us. Thank you, council member. You know, I think the distinction being is if that with this adopted platform, if there are items that come up from the community that you've already adopted, you don't have to bring it to council. We can move forward with the mayor providing that advocacy because it's already been laid out in the in the platform. Okay, thank you so much, Susie, for the report and for the work. Um, I would entertain a motion on this item. Uh, council member Cummings and then council member Watson. Yeah, I'm happy to move the staff recommendation uh, to approve the 2021 legislative program manual and platform documents. I'll go ahead and second that. Okay. We have a motion by council member Cummings and a second by council member Watkins to uh, approve the 2021 legislative program manual and platform documents. And Bonnie, can we do a uh, roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins? Aye. <clears throat> Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Boulder? Aye. Sorry, I was muted. Aye. Thank you. I, I thought I missed it. Okay, coming Scolder, aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We're gonna adjourn and um, we have not eaten or really moved for, <laughs> for about 10 hours. Um, so we will go ahead and restart at 6.50. We'll just give ourselves about a little under a half an hour to try to get some food and we will re-adjourn at 6.50. Thank you, everyone. Next up on our, uh, excuse me, hang on one sec here. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 6.30 session of the March 9th, 2021 meeting of the City Council. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meeting. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins? Here. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Boulder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Okay, great. Next up on our agenda tonight is oral communications. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. <coughs> Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. So if you are wanting to speak on the next item, which is item 26, Please uh, put your hand down, and as soon as we get this underway, we'll uh, we'll be able to to um, get you back up. So this again is for oral communications, is for items that is not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture in the meeting minutes. However, 
stating your name is not required. Please remember, this is a time for the council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and look to my uh, attendees. Uh, I have, and again, just make sure this is for oral communications. Um, this is for items not on the agenda. So I have a phone number ending in 9532 as the first uh, speaker for oral communication. Go ahead, please. Hey, ter terribly sorry, I dialed in. Uh, I meant to raise, lower my hand, but I'm not able to do it on my phone. So, okay, and you're, you want to speak to the following item or, or to oral communication? Yeah, that'll be for the following item, it's okay. my bad. Okay. Uh, next up, I have Laura Lee Martin. Are you here to speak for oral communications or on the item, on item number 26? Okay. The next person, oh, go ahead, Laura Lee. Are you here for item 26 or oral communications? Okay, I'll move on. Item 26. Okay, thank you. I'll move on to the next uh, phone number, which ends in 9532. This is for oral communications, not item 26. If you are here for oral communications, please go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Eric. If you're here for oral communications, you are able to speak now if you're here for item 26. Uh, we'll do that after all communication. Go ahead, Eric. Um, thank you, Mayor Myers. This is Eric Rodberg. Last week, uh, Chancellor Larif sent a campus-wide email claiming that the Student Housing West project was affordable. She made that claim multiple times. Um, and I know I presented to council before documentation on the exorbitant housing costs, but I just wanted to review it for the public and also for new council members. According to um, their own consultant study, the proposed rates for camp for Student Housing West are starting at a one bedroom, one bath, $3,540 for three students, For this is for one bedroom, up to $10,220 per month for a five bedroom, two bath. Now, technically, Student Housing West is not part of the uh, Long Range Development Plan. However, um, their claims that they're gonna house all additional 8,500 students under the Long Range Development Plan are completely unattainable because they have no plans to reduce the cost of housing to even the very high community rates. So I hope that you as a council, because this completely gets swept under the rug there that they, they can't just build the housing they have to offer it at a, at affordable or at least at market level rates or they'll never be able to fill it so their their promise is completely vacuous and i, I want you as council to um, keep that at the forefront when you negotiate with uh, with uh, the university um, and as you may know i was a um, i'm a named party to the comprehensive settlement agreement for the 2005 litigation um, on, on that, on the 2005 LRDP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sabina Holber, are you here for item 26 or would you like to speak for oral communication? Hi, I'd like to speak for oral communication. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to speak to how the city council is running these meetings and how they're not accepting enough public comment. Two weeks ago, there were dozens of people that were still on the line that had waited for hours and hours. They started at 5.30 that we all got online and at nine o'clock you cut off public comment. I was very happy that I was able to get my comment in, but I would really like to hear the rest of what your constituents are saying. Um, I'd also like to hear what the pros and cons that you're hearing you pass these things because 
to me, it does not sound like you really care about public comment. You care about passing the ordinances that you would like to pass. So I would really appreciate it if we could hear why you're cutting off public comment when you have so many people waiting in line. And I know Council Member Cummings asked that last time and there was not really a great answer from you, Mayor Myers. So I really would appreciate if you would address that and you make sure that you are running these sessions in a more democratic fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have uh, Serge Cagno, which I believe, Serge, you did contact us directly about public, uh, about oral communications. Um, yeah, if I could speak, uh, this will not be to item number 26. This will be just oral communications. Okay, please go ahead. Thanks, Serge. Not sure if you guys were able to catch the Board of Supervisors meeting this morning. Um, the Housing for Health uh, Strategic Plan for Homelessness, the three-year plan was presented, and uh, the six-month plan, um, they're gonna have a different, very workable, um, actual, um, each guideline, like what they're gonna do every six months. And an interesting one that they have for March that's slated, and it says, complete a draft of recommendations for county and city partnerships related to unsafe encampments. Um, if you look up the Board of Supervisors packet, it's page 34 is the six month plan for January to June. Uh, April has developed proposed action plan for creating and funding financial year 21-22 regional proactive multidisciplinary street outreach teams. Um, I, I hear a lot from the city about the county should be doing all this work and we have to take care of ourselves, but I don't understand why there's not more of this kind of talk of how the strategic plan is actually working for the city. And this is actually in, in a section called improving connections between the county and the city. So why are we not hearing about if this is a March um, action item for them, they, they have they uh, approached the city on that and why is that not part of our discussion these days? That's all I really wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, Stacy Falls, are you here for item 26 or are you here for oral communication? I'm here for oral communication. I wanted to echo what Sabina said a few minutes ago about the process by which these council meetings are run. And I'm on Zoom all day, every day with a bunch of high school students. I know it's not ideal. I know we all have to be sort of creative and graceful in this moment. But I just feel like the way these Zoom meetings are being conducted isn't super democratic. You know, we come to the meeting, we get cut off. We don't even have an opportunity to like have signs, have a t-shirt, have a button. You have no idea what any of us at home are thinking and you don't really seem to care. And I just wish it was different. Thank you. Next we have Abby Young. Are you here for oral communications or item 26? I'm here for item 26. Okay, we'll, um, we'll catch you back then. Uh, you. Next I have uh, Vinny, are you here for oral communications or item 26? Uh, for oral communications. Okay, go ahead please. This is about the uh, housing homeless project. So my neighbor spoke with Chief Andy Mills and was informed that on any given night, there's only four to five police officers on patrol. And many of the Rangers in Iran and Gulch have already been laid off. And there's no funding to have a police officer stationed permanently to the neighborhood surrounding Iran and Gulch to provide security at night. Now, let's be realistic. The idea of having them pack up every morning is unenforceable. Putting this kind of a housing, the homeless project in such a high density neighborhood without constant sorry. security. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I believe you're here for item 26. That's gonna be the discussion about the temporary outdoor living ordinance, which yeah. would include that kind of discussion. Okay, that'll be right up next. Okay, my apologies, thank no you. No worries at all, thank you. Okay, I think I have got everyone, Bonnie, did. It's hard to know because people are leaving their hands up. I can't really sort through. 
Well, I'm uh, lowering them as they're acknowledging that they're here for the next item. Okay. I think we got through everybody. Um, let me, I'm gonna lower everyone's hand. If, if anyone here for oral communication can raise your hand. Do. Okay. Okay, the, the Elise, please go ahead. Hi folks, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. I just wanted to say, Mayor Myers, uh, I would very much appreciate it if you and the city council would open the city council meetings to the public. Um, I was used to be urging that to happen in the civic, and I recently heard that there, people are using the civic for testing for COVID. So I'm not sure if you could do that on Tuesdays, but I feel the civic is large enough um, to have lots and lots of spacing, like at least 20 feet, maybe 40 feet. You could let 100 people into the civic. I think in a time when the restaurants are partially open, you know, people are taking out uh, food to go, we need our government back. And we need to see that the city council is really in good faith effort, cares about democracy, cares about public participation. And, you know, that's how the public found out that the, um, the city council was going to uh, accept the um, Bearcat was only because a bunch of citizens were attending at the meeting and they just happened to be there when they got word that the Bearcat um, was being offered to the city and so forth. So I just really hope that you all will really show that you care about democracy, that you care, because we can be totally safe. The city, Santa Cruz City Council used to meet in the Civic um, back in previous decades, and it was a wonderful way to have a lot of engagement. But in this time, I'm just asking for some public participation, I believe with masking and great distancing, we can all stay safe. And thank you for taking my comment. Thank you, Elise. Next Welcome. up is phone number ending in 1810, and we're just here for oral communication. Go ahead. Yeah, I speak because I prioritize and value freedom and liberty above even the protections of those in the Bill of Rights. And somewhere below that, I value efforts to eradicate wrongs such as discrimination, but would never go with the first two for the latter. Leftists have that value system upside down. Evidence that discriminatory reports to law enforcement ordinance that is a too vague attack on free speech, which clearly violates the definitive 51-year-old standing ruling of the Supreme Court case of Brandenburg versus Ohio, which holds prohibitions of speech must prove speech is likely to incite imminent lawless action, but the police are unlikely to be incited since they are enforcers of the law. Do you care? Your silence is the answer. You have placed your extremely vaguely described notion of discrimination superior to the right of free speech. I see no unity possible between either liberals or conservatives with the intolerant ultra-progressive left. The leftist almost religious cult prioritizes their versions of endless sins of, of trans transgressions, elevating those above individual liberty and the Constitution to vilify cultural appropriation, a lack of statistical diversity, a lack of inclusivity, a lack of extreme climate change priority, having private property, relative wealth, using unapproved speech, having different values, and, well, blaming mostly white people in the most intolerant and curly, untrue, racist manner, citing white supremacy or privilege, always with the blaming for bad outcomes, whatever occurs, which leaves me no choice but to openly oppose that for Ever because otherwise their totalitarian jackboots will come pounding at my door with a gulag in mind for people like me. You will be next to hear that knock, but too late by then you'll realize freedom is gone forever. The blatant racism of the anti-racists and the marijuana permit ordinance is another local example. Yes, the ever-expanding monopolistic control, corruption, and morality of the government is unsustainable, but that is not addressed by making a bigger, more authoritarian government trashing liberty or, for instance, suspending the Constitution because of a pandemic without primary. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Next up, uh, I have Hilda. This is for oral communications, not for item 26. Hi there. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. 
Um, yeah, so I was just commenting on uh, Elise about opening city council to the public. I think this is kind of important if we're passing ordin ordinances that kind of affect the homeless um, since libraries are closed and necessarily folks aren't having this privilege of having phones during a pandemic. Being able to broadcast this in an easily accessible way would be really important to kind of hear the voices of those 1,200 or more that are being affected right now during a pandemic. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank okay. you for listening. Next up, I have phone number ending in 5383. This is for oral communications and not item 26. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, council members. Thank you for accepting my comments um, for oral communications. Um, my name is Skirt Vonnegut, formerly of the Santa Cruz Derby Girls. Um, I would just like to comment on um, the public process here, echoing um, some of the other folks who have, who have commented. You know, I was I was in line to I was in the queue to speak at the last meeting and because uh, of Mayor Meyer's decision, I was unable to speak. And so thank you so much for taking my comment right now. All I would like to say is um, I would like to invite Mayor Myers and, uh, or, and or any other member of the council to um, please fill a gap that I am seeing in the discourse um, of these last few meetings. Um, and I would like to invite um, any council mayor, council member to speak directly to um, the people who will be affected by the temporary outdoor living ordinance. Speak directly to them, um, give them at least some consolation if you plan on passing this ordinance um, and explain, um, you know, try to, you know, give them some comfort for what they're going through. Um, you know, I left uh, the rally tonight at the city council building and as we were leaving, it started to rain. It got really cold. Um, my, my hands were, were cold and um, I was just thinking very compassionately of the folks who are living outside right now. I hope you are doing okay, folks. Um, you deserve better. Um, you deserve a home. You deserve shelter. I want to see you safe. I invite the city council members to speak directly to the people that they will be impacting by their actions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller just has the number one, and uh, this will be for oral communications and not um, item 26. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I am calling to, um, I'm a little confused on what's happened to public comment here. It used to be that we used to be able to speak three minutes, then it went down to two minutes, then one and a half. Now you have it set for tonight at one minute, cutting us off at 9 p.m. You also have, so we cannot speak I, I, was on, I was on the computer as well as on my phone to speak. I did not get, um, I did not, I would, did not have the ability to speak. I think there were a lot of us who tried to speak last week. I know that it's obvious, even though I counted, there are 32 people who voted, who wanted to, uh, I'm sorry, who did not support the ordinance and um, I think I counted seven people who did want the, who did support the ordinance. Obviously, you don't care what the public thinks. Um, and I, the last caller stated that maybe you should speak about, speak to the people who it affects most. You live in your glass houses as well as I live in my house, and we are fortunate, but you don't know what it's like to live out there in the rain. Um, and the reason I'm talking about this now is because obviously you're gonna cut people off at 9 p.m. and I doubt I'll get a chance to speak even though I'll try to get in line. So, um, Mayor Karen, I mean, uh, Myers, um, that's what I have to say. And I hope that most of you that do not 
um, the people that decide to vote for this ordinance, um, I, I will not be voting for you. Um, and I hope you lose your position. Thank you. Next, I have Chloe Hoke for oral communications, not for items on the agenda. I'm in the next section then. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. We will now um, begin item number 26 on our agenda this evening. That's the ordinance related to regulations for temporary outdoor living. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We then will take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I am going to try to limit uh, public comment um, to no later than 9.15 tonight. I'm adding additional time because we did start late and I do wanna try to get as many people um, being able to speak tonight as possible. Uh, I'm gonna give you each one minute because um, that allows the council to continue to deliberate on the item. And um, I will again, try to accommodate everyone that is um, queued up tonight. And um, in keeping with that, to try to give as much time for groups, I mean, excuse me, for individuals to speak, um, I have not granted any extra time tonight for groups um, in an effort to try to achieve um, as much um, public comment as we can. If you are interested in, so right now I'm gonna turn this back over to staff. Um, we have Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, Andy Mills, our Police Chief, and Kathy Bronson from the City Attorney's Office this evening. And uh, Lee, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. We'll then return to have council, um, council comments, or excuse me, questions. And then I will take it out to public comment right after that. Thank you, Mayor Myers. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, does everyone see the PowerPoint here without the notes pages? Yes, we do. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Myers, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Um, I'm Lee Butler, I'm the Planning, Community Development, and Homeless Response Director for the city. And joining me this evening will be Andy Mills, our Police Chief. Um, I will try to be uh, concise yet thorough as a means to provide um, as much time for community comment as I can here. So I'm gonna go over the ordinance um, briefly, and I'm gonna go over potential modifications and um, as was the case with the first reading of this ordinance, we've heard from hundreds of people. I wanna thank those individuals for providing comments and providing that valuable feedback for both staff and for the council deliberations. As I noted in the February 23rd presentation, the ordinance before the council this evening is but one part of many city efforts that include millions of dollars that we spend each year on things like support for nonprofits, like Housing Matters and the Downtown Streets team, um, the Downtown Outreach team, County Mental Health Liaisons embedded with our police and hygiene and trash, trash services, rental payment assistance, and so forth. Um, we also uh, support um, affordable housing through uh, direct funding as well. And um, as Serge Cagno mentioned um, in the oral communications, it's important to note that um, the county is taking some great steps towards addressing homelessness countywide. And just today, the Board of Supervisors adopted a six month and three year strategic plan with four key objectives being um, building a coalition, preventing homelessness, increasing connections, and expanding permanent housing. And also on the county's agenda was a separate item that had a number of components, but one of those was um, a direction to the county staff to um, find a location for at least a hundred or multiple locations for at least 120 new homeless shelter beds in unincorporated county areas. And so wanted to make sure everyone was aware of the progress and the relationship between um, what we're doing here and um, larger efforts. <clears throat> 
All right, quick overview of the ordinance. Um, the prohibited areas include beaches, and, and this, I'll say, is the ordinance that is before the council um, this evening as a second reading, um, and it does not include the, the changes that will be under consideration. I'll get to those in just a little bit. So the ordinance before the council prohibits camping in beaches, parks, some of the open spaces, downtown, residentially zoned areas, and in closed areas. The potentially prohibited areas include fire hazard areas that the fire chief can close, flood prone areas that the public works can, director can close when uh, there's a risk of flooding, and then sensitive habitat areas that would be designated following careful review of biological reports and various other related documents. The acceptable areas um, include um, commercial and industrial areas, so primarily sidewalks in those areas. Um, and then portions of a number of the open spaces, those being Poganip, Moore Creek, Arana Gulch, and De La Viega. And um, areas in proximity to trails in these open spaces would be off limits. And of course, some of those areas could also be off limits due to other provisions in the ordinance like the habitat protection or the fire risk. The ordinance also allows for the council or city manager to designate managed encampments or similar facilities. And we've noted in the report that we would come back to the council with some general policy parameters for those in advance of standing up those uh, operations should this ordinance pass. And then um, I'll also note that the ordinance calls for a minimum of 150 safe sleeping sites to be set up by the city. That's the current um, ordinance. Um, then um, the ordinance before you this evening also um, contains behavioral requirements. It cites tent prohibitions between the hours of 7 a.m. and one hour before sunset, with exceptions for disabled individuals, caretaker, their caretakers, and um, families with children. Um, also related to behavioral requirements, fires would be prohibited, and there are various requirements related to storage, um, si uh, size of encampments, litter, environmental damage, and various other limitations. Um, with respect to enforcement, the ordinance as drafted would call for a progressive approach with warnings, citations, and misdemeanors, and it spells out criteria related to the confiscation and storage of belongings. So um, you can see here, this is the map from the last uh, time, the first reading. Um, this shows the prohibited areas. The one thing that um, would be added here, of course, is the residential areas. And so that would add a considerable amount of red in terms of the prohibited areas to this map. And then um, this shows the potentially prohibited areas. And um, you can see in the yellow stripe is the, uh, those are the habitat, sensitive habitat areas. The hatch mark is the um, wildland urban interface, and then the blue are potential flood zones. And then this map just shows an overlay. Again, um, you know, significantly more areas prohibited um, in all of the residential areas of the city. Okay, um, we've heard a lot of comments um, about the open spaces. Um, that was one of the predominant um, themes, uh, concern about those. Um, the four open spaces that are allowed in uh, the current draft are Moore Creek, De La Viega, Arana Gulch, and Poganip. Everyone knows where those are around the perimeter of the city here. And um, you can see that um, each of those areas is covered in the wildland urban interface. And much of those areas is also covered by sensitive habitat. Um, that could, uh, either of those could prohibit camping in, camping in those areas, as well as uh, many of those areas due to proximity to trails also have red. And um, at this point, I'll jump into the potential changes that the council may want to consider um, as they were outlined in the agenda report. Um, the council is free to consider whatever changes you all see fit. Um, and the ones that we outlined in the agenda report were just some of the feedback that we had been hearing um, prior to drafting that report. So I'll um, start out of order here with De La Viega. And you can see due to the different de designations 
within De La Viega as well as various trail designations. So, you know, the parks themselves are um, off limits for camping. And so some of this area is prohibited. And then um, there were some requests to continue a perimeter around here. And then similar to um, what we heard with all the open spaces, there were some requests to eliminate camping, camping in the open spaces altogether. And this is just a close up of those maps. I won't belabor the point because I think you're familiar with it. Um, then um, we, when the council um, prohibited camping in residential areas, we inadvertently left out the RT, the tourist uh, the tourist residential um, components, and that includes um, Beach Hill and Beach Flats. Um, the uh, council likely intended to include those, but we left off the RT residential designation, so that may be something the council would want to consider as well in um, uh, potential amendments. Um, we also heard from the community and they said, hey, what about um, all of Swanton Boulevard? The way, we, um, uh, the way that we structure the ordinance, the area here on Swanton Boulevard, the, the west um, parking lot, sorry, the west, uh, uh, it's not actually a sidewalk there, but the public right of way um, in that location um, could actually allow for camping under the ordinance because we did not um, prohibit camping in uh, parks zoning districts as this is. We prohibited, park, uh, prohibited camping in designated parks under the parks master plan. And so um, the staff report went into that. The council can um, direct us to clean up that item and um, prohibit parking on some or all of Swanton where the ordinance currently wouldn't um, prohibit it. Similar situation here on um, Lighthouse Field. Um, state parks, all of the state parks, whether it's um, uh, Seabright or Lighthouse Field or Natural Bridges, um, all of those, the, the state parks prohibit camping. Um, that is a state requirement. And so we did not address the state parks in the draft ordinance. Same situation occurs here along Pelton, you can see the south side of Pelton is actually in a PK zoning district. And so we referenced residential zoning districts being approved. The council has an opportunity to direct us to clean that up should they wish to do so. Um, the state parks we've already talked about, it's prohibited in each of those. And what we recognized is that due to the way that um, we um, called out parks and referenced the parks master plan, the same issue that occurred on um, Pelton and um, uh, Swanton could uh, and, and would actually occur in other places just adjacent to um, uh, neighborhood parks um, and community parks, for example. And so the council may wanna consider some cleanup language um, that prohibits camping on the sidewalks um, adjacent to city and state parks when that abuts a residential zoning district. So, you know, in not all instances do parklands abut a residential zoning district. And I think, um, you know, if it's abutting an industrial zoning district, for example, the council may be interested in maintaining a camping allowances there, but this would allow for um, uh, prohibitions in residential areas. Um, moving on to um, the transportation direction that was included in the ordinance. Um, staff had some questions surrounding this um, related to um, from where and to where. Um, and so we um, uh, have an alternative that was included with the um, agenda report. And I won't read the whole thing, but essentially it, it's looking to get some more specifics with re relation to on street transportation and to storage facilities. And so council may wanna provide some additional direction um, related to that um, transportation requirement. And I'm just gonna say, I'm happy to go back to any of these if you guys have questions. I know I'm moving really quickly. I just wanna um, leave as much time for public comment as possible while also getting through all the um, items in the agenda report. Um, the third item in the agenda report, I'll, I'll note that the numbers here are referring to the numbers in the agenda report. Um, are, it's related to um, locations where disabled individuals, caretakers, and families 
um, could camp, you know, the council will recall the ordinance allows for these individuals to um, stay in place for up to 96 hours. And um, the ordinance itself um, does not clearly call out um, locations where that could happen. It says that it can happen, but it doesn't provide any exceptions for where it could happen. And so council could say, um, provide additional allowances on sidewalks, um, potentially even where they could block sidewalks in some certain manner. Uh, council could say, um, allow that in certain open spaces, um, in um, city designated, uh, in, in parking lots, um, in uh, safe sleeping lots. Um, council could even say um, that um, the city uh, workers at those locations should assist individuals if they're packing up every day and so forth. Um, so uh, there are a wide range of options in which the council could choose to address this, and we're happy to talk with you about this further should you choose to have any questions or want to discuss with us. Um, next up, we had um, some provisions in the ordinance about um, COVID and uh, delay on enforcement. And um, we heard a lot of comments related to this from the community as well. Um, the top bullet here is um, what the, the ordinance currently says. It says that um, certain provisions in the ordinance would not be um, enforced until a vaccine is widely available to, for free to unhoused individuals. Um, that is one option that the council could consider. There are also other options that the council could, could consider related to this. Um, changes to the CDC guidance could be a different threshold. Um, it could be when the county or state declaration of lo local health emergency is lifted or it could be when the county moves to a yellow or orange tier of COVID spread per California's multi-tier system. And just to note here, um, the yellow tier is the level where there is less spread. Um, so um, moving on, this is something that we didn't include in the agenda report, but it's related to the prior slide um, about um, enforcement triggers. Um, we, we did identify in the, um, the ordinance that um, the daytime restrictions would not be in effect until um, storage, daytime storage was in place. Um, and the council has the ability to, to put other limitations or to modify that. They could say, don't enforce certain portions or all of the ordinance until safe sleeping sites are in place or until managed camps are in place or other specific uh, shelter options or locations are in place. So just wanna put those options out there for the council to consider and happy to talk about those further if you wish. Um, next up, outreach. Um, the draft ordinance has an outreach component and council may wanna confirm what the desired outreach is here. It could be related to connecting individuals with services or educating regarding how camping is allowed and where it's allowed and where it's not, or it could be both of those. So there may be uh, a desire for council to clarify that. And then second, um, we wanted to point out that it's, um, that social service outreach is not a function of most cities. Um, we don't have staff who are dedicated to doing social service outreach work. Um, we help fund various organizations like Downtown Outreach Team and the County Hopes Team, but they're independent organizations and their outreach would generally be out of our control. And I'll, I'll go back to the county uh, approach here for a moment and note that they are striving to expand their outreach as part of the increased connections objectives in their six month and three year strategic plan. And while that will certainly be helpful, the outreach staff will still be out of our control. And the, the first line in this text here that shall ensure language could be challenging for the city given the lack of control that the city has for some of those outreach efforts. So um, as noted in the staff report, there is potential alternative for the council to consider. I won't read it. Um, folks can reference it in the staff report. I won't read it for sake of time here. And then um, 
I'll invite Chief Andy Mills up to talk through some of the enforcement provisions. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council members. Thank you for uh, Andy Mills, your police chief. Thank you for giving us some time to discuss enforcement uh, of this. Uh, the approach that Santa Cruz Police Department has taken is a mixture of compassion and accountability. Uh, we've, uh, we've done a, I feel like, great job working with people to try to send them to the resources that they need uh, in order to get help. In fact, our officers have access to cards that can be handed out to uh, people who are experiencing homelessness so that they can see and call uh, some of the uh, resources that are available to them. Uh, in order for us to be effective, um, I believe that we need to have some level of leverage for the recalcitrant few who determined, who are determined not to adhere to the standards of living in this community. Uh, for example, uh, one individual who camps on Main Beach on a regular basis has been cited 39 times in the last little over a year and continues to camp there. And uh, that those are infraction citations. And so for us to actually uh, move that person along, we've tried stayaway orders, we've tried a variety of things uh, with this individual and, uh, and it becomes um, a matter of will in terms of is this location, Main Beach, going to be one of those uh, areas that we do not want people to camp. So the ordinance would allow us to have uh, a few options. One is, for instance, uh, and most of this, by the way, is on a reactive basis. We aren't proactively going out looking for people camping. Uh, people are calling us and we respond to those calls for service and start off in a four-tiered process. The first level is to inform uh, use of those cards, uh, educate people and let them know that there are options and alternatives available to them. The second is to warn and to document that, that uh, people, uh, if you don't move along or if you don't <coughs> camp, if you're camping in a place that is a time, place and manner issue, that you can be cited. Uh, and then uh, it can be moved to a infraction citation. If enough of those accumulate, then it can go to a, uh, a, a little bit more serious offense where the city attorney's office works with the courts to obtain a stay away order. So in the upcoming potential ordinance, there would be several things. One, um, separate the behaviors from the status, things like fires, um, build up of bicycle parts, or no prompt action by the individual uh, uh, could elicit a misdemeanor citation. Uh, after that citation, and if it continues, multiple violations, they could technically be taken into custody because it's a misdemeanor. And that is literally the only leverage that we have. Now they are, need to be candid with you, they're unlikely to stay in, in jail. They could probably be taken to the jail and cited and released there. Um, but that is the most that we can, uh, I believe, get out of this. Um, I think there's a couple of other things that I think are important to, uh, to point out and to note. Uh, the first one is that we need to manage the expectations for the community of what is likely to take place here. Um, we've issued a lot of citations over the years. And as, as at the infraction level, there's not much motivation to actually appear on those citations. So for us to be effective, there has to be at least one higher level tier where we can go to if we absolutely need to when it's necessary. And that's just a decision that, you know, uh, you can either direct us to do or not do, uh, depending on what you, on what you see. Uh, the last part of this, I think, is, is a salient point is we also have asked for a provision uh, to have a restorative justice model, something that will allow us to divert people from the criminal justice system and allow them the opportunity uh, to uh, not be uh, have an infraction or even a misdemeanor citation by doing something to build up this community rather than tear it down. And so um, for those that are having uh, behavioral um, uh, issues, then this would allow us uh, the ability to do that. So 
Uh, those are the things that I believe are important to note. Uh, this will take an immense amount of effort on our time. Uh, when I mentioned that we would put extra people out, not for the purpose of proactively um, uh, citing people, but responding to what we believe will be an immense need from the community calling us on uh, people uh, who may be in violation of the section. And even so, we will still use the processes that we've already had, uh, which is to begin by informing, then warning, then citing, and then potentially, in the rare circumstance, uh, taking somebody to physical custody. Thank you, Chief Mills. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that I would add that's in the agenda report is um, the potential alternatives of, of tying um, specific actions to um, the misdemeanor, and um, that's detailed in the agenda report. And then one additional thing that I would note is a um, recommended uh, or a potential addition um, to a uh, section of the code, or yeah, a section of the code, which um, speaks to um, the Martin versus Boise case that, where it notes that sleeping cannot be criminalized when adequate spaces to sleep, adequate places to sleep are not available. So we did draft the ordinance to comply with that case, but to make sure that's conveyed crystal clearly, um, the council could consider adding the statement that's identified here as part of the enforcement provisions. Um, moving on to section seven from the agenda report, um, the um, ordinance as drafted would um, prohibit sleeping um, or camping, I should say, between the hours of um, 7 a.m. and one hour before sunset. And there are some, some exceptions, um, both um, in relation to um, the disabled and caretakers and so forth, but also um, we included some safe sleeping exceptions. This was discussed at the last council meeting um, where uh, later, uh, later start time would be available. So that was put in place so that, for example, if a parking lot was still being occupied at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., you know, the safe sleeping could start later. There have also been questions that have arisen with respect to the, the standard 7 a.m. time that starts uh, the prohibited camping period, whether there would be sufficient light for individuals to pack up their belongings at 7 a.m., given the uh, different sunrise times throughout the year, and some questions about you know, whether there should be alternative times applied throughout the ordinance rather than just um, in relation to the safe sleeping um, uh, facilities. So that's another option for the council to consider. And that covers the changes. I'm going to rehash a slide from last time, which um, notes that the ordinance as presented, um, or even if council modifies it, is not going to end homelessness. The many items that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation are geared towards that effort. This is just one of the tools that would be used to address some of the behavioral, environmental, and quality of life concerns that can arise, particularly with large encampments or camps that, re that remain for an extended period of time. Um, and I'm getting close here, um, but I do want to call out for you that um, we've done some preliminary analysis and have some numbers related to the costs of various facilities. And um, for a safe sleeping site where we're assuming two staff members present while that safe sleeping site is operational as the primary cost, and then um, we have restrooms and hand washing and servicing of those facilities plus storage costs. Now, roughly about $250,000 a year for 50 people. If we had three separate sites, that would be about $750,000 a year for um, 150 individuals. With a storage program, um, that would assume two staff per, per location, five hours per day, plus restroom and hand washing and servicing of those. Um, that would run roughly $75,000 per year per location. Um, with that kind of staffing level. And then um, with the managed camps, 
Um, our cost for 1220 River, when we ran a managed camp, and actually we, we um, uh, had a uh, nonprofit running that for us for a while, um, we spent about $80,000 per month for uh, 50 camping spaces. And um, the county, when they had the Benchlands managed camp, they were spending over $100,000 a month. Um, that was serving about 85 people at its peak. Um, that included meal service and, and various other things. So that just gives you an idea. Um, and these are just rough estimates. Um, and we would encourage, we would very much encourage any organization seeking to run such facilities to express their interests, particularly if they have you know, a volunteer network, for example, that could help reduce operational costs. Obviously, these are um, very significant costs. Um, but that does need to be an important consideration, particularly given the, um, the deficits that the city is, is facing both this year and in long-term structural capacity. Um, to bring, to ground these a little bit, this is a headline from last week in the San Francisco Chronicle, just last week. San Francisco is paying $16.1 million for homeless tent camps. Um, 262 tents and over 300 people that amounts to 61,000 and some change per tent site. That's for the bathrooms, the meals, the 24 seven security. And so, you know, these, these facilities are very expensive and, and they can also offer some, um, some great benefits in terms of a, a safe place for people to go in the evening. So I want to um, convey both sides of that to the council as part of your considerations. Um, Last slide here, um, the mayor went over the process here, but I had um, written um, a uh, thank you to so many people last time, uh, and I was excited to get through my hour long presentation and forgot to say it, so I'm gonna uh, convey that now. And I, I do wanna thank the many people who have worked on the aspects of this ordinance, the cash subcommittee and full cash volunteered many hours debating this topic. The council members have spent many hours. The members of the public that have participated in council and cash meetings, as well as 700 plus pages of correspondence just on this meeting, plus last meeting, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, and then of course the city team has analyzed and debated and negotiated and compromised on many versions of this ordinance. And that's been, you know, council members, the city manager's office, the city attorney's office, Cassie Bronson has, um, put in countless hours, fire, parks, police, water, IT, public works, finance, every single department has contributed to this effort. And so I wanted to extend a thanks to all of those. And with that, we are available for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Lee. I'll turn this over to council member questions now. Um, and, um, I, yeah, just, I am gonna try to accommodate as many people in public comment tonight. So if we can um, leave our deliberations till after public comment so we can really hear from folks. Um, and so I'll open it up for questions. Uh, Council Member Boulder, I think you had your hand up first. I, I okay, I've a, <laughs> do you want me to save my comments then or just stick to the question right now? I'd like to get your questions. If there's clarifying questions for staff, if okay. uh, you want to, so yeah. I'll save my comments. My question is, um, and I know everyone was on this meeting, but is there somebody that can let us know how the change at the county level um, will help with our situation in the city and like how soon can we expect to see those beds open up? And thank you to our partners at the county that brought that forward and um, passed up this morning. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I wasn't able to attend the county discussion today um, as we were in session here. Um, but um, it's, it's going to depend on a number of factors, um, how quickly they can secure their land, um, how, what, what type of facility they wanna set up. Is it, is it something that they do on a temporary basis um, or something that they wanna do as a long-term facility? And so there are a lot of factors, but suffice to say, you know, that takes time. Um, so um, the 120, I think you're referring to the 120 shelter beds, and um, that isn't gonna be something that's happening um, likely in, um, you know, the next few months. It's going to be 
a, a longer term effort. Um, even if they, they've got land, it, it takes time to um, mobilize all the resources even for a temporary facility. Any other questions, Council Member Holder? No. I'll, I'll save my, I'll save my separate. Okay. Uh, Council Member Watkins was next and then Council Member Cumming. Yeah, I think I'll save a lot of my comments and questions also, but I just really want to speak to a comment that I heard during oral communications in which you were referred to as Mayor Karen. And I guess I just want to say a couple of things about that. One is that it was misused. Often that's associated with racial um, actions. And I think we want to be really clear about that with language. And I, um, I also want to say as mayor, it's the job of the mayor to facilitate public input and process. And it's a tricky job. And I have empathy for your position and, um, and also just recognize that's the role of the job of mayor, right? To facilitate that process. Um, I think after four years of name calling, I hope that we can move away from that type of um, dialogue and that we as a council welcome, of course, your policy input and ideas and thoughts and opinions. But when you go to personal name calling, I think it really is something I'd like to see left in the past as, um, as we had a lot of that from our former president. And so I just really want to say that because I think we all observed it and heard it. And I hope my colleagues here on the dais, the virtual dais, stand with me and wanting to move forward in that kind of direction. So I will reserve my comments specific to this item, but hope that as we move into oral or into the public comment process that our community members can adhere to that standard. Thank you, council member. Council member Cumming. Thank you, Mayor, and I agree with my colleagues' statements that were just made right now regarding um, some comments that were made during oral communications. I had a couple clarifying questions, and I'm going to also reserve, I think, the bulk of my comments for later, because I think that as we get through deliberations, um, a lot of those comments will be addressed. Um, the first one was, I'm wondering if you can just explain with regards to the on-street transportation and what that, can you just clarify what that statement is referring to? Sure. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Let me um, pull this back up. Um, and I apologize for going quickly through that, but let me uh, get that. Uh, the transportation, I believe, is number two. Yes, okay. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again here. So this is um, where we saw um, the draft said authorized storage programs shall be required to provide transportation assistance to individuals who request it. And a potential alternative would be as city personnel encounter individuals who are camping in prohibited areas or at prohibited times. So that's the <coughs> when it would be offered. The city shall have a service available to assist individuals with on-street transportation to storage facilities. So that's again, it's saying um, where they're going to, where they're they're starting from. Um, the concern, part of the concern was um, the um, drafted language um, could be interpreted very broadly, like you know, well, someone would be given assistance to um, take their belongings um, out into the far reaches of the Poganip every day um, with, the, with a broad interpretation of the language. And so that's where we wanted to um, have the council consider a, a more narrowed um, uh, directive as part of the ordinance. Thanks, and I guess I'm just so, explicitly the reason why you're stating on street is that to mean, for example, if someone had materials in an open space that wouldn't, they wouldn't then get assistance to move that to storage facilities. I'm just trying to understand, you know, why the term on street is used and like how it applies to the circumstance. So whether that's, you know, you have to be in the city um, in, in like a residential area or does this apply to other spaces as well? 
Right. Certainly the council is, you know, it's, it's the council's discretion um, related to this. I think um, part of the concern was that this says shall be required. So uh, the storage program shall be required to provide transportation to individuals. So, so the concern was where does that go? And, and obviously, you know, if, if someone's being required to provide transportation to, you know, far reaches of open space, that's gonna take really significant um, staff time. Um, you know, if they're um, helping convey materials back and forth. And so that's where we wanted to, to have the council consider the implications of the policy that um, uh, has been approved. And, um, you know, there are, there are time and cost implications, but it's, it's the council's discretion as to how they want to approach the issue. We wanted to call it to your attention so that um, you, can, you can make that informed decision. Thanks, I think that helped. Um, next question, I was interested in better understanding, you know, in the, I think when, the, when we met last, you know, the council had called out, um, you know, no camping, for example, in neighborhoods, and then looking through the ordinance, and then even today, you know, we have all the different zones called out, and I'm wondering, kind of, you know, if we, ex if we express neighborhoods, parks, and things like that, why do we have to call out all the zones? And is there an easier way of saying what parts of the community are off limits by just stating, you know, neighborhoods, parks, open space, et cetera? So I'm just wondering if you can clarify, you know, why, do, why we're laying out every single zone. And, uh, sure, I, I think um, it's, it's been an iterative process um, and I appreciate that question because um, as we go through that iterative process, there may be alternative approaches. And so, um, you know, depending on how the council wants to um, direct us this evening, there may be an alternative approach that's preferred in terms of how the ordinance is structured. Um, so, you know, we started off with um, uh, fewer, you know, we tried to, to minimize the number of areas that were prohibited. Um, and certain areas have been, more areas have been prohibited um, with the addition of residential, um, for example. And so, you know, certainly if, if we're heading in that direction, um, if it's the will of the council, we could restructure the ordinance such that it, um, it is worded in the affirmative of here are the areas that you could go um, if, um, if that's the will of the council, that would be an alternative approach. Um, because you're, you're correct, there are, uh, you know, the number of prohibited areas has been growing. Great, thanks. Um, one thing I did want to point out, I know it was mentioned, um, I think it was mentioned in the presentation around sensitive habitats being on the list, but when going through the ordinance, I just want to point out that it's sensitive species that are listed, and so we actually don't have sensitive habitats as no sleeping areas, so just to provide that distinction, there's, there's a difference between, um, you know, sensitive species and sensitive habitats, because sensitive habitats might not be endangered, but their degradation could be difficult. It could be difficult to um, restore those habitats if they're degraded. So just wanted to point that out to the council and the public. Um, and then, I'll leave my questions there for now. I'm sure I have more, but I, I know that um, we have limited time for comment, and I want to ensure that we can hear from as many members of the public as possible. So, and I know my other colleagues have got questions as well, so I'll stop there. Thank you. And Donna, I think you're muted. Right. I'm sorry. Uh, Count, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, uh, Councilmember Brown, and Councilmember Colin Dari Johnson. In that order. Great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Councilmember Watkins, for calling out that caller statement. Uh, my questions, I'll be quick. Uh, I did have one question and uh, Council Member Cummings brought it up on the transportation alternative language um, that was part of the amendments 
that council member Kalantari Johnson and myself had included and added at the last reading. Um, I'm still unclear of the definition of on street in that usage, what, what was intended uh, for that alternative language. Sure, uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, I think what um, the thought was as part of that discussion was that it would be vehicular transportation. Um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be going into the open spaces, um, but it would likely be vehicular transportation. Um, so that's, that was the thought going into it. And again, you know, council discretion, but that was how it was considered in development. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> and um, my second question was um, the hours, you brought up a slide, uh, something about the hours. Um, and again, if you could clarify that. Sure, happy to. Um, so I will, um, well, I don't know that the slide itself um, is, is particularly helpful, but um, the, um, the current ordinance allows for camping um, between one hour before sunset and 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. And um, council members will recall it, it was presented last time as eight, um, allowed from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And there was some discussion about, well, it gets dark early in the uh, winter. And so maybe we should have one hour before sunset. That'll give time, that'll give people time to set up their camps. Um, and then 7 a.m., since that time, um, since the last meeting, the questions have also arisen, well, is 7 a.m. the right time? Um, so some other communities have done things like half an hour before sunset to half an hour after sunrise, or it could be an hour before to an hour after, and so forth. So there are lots of different ways that the council could do it. And given those questions that have arisen, I just wanted to call that to the council's attention um, as a potential discussion uh, topic. And um, we did have um, exceptions built in to those um, one hour before sunset to 7 a.m. for our expressly for our safe sleeping zones. So we said it's allowed, but you know the safe sleeping zones can have different hours, um, so that you know it, it wouldn't conflict with other uses. You know, if it's a parking lot, you know, starting at at four o'clock on on Christmas Eve, you know, an hour before sunset, then you know downtown parking lot might be full at that time. So. Um, that was that was the thought is um, you may want to consider alternatives there. Okay, and um, what what parks are not under state parks or parks master plan? Um, so um, the open spaces are not considered parks in the parks master plan. Okay, but there's okay. Yeah, so, so I think we've got seven, and I can pull the slide up. We've got seven open spaces, um, and the ordinance before you precludes camping in a number of those, um, but um, I'm almost to the slide. Um, here we go. We've got Arana Gulch, Moore Creek, De La Viega, Poganip. Yeah, so, so, um, here, um, Neary Lagoon is an open space, but it's, it would be prohibited. The um, uh, Arroyo Soco Canyon would be prohibited, um, and uh, but others like the uh, Moore Creek, Poganip, um, De La, and um, uh, the Arana Gulch would uh, not fall under those prohibitions in the ordinance that's before you tonight. Um, okay, and Arana Gulch portions would be due to the trail uh, proximity, is that correct? That's correct. You can see in, in each of these, you know, the trails at 75 feet. So these are 150 foot wide because it's 75 feet on either side um, would be expressly prohibited. Um, and then um, the um, sensitive habitat areas could be prohibited as, uh, 
Councilmember Cummings said, if they're determined to have potential impacts on sensitive species. So if the camping would have uh, impact on sensitive species, and these would be the first areas that we would look at and evaluate is these habitat areas. Should the council approve the ordinance as is drafted? Okay. Um, and uh, I th that's it for now, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, council member Brown and then council member Collentary Johnson. Yeah, I, I just wanna make note here. I, I do have a comment because I think it's important to note that it is now 8.03. Um, we are not even done with council member questions and I appreciate that folks are trying to limit them, but um, we are leaving almost no time for the public to speak. And I think that given what we're hearing, it, um, it seems like there are a lot more people who want to speak on this item. Um, I would appreciate extending uh, public comment time to allow for that. And I, you know, I, I just, I just want to say that, you know, on an issue, a set of issues and a major policy change that is going to have major, major impacts on our city, all of our residents, the city budget, um, marginalized people in our community that um, it, you, it's the least we could do to uh, let the people speak. Um, my question is, uh, with respect to the cost estimates, um, we did, have you um, talked with other actors besides the county to, have you talked with any of the nonprofits or community faith-based organizations to um, try to get a handle on um, what costs might be if we looked at alternative uh, administrative uh, models because I, I think that um, certainly that would be significantly reduced um, were we to do that. So I just am wondering if you've talked with anybody else to get a sense of what the cost might be otherwise. So I'd note that the, um, the managed camp um, was run, um, I believe it was Salvation Army that was running that is my recollection. And our estimate there was about 80,000. So that um, that is less than what the county um, was doing um, for the 100,000 plus that they were spending um, for you know roughly the same number of individuals. Though um, uh, you know uh, they uh, were also providing more meal services um, as well. Um, and um, what we based that on was just hours and pay. So $19 an hour, number of hours, number of staff. Um, I do have a, a meeting set up next week um, with a provider that, you know, I, I hope that we can have some of those conversations. Um, however, um, you know, between two weeks ago and right now, um, we all we were able to do is, is get these rough estimates just based on, um, you know, using those, you know, back of the envelope. Here's how many hours we would have people out there if it was um, two staff members and, and then we used our experience based on the 1220 River Street. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and I would say, you know, there is that potential and we're hopeful that um, some uh, nonprofit providers could um, assist in doing it in a more cost efficient manner. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, I also share um, Councilmember Brown's concern that uh, hoping that we can extend public comment a little bit longer. Um, and I also want to thank Councilmember Watkins. The um, name calling is unacceptable. We may share, have different perspectives and come from different experiences, but there's no reason for that and we can do better than that. I do have a clarifying question for Lee, um, I, or maybe something to confirm that permitted managed camp programs are currently possible um, in the ordinance as it's written right now. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. There seems to be confusion that that's not included, but it is currently possible. Yes, it is. And we have said in our draft report that one of the next steps would be to, if should this be approved, we would come back to the council with a policy um, that provides some just high level guidance for those. You know, we don't necessarily want to get really specific, but just high level guidance so we can understand what the council would like to see as part of those should this ordinance be adopted. Great, thank you, that was my question. Thank you, council member. 
Um, and I appreciate the council members' brevity in their questions. Um, as many people know, last couple of weeks ago when we um, reviewed this, we stayed till 1.30 in the morning and um, there was a lot of people that left during that process too. So I'm trying to balance um, a peak period of time where we can get as many people from the public involved in commenting um, and give council members enough time for questions and comments and deliberation. Um, I'm not intending to eliminate or try to deny anyone public comment. Um, but I don't think setting po policy at 1.30 in the morning is helpful to our community either. So um, I am very re re recognizing that I'm in a major balancing act right now. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and extend the um, public comment time up to uh, 9.45. So I'm gonna add an extra 30 minutes. Right now there's 98 speakers um, starting at 8.08. I'm hoping we can accommodate everyone if all 98 people would like to speak. Um, so if I did my math right, I might miss a few here or there. And feel free if you're speaking tonight. If you don't need your full minute, please make your comment as brief as possible and we can get through as many people as we can. So I'll go ahead and open this up for public comment. Um, if you are interested in commenting on, on the ordinance related to regulations for temporary outdoor living, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to one minute. Public comment will end at 9 p.m., excuse me, 9.45 p.m. to return to council action and deliberation. And we will go ahead and get started. I have caller Laura Lee Martin, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Laura Lee Martin. Can you hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, 30 year resident of Prospect Heights neighborhood. Thank you for taking on this difficult issue. I realize the issues of homelessness and city ordinances are controversial and complex. However, the issue of fire safety is not. I'm from Paradise, California. The firestorms we're seeing in recent years extend beyond what would normally be expected. The CSU fire had many of us in the city packed, evacuating or prepared to go. If camping is allowed in the open spaces of De La Viega Park or on a gulch and Moore Creek, it will have the potential to put the entire city of Santa Cruz at risk from devastating fires as well as our neighbors in the county. These areas are also a constant risk of falling trees and branches. They're not safe for camping. The fire in De La Viega would also put our 911 center, our hospital, the armory shelter, the golf course, Santa Cruz Shakespeare, and more city assets at risk. Please amend the ordinance to remove Dale Abbey Park and these other open space areas from allowed overnight housing. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Serge Cagna. Go ahead, Serge. Hi, um, good evening. Um, thanks for um, giving me some time. Um, there were some slides that I sent, Bonnie. Could you put up slide number three? Is that possible? Well, I'll just keep talking. I hadn't realized that health in all policies was actually an ordinance. It's 6.03.050, and it states that all agenda reports within a year of adoption, which we're past that time, will contain a paragraph considering health in all policies. So since this doesn't have one, I don't know whether uh, that Lee just broke the law and whether this uh, vote can actually go forward without that being included. Um, with slide two, I had a map that shows the black is the only places that people are allowed to camp. And this is the best I could do trying to figure it out and trying to cross off all the neighborhoods. Um, it's a completely confusing, it's absolutely unconstitutional. Homeless people are never gonna be able to figure that one out. Thank you. Next up is phone number. Oh, Serge, are you still working? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, do I still have time? It hasn't rained yet. You do. Okay. Well, if the, if it was possible to show slide number three, um, that was I emailed all of you guys. Uh, Sorry. Thank you, Serge. Will, if you email us the, um, the slide, we'll certainly look at it. We appreciate it. Next up is phone number in 0950. 
Hello, my name is Saladin Sale, speaking for the Moore Creek Canyon Homeowners Association. We support your efforts to help the homeless. At the same time, the lives of we who live at the wildland urban interface have been transformed by the growing threat of wildfires. It defies logic to legalize outdoor living in areas of extreme fire danger like Moor Creek Canyon, Arana Gulch, and Delaviega Park. Disposing of Santa Cruz's homeless by inviting them to camp in these remote, inhospitable locations away from basic services is a disgrace. Removing unwanted encampments by opening the green belt to so-called overnight camping foolishly sweeps the hot coals of the unsheltered under an open space rug where it's only a matter of time before flames erupt. It's been said that all sides unhappy may be the mark of an equitable solution. In this case, all sides are unhappy because the camping solution's a bad idea that helps no one and endangers many. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Tiffany Worthington, please. Bonnie, did I skip one? No, there we go. Tiffany Worthington, please. Hi, sorry, uh, the, the uh, yeah, it just came up. Thank you so much for hearing me and thanks for tackling this. I'm with Saul and Laura Lee. I'm not with them, but I just heard them speak. And yes, I agree. It's, um, you know, being intimately involved with the wildfires myself, you know, it's profoundly critical to keep camping out of these so-called open spaces. You know, fire hazards are extreme. And I didn't realize, I didn't have an intimate um, experience with homeless and, and drug addicted people until, um, now that I live about 50 feet away from the encampment beach behind Royal Taj. And um, there was a massive explosion which turned into an uncontrolled bonfire the other night. And luckily it didn't catch the nearby trees which hang over our home. Um, but you know, having that fire happen in, our, in Poganip for instance could easily start a series of mega fires. Um, so I definitely discourage that. I think it should be in some big parking lot and managed. I think that'd be easily managed. And then I just have a quick question is what discourages um, out of town homeless people and addicts from coming here to enjoy these, these services um, and just increasing the need? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Next up, I have Mary. Please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, I would propose that Arena Gulch would be an absolute horrible place. I think that they tried this before to have camping. I was actually part of one of the original people who was part of when original um, Arena Gulch was to be put in. And that conversation came up, believe it or not, before they put Arena Gulch in regarding camping. And it was the number one concern of having that, to having that go into that area. And now here we are saying that we're gonna allow camping in Arena Gulch. There's absolutely nowhere to put people. There's, everywhere you go, there's no way that you're not gonna be by the sidewalk. I go through that, I go through there at least three times a day, early morning and evening. It's very busy. There's a lot of children in there. There's no room. And I don't understand how you have homeless people go there when they're all, actually they need to stay exactly where they are right now. And also I would propose that you put them at the parking um, on the parking lot, open up that's where all the facilities are for the homeless. Stop spreading them out. Thank you. Next is Amanda F. Amanda S, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good, okay, sorry. I'm speaking to voice my opposition to the inclusion of the Arana Gulch open space in the list of overnight sleeping areas. Arana Gulch is the heart and soul of the east side. It's a heavily utilized space by families, dogs, cyclists, it's handicap accessible, it's the gateway to the beach. And I wonder if this council doesn't fully grasp the amount of use it gets. This past Saturday from 9.30 to 11.30 in two hours, we counted 255 separate individuals coming to use the open space. Arana Gulch is key. It is key to the quality of life of us, those of us living on the east side of town. This ordinance sacrifices the quality of life and security of the people of the Arana Gulch neighborhood. Please do not take our park from us. 
Thank you very much. Uh, next Thank up is Dave much. Williams. Uh, next... What did you say? David Williams? Hello, um, good evening. My name is David Williams. I'm a resident of the city of Santa Cruz. I share the serious concerns that others have already addressed about the wildfire danger of opening the city's Greenbelt lands, including the Poganip, to temporary outdoor living. There have been several fires in the existing outdoor living communities, including in the Poganip area. Banning open fires will not be sufficient to prevent a totally tragic <clears throat> wildfire since fires occur even when both camping and fires are banned. The city is exposing itself to future liability if it ignores this risk. I'm also concerned about the environmental impact of overnight camping in the Greenbelt lands. The argument in the agenda report that this proposal is CEQA exempt is not compelling, particularly with respect to throwing the Greenbelt lands open to new camping in areas where it has not occurred or been allowed before. If our Greenbelt lands are needed for, as temporary housing, it must be done in a sustainable way that confines the impact to small regions that can most readily be supervised, mitigated, and enforced. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, Bonnie, can you clarify? Did I, I thought Amanda just went right before David, but I just wanna make sure I didn't, I didn't mess up. Amanda F, did you speak before? Regarding around the goal? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Uh, next up is Beth Prentice, please. Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute. Is it working? It is. We can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I live along the levee and I have an encampment um, basically uh, right by my house. And um, I'm calling in support of the ordinance just so that I can start feeling safe again. Uh, you know, all day long there is shouting, um, really obvious drug use and drug sales. I've had people hop the fence and steal things from my yard. I've had someone, a man from the encampment try to enter my home while I was in it. There's so many reasons that I feel unsafe because of the encampment um, and then also the fires that just happened, which I could see from my door. They were very close. So please, um, please continue to consider the residential areas. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, Beth, excuse me. Uh, next person is with phone number ending in 1810. Go ahead, please. Yeah, this is Garrett Phillip. I've always said homeless population density is directly proportional to homeless services. So why thinking adding more services just here is not going to actually increase the homeless counts in Santa Cruz is questionable. Enabling homelessness is a city growth industry or a Santa Cruz city cause for many. The line for free stuff is endless. There should be other lines elsewhere. I join others thinking an open invitation to legal mass occupation of so much vulnerable open space is a mistake. As to tent camps, San Francisco set up six uh, safe sleeping villages where each of 262 campsites costs 5000 a month, totaling $16 million a year, more than it costs for a market rate apartment. Coming with three meals a day, bathroom security, the homeless industrial complex is a very, very happy camper helper bunch. Since tent camps are not reimbursable by the Fed, one wonders what city services they give up in exchange. Maybe they and you should say what those are. Giving the unelected city manager autonomous bureaucracy authority to set up a temporary, whatever that is, homeless camp anywhere, anytime is just one of many concerns. Thanks. Next speaker, please. Ann F., you're our next speaker, please. Um, go ahead and unmute and we'll ready to go. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Ann Simonton and I'm uh, very <clears throat> curious that you haven't really, you're considering this ordinance without, as an idea of where to camp and where are you gonna put these people camping when we have a very good solution that's used in many places around the country, which is called a managed camp. And that means there are guidelines that you are not investigating this and that you haven't really put any time or effort into this. And 
I mean, I know Brent Adams doesn't get 75 grand per year for his storage program, so that you put forward these numbers to frighten people like the last caller who just was saying how prohibitively expensive all this stuff is. There are volunteers in this community. Please consider faith-based groups, nonprofits, private groups, and a managed camp. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 9532. Hi, thank you. My name is Soren Whiting. I'm the Legislative Director for UC Santa Cruz. Now, the Temporary Outdoor Living Ordinance effectively removes compassion from an area of policy decision-making that is in so desperate need of compassionate decision-making. Instead of having TOLO, we should be having discussions around Topa Copa. It really breaks my heart to see the city, which I've spent the last four years of my life, be in the news and the headlines with the title, UC or Santa Cruz trying to regulate homelessness, while at the same time, my hometown Berkeley discussing how they can implement policy like Topa Copa and other initiatives that can actually help people out and prevent situations uh, leading to homelessness. And homelessness. Um, furthermore, you know, UC students are currently receiving around 5% of housing insecurity, which, you know, you know, a big part of our population is being dramatically impacted by this. So I just want to say that, that we are keeping a close eye on this issue, uh, and we want to make sure that, you know, going down the line, that we have compassion in policy making rather than money guiding uh, decision making. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Hilda. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you so much. So to the Santa Cruz community listening to me, the way that the homeless folks were presented to us as a monolith last week was horrific. Painting them as drug-riddled, second-class people who are criminals who dare take out space in our prestigious areas. Like we're gonna ban them from open space and then provide no temporary or even permanent shelter? Are you praying that they like die? Because obviously we're not looking at them or speaking with them even. With no access to libraries or even phones, how are they even able to have access to this meeting that we're talking about their livelihood? I'd like to remind folks that Santa Cruz is the fifth most expensive city to live in the world, according to Business Insider. Every two years, Santa Cruz conducts this county homeless like survey, and I read all 60 pages from 2019, and 75% of the homeless of Santa Cruz aren't outsiders. They've been here for five to 10 years, more. These are your seasonal workers who are doing your actual construction work, and these are your boardwalk people who aren't actually getting hired on these years. You haven't gotten your first or second stimulus because the nation's had a huge influx, and so we're not able to handle it. Really have compassion here and let me know that I voted for a kind and compassionate council member. Thank you. Next up is uh, phone number ending in 2885. Press start. There you go. Hello, this is Marv Lewis, longtime resident of Santa Cruz. This ordinance, should it pass, will likely stand as a challenge to the Eighth Amendment, barring cruel and unusual punishment, as well as an indictment upon the majority, citing a consciousness vacant of compassion. This ordinance does not speak to liberty and justice for all. Rather, the ordinance speaks to an abuse of power within a virtual process that refutes the best interest of this community, both housed and unhoused. Thus, I urge you to refute this ordinance until which time the community-oriented solution, as would be representative of a democracy, may be presented to this council. That concludes my statement. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is uh, phone number ending in 6959. Please go ahead and you can press star six and we can hear you. Phone number ending in 6959. Phone number ending in 6959. Did you want to speak? If you unmute yourself, we're ready to have you speak. Okay, we're going to move on to the next speaker. Elise, you're up next. Oh, looks like you're ready to go. Is that 6959? Or never mind, Bonnie, you must have done that. Next up is Elise. 
Okay, hi. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. I just want to say I agree. Name, name calling shouldn't happen. However, people are very angry, and I'm one of them. And killing people is also unacceptable, very much so, in our country. I believe it's called murder, and that's what this law will be. It is a punitive law. It's a political law. The ultra-conservative ultra council that won on a primary date uh, with big, big, big money and lots of deceptions in the Sentinel is the reason behind this punitive law. I have deeply investigated services in Santa Cruz profoundly for uh, since 2009. There's very few services. Actually, the city is in the business of lying. Susie O'Hara is one of the czars of anti-homeless policies. She regularly tells fibs, and you all do, about your real policy, which is mostly about getting people on buses to go out of town. I'm very concerned about the police being at the center of this ordinance. Uh, Andy Mills has a reputation that goes back decades. He's a promoted Seattle Dying video. Uh, this is illegal. We're going we're gonna to sue, and I hope you all will suffer in your political... Next up is phone number ending in 0861. If, you, if your number ends in 0861, you're ready and we're ready to hear from you. I, uh, I would like to uh, object to this uh, criminalization of the homeless. Um, you're picking on the poorest people in town and I realize that there are some of them that are making messes and stuff around town, but that's a, uh, that's not everybody. That's a small group of people. Um, how would you like it if you had to tear your house down every morning, and then when you came home from work, you had to build it back up again? Um, it's very unreasonable, and I'm sure that all of this is going to end up in the city in another lawsuit, which you're probably going to lose. So why even bother to do this? If, you know, it seems futile. And the fact that you're putting these um, things in there to say, okay, well, this has to happen first before we start it, that's not going to happen. The police will enforce this law as soon as it goes on the books. They're not going to wait for storage places to open up. They're not going to wait for um, somebody to come around and hand a piece of paper to every homeless person. Thank you. Next caller it ends in uh, the last four digits, 9068. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, my name's Christina Koblund. Uh, I'm an, a retired environmental consultant. I specialized in recreating native plant communities, especially in degraded areas. Uh, clients have included municipalities, parks, departments of transportation, airports, power companies, and many other commercial and industrial entities. My particular emphasis has been on preventing erosion and fire, as well as on the protection of watersheds and wildlife habitats. What you are planning to do, in other words, allowing camping within parts of Moore Creek, Pogo Nip, De La Viega, and Arana Gulch will quite simply ruin the native habitat. It will quite simply destabilize the non-native environment. It will also ruin the watershed. It will place these natural areas at high risk of wildfire which, as you know, can jump to residential areas within the city of Santa Cruz. I'd be happy to offer my services pro bono. Thank you very much. Next up is Eric, please. Hello, uh, Mayor Myers. Thank you for taking my call tonight. This is Eric Rodberg. I understand, I understand the many concerns people have with uh, both uh, the public and council and staff uh, with the issues with it being rushed and um, the potential amendments. I would urge you to pass it tonight on a second reading so that you um, 
with a few amendments as possible so you can pass it on a second reading. You'll have plenty of chance to amend it before it actually can be enforced because of all the triggers and the thresholds before it will be enforced. And I think this has been in the making for so long. It's extremely important that we get something on the books tonight. And um, that thank you and uh, thanks for all your hard work and staff's, all staff's hard work. Thank you. Next up is Chloe Hoax. Go ahead, Chloe. Press star six to unmute yourself. Chloe, can Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Chloe and I strongly oppose this ordinance. I'm an environmental scientist with a background in water quality and I'm well aware of human impacts on waterways, but the city's concern for the environment is completely disingenuous. You all admitted this isn't going to help homelessness. It's just a first step, but aren't there other first steps we could be taking? Like waste management, portable hygiene facilities, basic survival resources, or how about funding mutual aid groups that are actually keeping the unhoused community fed and closed? Why not invest more there first? You're more concerned with protecting the environment from the houseless than you are from protecting the houseless from the environment. Somebody said this last week, but you can't compare unhoused folks' need to survive with housed wealthy folks' need to not to be close to poor people. Your outreach is a vague afterthought, and Chief Mills, with all due respect, how dare you say there's any compassion in your criminalization of homelessness? This ordinance is a performative attempt to sweep optics of poverty out of the public eye with no genuine attempt to address the underlying issue. Vote no, defund the police. Thank you. Next up is caller with the phone number ending in 7409. Hi, I am speaking on behalf of Arana Gulch neighborhood, and I'm wondering if you guys have consulted with the Coastal Commission. Um, the city of Santa Cruz invested an enormous amount of time and money into developing the open space in Arana Gulch for the purpose of protecting the tar plant by also creating a space for an entire community. Um, allowing the homeless to camp in Rana Gulch would inflict an exorbitant amount of damage to the endangered species, habitat, and coastal area. Implementation of the Rana Gulch master plan required the city to obtain a coastal development permit from the Coastal Commission because the planning area lies within the designated coastal zone. The coastal development permit includes both standard and special conditions, and the Rana Gulch Habitat Management Plan was developed to satisfy the special conditions of the coastal development permit. Rana Gulch is an area that's been protected for the endangered habitat. In addition, the majority of the area lies within the designated coastal zone. And per the habitat management plan, by allowing homeless to camp in this area would be in violation of those regulations. Thank you. Next up Thank is you. Seth. Go ahead. You're unmuted. Hi there. Sorry about that. I um, I'm a resident of Santa Cruz of 10 years. Um, one thing I'd like to bring to the conversation is why the city hasn't implemented a point in time survey um, in the houseless community and aren't doing their due diligence before implementing this ordinance and even having an understanding of what the homeless population is currently at in Santa Cruz County with all of the additional houseless people from the pandemic. Thank you for your comments. Next up is caller with the number one. You press star six. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I agree with Chloe Hook. And um, basically, we're having a hard. Can you move a little closer to your speaker? We're having a little hard time hearing you. Yeah, um, I very much agree with Chloe Hook. And in listen, I'm listening to 
what's going on in um, the administration and the police and talking about homelessness. And it seems to me that they're, you know, they're coming up with these kind of systematic ways to deal with homelessness um, on an ordinance level, and it's very bureaucratic. Um, and they're dealing with the fact that there's large encampments in San Lorenzo Park and um, up in uh, Harvey West Park, and so they're targeting those areas. It's really clear to me that that's what they're doing. They're not saying that, but that's what they're doing. And so my question to you is, I, I'm trying not to come off as um, conf um, confrontational or oppositional here, but um, I feel that, first of all, you have to adapt to some kind of a mood of tolerance because tolerance is what it needs to, sorry. What's Thank going on? Are you cutting me off? Yeah, every, I'm giving everybody a minute and I didn't even say it. trying to get as many people in as possible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is Toby. You should never, never call someone a racist. I've been an out lesbian for 34 years. Okay? Bonnie. Don't, don't call me a racist. Bonnie, why don't you just mute this? Next up is Vinny. Vinny, you're ready to go. You can unmute. There have already been five fires this past year from illegal camping in Arana Gulch. Per Chief Andy Mills, with only four to five hours of officers to shift, there's not enough police funding to secure the Arana Gulch neighborhoods after budget cuts. There will be no nighttime security and neither packing up every morning nor Lee's proposed bedtime for the homeless is enforceable. This kind of a housing project is not, it's such a high density neighborhood with constant security. It's irresponsible, it shows a complete lack of concern for Santa Cruz city residents. This is a flagrant misuse of significant funds to only appear to address a growing mental health and economic crisis on our streets. We've all seen what happens when the county embarks on these band-aid projects and their attempt to only address the symptoms of a bigger problem while ignoring, ignoring the real issue. We've also seen what happens to the scarred environment in neighborhoods after the negative impacts of these housing projects are irrevocably left in these areas before being relocated to another area. If this measure is allowed to pass, we're going to see the same things happen to Arana Gulch De La Viega, Poganip, and Moore Creek. Rana Gulch is the, most, is the most frequented area in the heart of Midtown. If this is allowed to pass, Santa Cruz as a whole will never be the same again. Thank you. Uh, next up is Devin. Okay. Hello? Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Devin and I'm reading this statement on behalf of the Santa Cruz chapter of Signs for the People. Uh, we oppose this ordinance on the grounds that it is morally bankrupt, logistically untenable, likely illegal, and altogether antithetical to the health of our community. We must view the problems faced by our community in the context of the material conditions which give rise to them. The 2019 Santa Cruz County Homeless Census found that of the 2,000 unhoused people in our county, a vast majority are previous residents who became homeless due to domestic abuse, divorce, or separation, the loss of a job, an eviction, or a rent increase. And of those who are able to work, over 90% are either doing so or are currently looking. The facts tell us this. The unhoused community is populated largely by the working class of Santa Cruz, our struggling neighbors whose lives will be made needlessly more complicated by this ordinance. We must address the assertions made by this ordinance holistically. Claims such as irreparable environmental degradation are unfounded at best, though often the result of inadequate city services. Other cities have demonstrated that robust community organizing paired with sufficient social services is not only more impactful and cost effective at addressing the problems at hand, but it's also the responsibility of governance. We call upon the council to do the right thing and vote now. This is the Santa Cruz chapter of Science for the People. Thank you. Very much. Next up is Maria Solis Kennedy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Hi, I just wanted to um, encourage the city council to vote against this ordinance. I'm super confused after tuning in last week how um, it managed to get even worse and exclude people from basically every corner of the city. Um, I agree with a caller earlier that said that this is tantamount to trying to kill people. Um, I think that this would do nothing but bring harm. If you're looking for more money to um, fund actual solutions for ending houselessness, then I suggest the, um, taking money out of the police budget, which is overblown, and there's a lot of public support behind that. So please listen to your constituents and vote no against this. Thank you. Next up is Anastasia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm here today because I value compassion for all and I wanna see it reflected in the systems that surround me and the place that I live. The issue of homelessness is of course an undeniable one in Santa Cruz. Those who are unsheltered often have big physical and mental health needs for obvious reasons. And our city and county don't have the capacity to meet those needs right now. I believe that the funding, time and energy needed to effectively support this population and the surrounding community is being wasted to double down on things that have never worked. Writing citations to the already impoverished, forcing those who live on the streets to constantly relocate, taking away places of respite and shoving aside those who need help. None of these things have thus far made an impact on the problems caused by homelessness in Santa Cruz. I address any change makers on this council, please reconsider this ordinance and instead prioritize working with the diverse community and local organizations you represent to create effective spaces of support and compassion for those who need it the most. Thank you. Next up is Derek. Go ahead, Garrett, unmute yourself, star six. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, um, what I want to throw out is a possible amendment if this is gonna pass, and that amendment would be rather to stop uh, the picking and choosing certain areas and asking yourself sort of where people end up manifesting where they camp anyway. Uh, instead of spreading them out into the open spaces, if you had the camping ban just be eight through eight, um, then basically you'd be outlawing all encampments in the city. And that's a pretty huge move and it's really, really hard for people to pack up their stuff every day. So that's a big move and considering that amendment, consider that it wouldn't push people out into the brush areas. They'd stay virtually where they were, but they would give the police officers something to enforce in some way, sorry. Uh, so basically that as an amendment, I don't think it would leave any encampments. It would be a really strong anti-homeless move, which the TOLO already is, and it would outlaw encampments. And then we have mutual aid groups have to step up and help people set their stuff up. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 6074. Hello. Hello, my name is Grace Castile and I'm an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz as well as a legislative advocate at the UC. The temporary outdoor living ordinance, ordinance effectively removes compassion from an area of policy decision making that is most in need of compassionate decision making. While well, amidst a pandemic and long lasting housing crisis, the city has proposed increasing punitive measures against a large population of our city who have been displaced and disproportionately affected. The city has yet to acknowledge the true measures that they need to take to truly combat houselessness and make living affordable. We urge the city council to take compassionate action rather than punitive measures to provide relief to those in most desperate situations and urge you to see homeless people as important legitimate members of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Kiki Ong. You're welcome to unmute. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Kiki and I strongly oppose this ordinance. Um, I, the proposed costs from outlined today by Lee are only 3% of the total of Santa Cruz's police budget, which would be much better allocated to 
a um, managed camp facility, and this would actually provide real uh, resources and solutions to the houseless community instead of continuing to criminalize them and create more harm to one of the most vulnerable communities. So um, I think that I urge council to um, vote no on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Yes, thank you. Um, I was appointed to catch and served on the safe sleeping subcommittee. Uh, we work from us to try to come up with solutions the city could use to improve or mitigate the negative effects of unsheltered homelessness. And while I appreciate the city's effort to attempt to tackle this complex issue, uh, the approach taken with this ordinance is not helpful and frankly counterproductive. Uh, not only do I believe this ordinance is unconstitutional and will open the city to further civil liability, but it will not be effective in managing camping in a meaningful way. Uh, people will be forced to break the law to meet their needs. There will be so many violations of, a, of this ordinance that it will be impossible to enforce fairly and consistently, resulting in more litter, more human waste, since there will be no organized trash and toilet service for dispersed camping, increased burdens on people sleeping outside uh, through the particularly counterproductive misdemeanor arrests that are included in this ordinance, and uh, resulting in making it even harder for folks to access medical and social services harder to obtain housing and harder to keep people uh, and uh, result in keeping people unhoused. I think we need to focus on solutions to get people out of homelessness, uh, not policies like this one that perpetuate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 0249. Thank you for all your work on this challenging issue. This is Carol Polhamus. I was very encouraged this morning to see that the Board of Supervisors passed their proposal to provide more shelter options in county districts. Since the county receives the funding for homelessness, mental health, and substance abuse treatment, I believe that the city should begin to shift its focus to reliance on the county for these services and to work closely with the county to locate managed transitional camps with services on county property. I um, also encourage you to pass this ordinance with modifications. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Abby Young. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yes, my name is, my name is Abby Young, a 20-year resident of Prospect Heights and co-founder of Firewise Communities in the city of Santa Cruz. I cannot support this ordinance as written, especially because of the provision to prohibit camping and require storage of belongings between the hours 7 a.m. and one hour before sunset. This will criminalize the unsheltered with an ordinance that's inhumane and punitive, unenforceable and ill-timed, especially given that the Board of Supervisors passed their resolution this morning for Housing and Health Division to work immediately with the city to create stable, healthy, safe places to live, and a mission which was endorsed by the mayor and vice mayor in their letter to the board yesterday. I strongly urge the city council hold off on passing this ordinance till the county's housing for health division's first priority of exploring city county partnerships has been explored and their first report has been written. Also as Firewise leader, the allowance of camping in open spaces of Moore Creek, Poganip, and Aranda Gulch would greatly endanger the neighborhoods above the gulches I predict this will only by desperate people who need community and services to survive. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next up is Brenna Mockler. Hi. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that I've just been really disappointed about how much so many people have been referring to the houseless people. They are part of our community. They are residents. They are neighbors. Um, and many people calling in support of this measure, asking for it to be expanded, are talking about them as though they are pests that should be gotten rid of, um, which is just really disgusting. Um, obviously, Santa Cruz has a very high rate of homelessness, um, of community members experiencing homelessness, but this proposal, as council members have stated, isn't fixing the problem, it's just trying to make it less visible to the wealthier and luckier members of this community. Um, it's clear that many people are much more concerned about the small nature spaces within a city that's surrounded by protected nature than they are about the well-being of the most vulnerable members of our community. And I'm embarrassed to live in a city that would put forward such a heartless and clearly NIMBY-motivated ordinance that makes it harder for those most vulnerable members of our community to sleep and to stay safe during the cold. 
Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 8002. Hi, my name is Rebecca Lundberg. I'd just like to say that I think you'll be making a huge mistake if you try to allow homeless camping in Arana Gulch. It is in the coastal zone. I believe you would be breaking the law if you allowed that. We still have po huge pockets of trash, garbage, chopped bikes, stoves, um, gas cans, um, mattresses, in the creek and in the waterways, please, please, please do not allow this camping to go on. It's a fire hazard. The vandalism that took place in our neighborhood, I live right across the street from the entrance to the park, was untenable. Cars vandalized, homes broken into. It's not okay. We're upset and you're making a big mistake. Please do not allow camping in this space as well as I'm pretty sure it's illegal. Talk to the Coastal Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 7044. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Melissa Freebaron, and I'm calling right now to advocate for the neighbors surrounding San Lorenzo Park. Um, it's very clear what's been happening. We have a serious meth and heroin problem in our community that is not being addressed. And what happens in these unmanaged encampments is it brings a drug territory issue to our local park. It brings fires, it brings trash, we have removed, along with volunteers and city workers, over 11,000 debris, pounds of debris, just from under the Soquel Bridge. It is unacceptable to think that people can camp in our open spaces. Moore Creek, Pogo Nip, Arana Gulch, these are all areas that people, the residents, locals, have been doing cleanup for over the past 10 years. You need to amend this ordinance and you need to support managed encampments with services, connection to providers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Hiram MC. Hi, can you hear me? You're a little bit light, um, but yeah, please go ahead. Maybe move a little closer to your everything sound okay now that sounds great thank you okay i don't think that fires or needles or trash or noise are going to be solved by deferment to the county or more police action i don't think that you can address symptoms only i don't think looking over the fence and listening to talk show radio is also research and transparent measures are not only morally, but scientifically and factually bankrupt. I don't want to have to keep spinning my wheels because people get spooked by some shallow, hard on crime 90s puppet show constantly masquerading homeless people in front of them to legitimize the salaries of the council and the cops. Over half of Santa Cruz City's council, sorry, budget goes towards the police and most of the stuff they deal with is the unhoused population. I also want to know why they're actually harassing the volunteers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is Edward Estrada. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Uh, you're a little bit light, if you could. Oh, hit. hello. There you go, that's better. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Edward Estrada. I'm the president of College Dems, College Democrats at UCSC. Uh, I don't think more regulations on homeless people and criminalizing homelessness is a solution to our current homelessness and housing crisis. I know this issue is very complex, but this is a step backwards. Many of us are only a couple paychecks away from homelessness in, th in this county with its extreme housing costs. They're residents too, and they're a part of our community. This ordinance does not fix homelessness. It only pushes the homeless population out of sight and out of mind while criminalizing their existence and survival. 
we should be moving our homeless population into homes, providing them with mental health and drug services, and not increasing uh, criminalization. Housing is a human right. Thank you. Thank you. Stacey Falls, you're next. It's actually my husband who wants to talk. Okay. Okay. Turn that off. Sorry, we're on two devices over here. <laughs> um, I articulated my concern two weeks ago, and my concern has not changed. I feel like this ordinance is completely untenable because you know, you're you're restricting all these different places and the places might change depending on the season, whether the a lonely tiger beetle is mating or not. And and I just don't think there's any way to uh, adequately enforce it in any kind of fair manner. The the problems with homelessness are just gonna become worse if people get pushed around and lose their stability. And, and any problem that anybody has with the encampments is just gonna be exacerbated by not providing a place to rebuild their lives, store their materials, get a good night's sleep, and take care of themselves, and criminalizing people. Thank you, sorry, Casey, there. Um, next is phone number ending in 2554. press star six, you could unmute. For phone number ending in 2554. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. All right, hi. My name is John McKelvey. I'd first like to thank the city, the council and city staff for trying to balance the interests of our entire community. I support approval of the outdoor living ordinance, but if managed encampments are necessary, for accommodating families who have recently lost their homes. They should serve as triage facilities and a starting point for houseless individuals and families to escape homelessness altogether. We should not satisfy ourselves with creating favelas as new neighborhoods in the community. And accordingly, I don't believe we should allow ourselves to see such facilities as permanent or even semi-permanent end states for people experiencing homelessness. We need to do better for the most vulnerable in our community. Having said that, the inclusion of open spaces like Aranya Gulch, Tel Aviga Park, and Moore Creek within the definition of places where outdoor living will be allowed is problematic. The topography, combustible vegetation, general inaccessibility, and environmental concerns in these areas make them unsuitable for outdoor living. We should instead be focused on limiting managed encampments to the underutilized, easily accessed, safe, and easily maintained locations not otherwise accessible to the public, whether located on public or private property. Thank you very much. Thanks. Up is Sabina Holver. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Hi, my name is Sabina. I wanna give a shout out to my children who are still up at 9 p.m. because we're all listening to the city council meeting together. They understand that criminalizing houseless people is not going to help any issues that are going on here. I would really love the city council to comment on exactly what this ordinance is fixing also, this is clearly a huge, huge lawsuit that is about to hit. The ACLU is definitely interested, as are other groups. So how are you gonna pay for this lawsuit? You're giving all the money to Chief Andy Mills, who is salivating at the thought of OT for all of his officers who are just gonna tell people to keep moving along, which is what they're doing right now. So I'm not sure how this is going to work. Also, these comments are overwhelmingly against the ordinance. So I'd really like a comment on that from the city council as well, besides that homeless people are just icky or something like that, because that's all that I hear from you now. Anyways, I need to put my kids to bed. You should really start these meetings earlier so you can get more public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Adam Novak. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, hi. This ordinance is an attempt to make homeless people disappear by moving them around really fast. 
Now, this is a strategy that I would be disappointed to see employed by a baby, let alone by elected officials. It suggests that the drafters don't have a strong grasp of object permanence, let alone empathy for the people being regulated here. It's just a mean policy. Nobody benefits from making people set up and break down camp every day. That's two hours off your day. That's a significant reduction in quality of life for what's supposed to be a quality of life ordinance. And it would cost every houseless person in the city something like $10,950 every year in city-compelled unpaid labor at the generally accepted minimum ethical wage. I mean, look at this great new program to help the homeless by giving them negative $11,000, said no one ever. Like, this is not a good idea. Please reject the ordinance. Next up is a uh, caller with the last four digits, 4343. Press star six, we can hear you. Press star six, we, we could hear you just a second ago. If you press star six on your phone, you should come through. The last four digits, four three four three. We can't hear you. Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, Tiffany Worthington, I believe you've spoken already. Is that correct? Bonnie, are we? Hi, it just takes a second for it to unmute, to offer the unmute. No, I, I really, I have, and I just simply wanted to say, I just apologize for all of the, um, the, um, the kind of the hate and anger that's coming towards you. And I just want to really appreciate you guys for taking on the service of being on our city council. That's really all I wanted to say. It, it hurts my heart to hear how uh, harsh people are being towards you all. So thank you for taking this on. Thank that's you. all. Thank you. Next up is uh, phone number ending in 9820. Hello, this is yes. Stephen Lang and I oppose the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Phone number ending in 5383. Uh, hi, council members. Could you come back to me, please? Could you come back? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, next up is phone number ending in 0845. Hello. Um, this ordinance is a very bad idea. Criminalizing poverty does not make it go away. We give you our tax money to help the less fortunate not to pay for more police and jails. And judges are intelligent and we'll be able to see through the attempt to um, circumvent previous rulings. The second point I wanted to make is that it was wrong for the mayor to censor the commenter who played her own words back to her. It sounded like Mayor Myers was embarrassed by her previous outburst. It would be appropriate, and I encourage her, to initiate a reparations reconciliation process if she's embarrassed, as she ought to be. I, I, I believe that Mayor Myers knows that we are all racist, and our identities does not exempt us in our behaviors. We have to be honorable, and we have to be honorable toward those less fortunate to us and those who are poorer than we. Thank you. Next caller is ending in numbers 5383. Hi, 
council members. Um, this is Skirt Vonnegut. Again, I'm calling um, to say that I oppose this ordinance. Um, I oppose it um, mostly as a, a taxpayer and as someone who looks critically at city budgets. Um, I believe the overtime required for our officers to enforce this uh, ordinance should it pass um, given the number of homeless people that we likely have in the city um, and likely ability for everyone to comply perfectly 100% of the time, um, I do think this will cost our city a, uh, quite, a bit of, quite a bit of money and um, I don't feel comfortable with that on top of a lot of other things that I don't feel comfortable with about this um, ordinance. And I just wanna say, uh, you know, I played for you know, Derby for this community for five years. I love Santa Cruz. I'm very, very proud to be. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is up is Ty, Tyree Ritchie, please. Star six unmute. You're we're ready to go. Tyree Ritchie. Okay, go ahead. We should be able to hear you. We can't hear you, um, Tyree Ritchie. Um, you look to be unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Okay, we'll we'll try to come back to you. Bonnie, can you keep track of that? I've got the name written down too. Next okay. up is Talia Barrow. Hi, um, I oppose this ordinance because as we are all aware, it was not written to support the basic needs or well-being of the unhoused population. And I don't think it was even written for the wealthy residents of Santa Cruz who don't want to have to look at dirty poor people in their neighborhoods because so many of them are calling in to complain about the few areas where camping would still be allowed. This ordinance is only concerned with the aesthetics of the city and its goddamn tourist industry, and it's obvious. Your greed and lack of humanity are disgusting you're not fooling anybody with this. You need to be investing in actual services for unhoused people if you want to claim to be addressing the issues. Stop making excuses by deferring to the county. If it's the county's job, then you should stay out of it because you clearly don't know what you're doing. Vote no on the ordinance, defund the police, and quit your fucking job. Thank you. Next is Brent Adams. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Brent. Hi. Uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, kind of remind us about what has been happening in the previous years. For instance, the um, uh, interim uh, shelter um, idea where the city had identified five different locations, put that up on a map, and then there were resistance movements, didn't move forward, transitional encampments. Uh, you put a map up there, the city manager did, and then resistance movement put a kibosh on it. Parking lot 27, safe parking lot, put a map up. Resistance movement's not gonna happen, all non-starters. Here we are, put a map. Of course, you're never gonna put camps in these open space areas. This is uh, really just um, a dry run fiasco. The city manager knows this is a non-starter. This is a, uh, a fool's errand and you're just running us around. And we, I kind of wonder, wonder where we're really headed. Of course, we need transitional cabinets. We need a full array of shelters in this community. We need an authentic uh, program from the city manager's office. And I'm really wondering, uh, you know, what's behind all this? It's just it, it seems, uh, foolish. Thank you. Thank you. Terry? Go ahead and press star six and you should be able to speak. 
I was wondering if any of you have read the letters from the DSA, this, I mean, not DSA, sorry, uh, DRC, Disability Rights of California. Um, they sent a four-page letter about how, this, how they oppose this ordinance, um, as well as the ACLU sent a letter. Um, so I'll just read until I get cut off from the disability rights the a few things that it says in their letter is that the proposed ordinance um, contains two provisions that expressly address unhoused people with disabilities both of which will result in unlawful discrimination on the basis of disability um, it also acknowledges that people with certain disabilities may be unable to relocate their campsite every day. The provision gives them 96 hours to relocate, ignoring the reality that moving every four days remains burdensome for anyone, particularly people with disabilities. Additionally, in order to receive the extra time to relocate, an individual with a disability may be asked to provide verification of the disability. Thank you. Next up is Jordan Berger. Press stars, we're ready for you. Hi, I just wanted to state that I oppose this ordinance because I believe that it is unlawful and unethical to make people move that much. I also think that it isn't actually going to do anything productive for the issue. There are not the facilities in place to make this happen. Making people move their stuff without having places for them to go during the day is just going to create more issues with the police and making giving police more power to enforce this. I think it's very violent. I think that it's a horrible idea, and I heavily oppose this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Hector Mar Marin. Uh, you're a little bit muted. I, we can't quite hear you. I don't know if you can move closer to your speaker. What's that? Uh, can you repeat that again? That's great. All good? Yep. Okay, yeah. So um, I just wanted to uh, quickly say that, you know, when it comes to the, you know, temporary outside living ordinance, that we should oppose it because there are no alternative solutions that are being offered for houseless folks, and it's imperative for y'all as public, uh, you know, public officials to represent the needs of the community. Right, because like what's going on, especially you know during these times, we're in, in the middle of a pandemic. There is no support being you know provided for these folks, and it's really dehumanizing to impose this ordinance, which is which really represents the real estate and the elitist endeavors of the city of Santa Cruz. Right, so I you know I the community the community is coming forth to engage with y'all to um, oppose this ordinance because it's morally wrong. There are no solutions being posed. And on top of all this, y'all can be voted out just as much um, if y'all don't uh, represent the community in that same regard. Um, but yeah, that's my message. And, you know, follow what the community says. And this is what the community is um, enforcing y'all to do. Um, but yeah. Thank Power you. to the people. Martin Genova is next. I urge the council to vote no against this ordinance because I see it as a wasteful step to solve homelessness. It makes no sense to me to see the city face the potential for lawsuits and the continual use of police time and money to issue useless citations if this ordinance is passed. To imagine that homeless people will have to tear down their houses every day with a cop over their shoulder is unacceptable to me. And seeing that there have not been comprehensive outreach to nonprofits, faith-based groups, and mutual aid organizations to work towards a cost-effective and manage open space camp makes me urge the council to do more research towards this option. I see this as a much more appealing and cost-effective option compared to the cost of paying the police overtime to enforce this ordinance. Again, I urge council to vote no against this ordinance, defund the police, fund effective social services, and I'm finished with my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller is line 226. Hi, this is Candace Elliott, and I just wanted to thank you all for 
the work that you're doing tonight on this issue. Um, and after having listened to everyone and everyone's concerns, I think this is still an important piece to move forward with in recognition that it is a part of a tapestry of work that is being done locally on the issue from nonprofit organizations and the county and the city with federal and state and all these different funding sources. Um, and so thank you for the work you're doing tonight. Thank you. Next up is Steve Schnarr. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> it, this, this policy seems like a foolish attempt to make people to, um, sorry. I understand that, that like we, there's a lot of problems that people have with the camp, big camp in the middle of downtown, but um, people are gonna sleep somewhere and pushing them to the remote areas of our open spaces without trash service, without bathrooms, um, it's only gonna make the problems worse. So if we wanna actually reduce these negative impacts that people are worried about, we should be investing in designated camps where there are bathrooms, where there's trash, uh, where people can get transit. Otherwise, we're wasting everybody's time and, <clears throat> and risking future lawsuits. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 2760. 2760, you're up. Hello, my name is Isabel Salazar, and I am one of UC Santa Cruz's legislative advocates, and I strongly object to this ordinance. The ordinance is trying to break up encampments, yet does not address the core reasons of why so many people in Santa Cruz are experiencing houselessness or even offer short-term solutions of shelter. It is disheartening and disturbing that the ordinance involving extreme policy changes was co-written by the police department who is going to be offered overtime pay to enforce this initiative. I strongly urge city council members to not pass this ordinance as it will cause more problems and pain. People need approaches of care and support not policing as this ordinance very much does. I hear a lot of people on the call talk about their safety with encampments nearby, but what about the safety of having to live on the street? Criminalizing houseless populations does not fix the surface level problems that people are listing here like fires, needles, and noise. It just moves them away from their view. There is strong city opposition for this ordinance, and I really hope that the city council will keep that in mind when voting. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna have um, Tyree Ritchie come back up. I committed to having you come back up when we see you are online, so please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much for your time. Um, my personal experience with this uh, outdoor living ordinance issue is my uh, personal experience of homelessness in the city of Santa Cruz in 2008, uh, long before you guys uh, spent $3 million on creating Tent City I was living in that homeless facility that's located on River Street, uh, going to school every day to Mission Hill Middle School from seventh grade to eighth grade. And a lot of the stereotypes and a lot of the, the uh, rhetoric that I'm hearing towards homelessness about theft and drugs and uh, many bad rhetoric that I hear about the homelessness, I've heard from students that I was classics with. And many of those rhetoric I knew was from the parents and a lot of the older adults who are in charge of the city and a lot of them carried that rhetoric to their children and it made me more shameful to be homeless and the community that didn't really have careness towards homeless and it made me more of an introvert and um a lot of these issues uh, affected a lot of my mental health issues uh dealing with depression of trying to figure out where where i'm going to live where my next meal is going to be and i just hope that you guys have that empathy when you vote on this bill thank you very much also want to, um, Bonnie, advance uh, phone number 4343. They, I think, couldn't get through last time either. You see them? 244343, right below Nancy Cruz. Um, 
The number that couldn't get through initially was 5383, but we did get to it. Oh, it was 5383 that we didn't get to. Yeah. And we did, we did get to it. Oh, we did get to it. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, sorry, uh, Sabrina Lopez, you're next. Hi. Um, I would simply like to reiterate what so many have said here today, that the ordinance is can you hear me? Yes, we can. Did you hear all of that? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. So uh, the ordinance is inhumane as criminalizing poverty is un an unintelligent solution to getting people housed. At the end of the day, it's clear that the motivation behind this ordinance is to simply get these people out of your backyard. And if I can't change your mind on your motivation, at least I can encourage you to use more intelligent and innovative problem-solving skills. Perhaps some that don't perpetuate criminalizing minorities and poor people. Perhaps my tax dollars and the tax dollars of your constituents could be put to better use by utilizing actual problem-solving skills. Your staff repeatedly acknowledge that this is not a long-term solution. So why would any of you vote yes? Mind-boggling. But the fact of the matter is we know that you are going to vote yes because that's what the city does. It aims for short-term solutions, prioritizing aesthetic and tourist income over human needs. Thank you. Next up is number ending in 7149. And then I just want everybody to know the last caller that we'll take is with the first number ending in 8877. I believe that will take us to 945. Go ahead. Seven Good evening, nine. thank you for your time. My name is Jace Ritchie and I strongly oppose TOLO and in this moment, honestly, my heart breaks. When we talk about marginalized people and marginalization, this policy is literally what pushes the most vulnerable among us to the farthest, most remote corners of the city away from critical resources and into our green belts. I hear deep pain in our community though and the city leadership seems eager to brush off our pleas for compassion. I wanna take a moment to speak to those still fighting for human rights in our community. There is still compassion in our community even if we do not see it from this council. There is still compassion even as members of this council spend vapid words lamenting hurt feelings or sue the California Department of Public Health as they vote to eradicate poor people but not poverty from our community. There is still compassion despite this punitive police heavy ordinance and we will continue to fight for a just, safe, compassionate Santa Cruz until the day we meet our maker. Until then, I pray for guidance for city leadership and I persist with peers in the name of justice. Thank you. Next up is 4931. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Hey, I'm Rachel Chavez, Lower Ocean resident and nurse. I live near and walk alone through encampments regularly and without any problems. I am begging you to not pass this ordinance. Even those that are in favor of camping restrictions can see what a disaster that it would be to push people away from services and further into neighborhoods and open spaces. This ordinance, this ordinance lacks humanity, it lacks logic, and it laughs in the face of evidence-based practice. It's shameful that so many of the council members who recently ran on platforms of compassion, equity, and health in all policies support this ordinance that ignores the wealth of research that proves that anti-homeless laws are expensive, ineffective, and traumatizing for the unhoused. So the time and effort that went into this hateful and senseless ordinance is a disgusting misuse of city funds that could have been spent writing grants and setting up services instead of scheming how to give SCPD even more money to terrorize homeless people. There's no evidence that having more services brings more homeless people to town. It actually contradicts the point in time count as well as other research done on hopelessness. It's disgusting that the city promotes this myth and other dehumanizing anti-homeless rhetoric while hiding behind people's first language. Tells us that you know better, but you don't care. Thank you. Yasmin Miha is up. I'm hearing you fight. Yeah, I think we, okay, go ahead, Nancy Caruso. Am I on now? 
Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think what we've heard tonight shows this ordinance is tearing our city apart. And we've also heard there's no right place. As you know, we have successful encampment models as an alternative to unmanaged camps or overmanaged costly ones. We have models for managed communities that have positive results and they're not managed by police. So instead of instituting another punishing policing regime, which will ruin lives and risk the health of hundreds of people, vote no on this ordinance and bring us ideas that have the potential to succeed, not rip us apart, to heal, not harm us, and to save lives. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Nadia Peralta. Good evening. Um, I, so many wonderful things have been said. I hope that the city council tonight can hear that and let it in through uh, the very human hearts that we know you have, um, despite the inhumanity of the temporary outdoor living ordinance. Um, I think that one of the most uh, things that stick out to me the most is how this ordinance is just so emblematic of everything that so many people are ready to leave behind. And that is, while so many people tonight are telling you that there is a desire to embrace actual um, compassionate solutions for houselessness, um, I personally am a resident of Santa Cruz and have been for a long time, and I talk to my houseless neighbors on a regular basis, ask them what they need, and bring them things as much as I can. Um, I feel like there's so much you get to learn from people just from talking to them. And I think that there's so much laughing here. It's so disgusting. And I know you can do better. And we will vote you out if you do not. Hello? Go ahead. Hi. Um, I am voicing my opinion as a mother, a taxpayer, and I work as a paralegal in this county. Um, I, I understand the law. I, I understand people's concerns. I also have been an unhoused person um, on two occasions. Once before I was a mother and, and once as I, as I had become a parent. Um, neither of those occasions were because I wanted to be an unhoused person. Uh, I would assume that that most unhoused folks in our community didn't make the choice to to live as unhoused people. Uh, no one wants to be unhoused here. But as a person and a taxpayer and, and, and a member of our community, I have to say it's absurd that we should expect our unhoused community to, to set up camp and then, and then pick up their lives and move. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 1158. Thanks for, thank you for taking my call. I want to point out that we're living in a county where the median house, even in city where the median listing price is over a million dollars. It feels selfish and irresponsible to separate yourself from the rest of the community. And I urge you to vote down this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 2033. Your phone number ends in 2033. You can unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, hi, uh, my name is Britton Fitzmorris. I am the, uh, the grandson of former 
Mayor Tim Fitzmaurice of the Green Party, and I strongly oppose this measure. I think it's very performative neoliberal bull crap, and it's harsh, confusing, punitive. Please vote no. The recent fires have added many new houseless people. It's an immoral classist ordinance during a pandemic against CDC guidelines. It uses weird, uh, faulty environmental tactics. Instead, you should build affordable housing, not development uh, for for uh, you know like whatever weird things that you guys are building in town that we don't want um, like resorts and stuff uh, defund the police reallocate services to mental health services um, and be um, be an ideal city uh, instead of one that uh, takes punitive measures towards houseless people thank you you, uh, do, you will suffer legal suffocation if you pass this ordinance as well so take that into consideration thank you Jennifer, you're next. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Burnow, and I strongly oppose this ordinance. I uh, I've been living here for 16 years in Santa Cruz. I'm a mama. I have an eight eight year old daughter, and she cares so much, our family cares so much about people as humans, and it breaks my heart when I have to explain to her that we live in a city that wants to pass an ordinance that will move people experiencing houselessness around so heartlessly. We regularly visit people living on the street sharing basic needs, items, food, warmth, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I want her to grow up seeing people as human, and I, it just, it makes me so sad that we would that you would consider passing this. Banning people from seeking shelter will not magically disappear houselessness. I urge you, please, please, please reconsider passing this ordinance and instead find compassionate solutions because they are out there. And we have a whole community of people who want to help to find ways. Thank you. Number 8877. Last four digits. Your number ends in 8877. You're ready to ready to go. You can press star six. You can unmute yourself. Hello. 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 Here. Here. Talk. Yeah. Yeah. I am going to continue reading the letter from the law firm Disability Rights of California. Okay, now do it. Okay, the letter says, uh, additionally, in order to receive the extra time to relocate, the individual with a disability may be asked to provide verification of their disability from a physician. This requirement creates an unnecessary barrier as unhoused individuals rarely have regular access to a physician who can provide such a letter. This is especially true during the pandemic when most medical providers operate through a telehealth model. Even when an individual is able to get health care services, the transitory nature of homelessness, including the threat of encampment sweeps, often results in the individual losing important documents like ID cards and medical records. The, sh the city should not require anyone, particularly a person with a disability, to change where they live on a regular basis. The other provision addressing people with disabilities is 6.36.060G, which states that a campsite shall be no larger than 12 feet by 12 feet per occupant. Okay, we've got, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and allow Saxon, um, phone number 4937 and phone number 1150 and that'll be it. Go ahead, Saxon. Hello, uh, my name is Saxon Stahl. I um, 
am a student at UC Santa Cruz, and I strongly oppose this ordinance. Um, all I ask uh, for the council to reflect on this ordinance is the concept of intersectionality uh, created by Kimberly Crenshaw, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. By its very definition, intersectionality is reflected on the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. This, by its very definition, in the ordinance of, of discriminating against socioeconomic status of the lower class is non-intersectional and goes against what half of this council has promised uh, to bring equity to the city of Santa Cruz. So with that, it is best to read Hi, um, I want to st speak strongly against this ordinance. Um, the lives of our neighbors are far more important than, quote, unsightly tents. The city has relentlessly pushed people into corners so that they are out, and out of sight and out of mind of tourists, and this does nothing but make life harder on the people who already have it hardest, and people, many people already have to walk miles to go to their night jobs and to get water and to get food and pushing people around and redlining areas and making them pack up their tents every single day just makes living so much harder. Um, at San Lorenzo Park, for example, which the city has already tried to broke up, break up, the homeless union and others have proved in federal court that the accusations the city manager and city has made about fallen units, garbage, needles, and human waste are false, and that community members at the park have actually worked to resolve any issues that there are despite the negligence of the city, which has actually failed to provide proper garbage services at the park. This is just one example. Thank you. With the phone number 1150. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, this is Kelsey Hill. Um, I made comments two weeks ago on the first reading, but I want to reiterate some comments that have been made. How in the world did this ordinance get even worse? And what I've witnessed in these last two meetings is patently bad city policy crafting. It's confusing, it's messy, and it opens the city up to lawsuits in the worst budgetary constraints the city's experienced in decades. Um, many of you on this dais know that I was homeless for five years as a youth, and if it had been my mom or dad that you were legislating against with Tolo, I definitely would not have been able to go to school in this town or run for council this last year, where I heard the newly elected members on this dais talk about compassion ad nauseum. So how dare the majority on this council call themselves leaders when they are unabashedly serving only the interests of the people who are already sheltered in our community? You need to hear the concerns of the, your constituents and kill this ordinance. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and uh, conclude. Um, I believe the last two folks with their hands up, I believe, Yasmin, you've spoken, um, and I believe, Michelle, um, we called you as well. Mayor, Jasmine was one that didn't get through the first time. Oh, okay. So why don't we have her? Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I'm Jasmine Mia, and um, I lost my faith in the city council and electoral process a while ago, yet somehow I was still surprised. Surprised you somehow made this ordinance even worse. The presentation was basically city staff pointing out all the places you overlooked to suggest ways to make this even more restrictive. Hey, you guys forgot that little patch over there. This is essentially saying that houseless people should cease to exist, because where should they go? What if all cities and counties did this? Invoke John Rawls' veil of ignorance. What if you were houseless and this was happening to you? How would you want to be treated? This is the path to genocide. It's heartless, inhumane, and unacceptable. Connect with your humanity, vote no on this ordinance, defund the police, and use the money to provide actual solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Bonnie, was there any other callers that didn't get in when we were working through some of that? No. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to allow, allow the last two, 6903, because I said I'd go till 945. So 6903 and Michelle, and that will be it for this evening. Thank you. This is Kat and Kay on speaking on behalf of the Santa Cruz Coalition of Homelessness. We're advocating for transitional managed encampments in the city. It's of no cost to the city because the funding comes from organizations or communities managing them. People living nearby transitional encampments actually benefit from them, less crime and greater cleanliness of the neighborhood. People transition into better situations at a higher rate than other models through self-care and communal responsibilities like picking up trash in and around the encampment and maintaining the encampment's facilities like cooking, cleaning, and staffing the welcome desk. If the outdoor living ordinance passes, we want it to include a permit process specifically allowing faith-based communities and or nonprofits to operate the transitional managed encampments in all parts of the city. Our preference is for a permit process to be included in this ordinance, but we are also in support of it being its own individual agenda item. The city can either continue the never-ending cycle of relocating homeless individuals through police enforcement, or they can invest into a true long-term solution of transitional encampments. Go ahead, Michelle. Hi, uh, I thank you. Um, I am just begging you to please vote no on this ordinance. Uh, as a, a community member and a previously unhoused person, uh, people need a chance to to prove themselves, to to have potentially a better life. And, and most of these people did not choose this path. And I just wish that we could give them one more chance. Um, and, and that may be just to, to stay where they are for a few more nights and, and to be able to pick themselves up, to have somewhere that they can, can count on sleeping for a few nights and, and begin to to make a new life. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you and thank you for everyone that spoke tonight. Um, I hope we got through pretty much everybody. Um, we tried hard. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it back to the council now. Um, uh, I believe Council Member Cummings, I, I have to admit I was focused on a lot of numbers tonight. So I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure if it was you or Council Member Boulder that raised your hand first. So I'm hoping one, one, or, one or the other of you would know. Thanks, Mayor. I, I believe I raised my hand first. Um, and so I'd just like to start by thanking everyone for joining us tonight and for making the comments that they made around our attempts to address probably what's one of the community's biggest and most challenging issues. Um, I greatly sympathize with the members of our community who are experiencing homelessness and houselessness. Um, and I also greatly sympathize with those who are housed who experience um, some of the negative um, impacts that can be associated with homelessness. And my hope is that you know we can work together to find a balance and personally, my feelings are that, you know, rather than to rush to do something, that we should really take our time to do something right. And, you know, if we make changes this evening, I really hope that it can come back as a first reading and that we could have staff do some work to um, really make some updates and changes that can address the concerns that we're hearing from the community. Um, I don't really believe that it's so critical that we get something passed this evening because as it's been expressed we do have time to continue working on this uh, given that there's going to be restrictions in our ability to enforce this um, due to cdc guidelines among other things and you know i think we also need to take into account you know if this is something that can't be enforced then why are we putting laws in the books that can't be enforced so um those are some initial comments i wanted to make um, I agree with members of the community, especially those who have expressed concern around um, this, around unsanctioned camping in our open spaces. Um, that was one of the biggest reasons why I voted against this last time, and my feelings towards that have not changed at all. Um, I've looked over the parks master plan. Each of the, the areas that have been defined have
have their own master plans, some going uh, as far back as the 1990s, some in the early 2000s, and many of them truly express um, the need to preserve these environmental habitats and minimize to the greatest extent possible uh, human disturbance within these areas. Uh, as some of the callers have mentioned, some of these plans had to go through the Coastal Commission, and so I also have concerns around whether or not those, uh, you know, saying that we, we would allow for camping in those areas, whether or not that would need to have approval by the Coastal Commission. Um, but, you know, I do want to recognize that we need to uh, try to start figuring out ways we can address some of the behaviors that we're experiencing. Um, to um, one of the, the callers made the comments around the cleanup under the Soquel Bridge. Um, I know a number of other people who went and helped with that effort. And while we need to try to do what we can to, um, you know, allow for people experiencing homelessness to have compassionate ways to find sleep and to live within our community, we also need to ensure that um, the actions that are associated with those encampments aren't damaging our natural spaces, our water supplies, uh, that we're not promoting fires within um, fire sensitive habitats, and that we're not, you know, um, putting unnecessary impacts on um, people within our community who may be housed as well. Um, so with that, I do have a few questions. I do have some um, recommendations for changes that can be made. Um, and I'm willing, I'd, I'd like to hear from colleagues before. I'm not gonna you know, jump the gun and make a motion straight out the gate. Um, but I did have a couple questions uh, before we kind of get into deliberations for staff. First question, and, and I know I brought this up at the last meeting and I've had community members reach out to me as well. Um, last meeting, we had maps showing where camping could not occur, but we weren't provided with a map of based on the areas where we designated where camping could occur. And I'm wondering still, has there been a map created to show based on the current ordinance where camping could occur? Um, and I think that's really important because if this were to pass tonight, the way that it's written, then the community at least deserves to see what areas would be, uh, where camping would be able to occur in the city. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, a pictorial representation has not been prepared. I can tell you the ordinance in front of you includes the four open spaces, which would be um, De La Viega, Poganip, uh, Arana Gulch, excuse me, yeah, Arana Gulch and um, uh, Poganip, uh, or no, Moore Creek, I already said that other one. Um, and then it would include the commercial and industrial areas. So that includes West Side Industrial, um, the uh, Harvey West area. Um, it includes the uh, small area in Seabright that is owned industrial. And it includes um, each of the primary corridors. So Mission, Ocean, Water, Soquel. Um, that's essentially what it would include as permissible areas. Can you, can you just repeat that one more time, please? Sure. The four open space areas, um, and then um, our three industrial areas. So that's um, the far west side, um, Harvey West, and there's a small industrial area in Seabright. And then uh, the commercial uh, zoning districts. So that's Mission, Water, Ocean, and SoCal. Okay, and then a follow-up question to that specifically. This is just as an example. So, Dale Viega, I'm wondering, could you bring up one of the maps, at least that we can kind of sure. point, to people, point to where we're discussing? Give me one moment. Find one here. Okay. Can you see this? This is the uh, ordinance, but I'll, I'll pull up. Uh, let's find one of the maps here. Here we go. Great. Um, so, the, 
the upper right corner, that seems, that appears to be De La Viega, right? That's correct, yeah. So those light drain areas, are those the golf course and the disc golf course? Because um, that's kind of what it seems like. And I'm just wanting to ask if that's the case. Let's open this. So um, the there are some areas, it appears, um, that are the golf course. You can see through here. Um, and other areas are prohibited. These, this is, you know, the Lower de la Viega Park. This, I believe, is the disc golf course um, back here. And then um, there's some other facilities that um, are also off limits based on their, their designation. Thanks. I just wanted to, I wanted to point that out too because when we're, you know, if we move forward tonight with saying that this is okay in open spaces, I just want to point out that one of those spaces as well is one of our economic generators, which is our golf course. And I believe this year, for the first time in 20 years, we're actually in the black in our golf course. And so having that designated as a place where there'd be unmanaged encampments would be extremely problematic, I think, for many people in the community. Um, and then my next question um, I'd like to ask is for the city manager. And I couldn't find it in my most recent emails, but we did receive an email from an individual who had reached out last year and had mentioned that they had proposed um, providing the city with the number of properties on the east side that could be used for homeless encampments. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that because that individual emailed us again um, and it reminded me of when this person reached out to us. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if there's been any follow up with that person or what the potential is to work with them because it sounds like there's someone offering this property to use for this purpose. And if that's the case, then we should probably consider taking them up on it. Uh, I believe you're referring to an individual that owns land uh, out on, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in the unincorporated area. It's not in the city limits. It borders the city. I think it's all of 7th Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I think last year, because it's not in the city, uh, I think that was referred over to, to the county. And then last year, the county was focused on opening up all the, uh, the other facilities, the armory. We focused on the armory. We focused on the hotels and, and all the other facilities that were brought online. So I, I don't know whether it may be a conversation that the county may have now that they've adopted some some new uh, policies and perhaps that might be something that they consider, but it's really not within our control it's, it, as it's not in the city limits. And I'll note that um, I did forward that information to um, the county so that they can, the, the, the letter that came in as part of this packet, I forwarded to the county for their consideration. That's right. They did indicate that they were gonna follow up with the individual, so it's in their hands at this point. Okay, great, thanks. And then, um, I'm happy to kind of go through some language at a later point, but I do want to provide opportunities for other council members to ask questions and make comments, but I do have some suggestions for um, direction moving forward. Okay, I have uh, Council Member Boulder, Council Member Brown, Council Member Pontari Johnson, and then Council Member Watson. Okay, so, um, you know, I feel like it's taken decades to get to see where we are today, and it's not all our fault. There's state laws that have also contributed to this situation, and I am completely prepared to make a motion. I've emailed it to Bonnie, um, but I just want an opportunity to share some thoughts, and I'm happy to hear from um, the, my colleagues as well. But first of all, I'm super happy to hear about what happened at the county this morning, and I can't thank the supervisors enough for um, you know, starting the ball rolling with that. But I also want to be clear to the callers that I don't think there's a member of this body that wants to live in a police state and thinks that arresting a person, um, every person for being poor or homeless is what we want. But that being said, like, we do need some basic rules. And like, I'm, my kids have asked me, like, how many callers that have called in have invited homeless people into their home? And I'm only making the suggestion because uh, my family and I have invited two different homeless individuals into our home, and we had one live with us for eight months, and another has come in off and on as he pleases for the last 
five years. So um, it's really illuminating, and I encourage everyone that has a couch or an aero bed to, to do that. Um, but when you do that, like, I really would like to know, do you not have basic rules? Because uh, we have rules at our house that guests follow and just some simple ones like not eating on the couch or throwing trash on the floor. Please pee in the toilet and make your bed in the morning. Like, and guess what? They managed to follow it. And so when someone's homeless, if they're a grown adult, I don't see why they can't follow rules. Like how we're expected to stop at stop signs and things like that. Like, I, I don't think that the rules that we're trying to throw out there are that um, uh, harsh. I'm also curious if some of the callers even read the ordinance or if they just kind of found a call to action from Instagram or a flyer. But I just think that the intention um, of this council is to address the complex needs of the homeless individual and make our city safe and clean for everyone. And um, I'm gonna keep ranting for a second, but like I'm so sick of everybody, um, the narrative, I shouldn't say everybody, the narrative that just because someone's homeless, they're the most vulnerable person in our community. You'll never convince me that of that. The, home, the most um, vulnerable people in our community are our children. And whether they're housed or not, we have to do everything with them in mind. And from my perspective, I don't think we're doing a very good job of protecting our watershed or making certain places of our town safe for kids. I just read in, uh, during the break that somebody was, there's an attempted murder at San Lorenzo Park this week. And like over the past uh, two months, I've or maybe the last month even, I went on two cleanups where we cleaned up over 4,000 pounds of trash left by campers and hundreds of needles that are flowing straight out to the National Marine Sanctuary. Like I saw gang graffiti with gang tags. I saw swastikas carved into trees. And I'm not a uh, detective, but I hypothesize this is over, you know, turf for drug sales. And like, I just can't believe that living, you know, in unmanaged, unruled, camps is the way to go. Ideally, obviously, I'd like to see managed encampments, transitional encampments, and things like this. And so to the extent that we can work together to find places where it, it like Councilmember Cummings said, where it is acceptable and putting those people kind of together, um, where, you know, th that's ideal. That's what we want. I don't want people in, in open spaces. And I don't think anybody here does. So you know, I, I have a motion that I think that that we could that addresses some of the things that Director Butler um, said, and that I think addresses a lot of the concerns of the council and a lot of the community concerns. And so, I'm wondering if we could look at it and then um, try and work from that. But I saw Sandy and and Chevron and Martine. You guys all had your hands up too, so I don't want to be a, too much of a gas bag. So I'll stop talking. Thank you. Well, in the in the effort to try to get a motion on the table. It's 10 o'clock now. Um, I'll go ahead and second your motion. And I know that there will be other edits most likely, um, but we'll just try to manage it going forward. Um, Council Member Brown. Yeah, um, before, so I'm gonna ask uh, um, the city clerk, Bonnie, if you could um, retrieve the map that came up during public comment for just a second um, because I do want to, I have a couple of questions and I want to try to use that because it actually um, is a little bit more accurate portrayal of what the current ordinance would do than looking at the layered version. So if you could put that up, I, I'd love to. You mean to the map that Serge showed? Yeah, Serge's map, thanks. I guess while um, we're, we're uh, waiting to look at that, I, um, one of the reasons that I want to take a look at this is one, to make a couple of comments, but also to ask uh, the city attorney to give us uh, a little bit more of a, a take on uh, what, you know, looking what moving forward with this iteration of an ordinance might mean in terms of uh, our, our legal um, vulnerability. Um, so this is a map that actually um, that was produced by a member of the public, um, and it 
And so it may not be exactly, uh, you know, the, the boundaries, but I think it, it's pretty representative. So what you see here, is, uh, the black areas are the areas where um, camping between sundown and 7 a.m. or, you know, 8 p.m., whatever the time frame that we end up uh, coming to, um, where camping would be permitted. Uh, you'll note that most of this area is the four open spaces, which have been discussed tonight. We've heard a lot of concern from the community. I share that concern. Um, it's, you know, it's just a little bit confusing to me that um, to, to move forward in this way, we are, um, we have been up until now, and I imagine there will be changes tonight, um, been looking at uh, some of the only places that people can be are um, open space sensitive habitat, much of it not really conducive to um, actually uh, sleeping, uh, certainly without hygiene and waste management and access. So there's all kinds of challenges. Even if we did leave this in, I don't believe we that these are uh, appropriate areas. But if you take those out, we what I see left is Harvey West, SoCal Avenue, Mission Street, and perhaps a little bit of the West Side Industrial Zone. Um, so that is a, a fairly limited uh, realm of, of possibility for people who are, you know, legitimately without shelter, shelter and have no other place to go. So I'm just going to now ask the question, uh, um, Tony, if you could um, just maybe talk a little bit about the, I know we, we've acknowledged that there's probably no way to, you know, move through this without some legal claims <laughs> without having to move through that process. But I'm, I'm just wondering if you could help uh, um, us understand what that might look like should a claim be fi a constitutional claim, an Eighth Amendment claim, um, and or CEQA claims, what that will mean. Like how long it might it take before that gets resolved? Um, I know that it's, again, it's a lot of variables and I kind of tried to ask this last time, but I'd, I'd love to just get a, a better understanding of what we're looking at here um, as a result. I'm sorry. You, you, you That's just, a, thanks. Yeah. Um, so there's there's quite a lot to unpack there. So let me try to break it down a little bit. First is, as we have discussed, and I think I was candid um, the last time uh, that that the council met on this topic, uh, we are dealing with a very complicated issue with a lot of competing issues. Um, a lot of competing interests and an area and areas of the law that have um, no clear guidance, and and so the litigation uh, risk-free option is not on the table tonight, including maintaining the status quo. Um, and we're already under in litigation on this topic, uh, and I I think. There are a number of ways to look at this, but whatever whatever ordinance the council ultimately ends up approving, I think there's a reasonable likelihood that we'll be defending it in court. And I'm not suggesting that that's a reason not to do it. It's just the reality. And 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 one possible outcome of that is that through the court process, um, further amendments could be made because there is a severability clause in the ordinance, and so a court could strike portions of it and leave the basic framework intact. Um, and so, so, that, so that's just the circumstance that we're operating under. <clears throat> a separate concern is, could the council move forward on an ordinance tonight for final adoption and direct changes be brought back for consideration at a future meeting that would address some of the, you know, perceived uh, <clears throat> flaws that might give uh, give rise to litigation, and that's a possibility as well. That someone might, you know, you leave, you leave the uh, potential for camping in open space intact, but direct um, the staff to return with an amendment to remove the Arana Gulch and De La Viega and Moore Creek, uh, et cetera, from the places where sleep, overnight sleeping is available, could someone file a, an environmental challenge based on Endangered Species Act or 
or um, CEQA to challenge that component only, even though the council's already given direction to bring back an amendment to fix that. And I think the likelihood is is not very high, but but there is at least you know a, a potential likelihood of that. Um, and and one way to mitigate that would be to have an ordinance brought back for introduction, um, you know, before uh, the deadline to file a, uh, a CEQA lawsuit has passed. And the, and the deadline to file a CEQA lawsuit is triggered by, by filing a uh, notice of exemption <clears throat> with the state office of um, the state clearinghouse. And if the council directs us to bring amendments back, I suspect we won't be filing a notice of exemption, uh, at least until the council's taken up the ordinance at a future meeting. So, so the risk there is even further mitigated. So that's a possibility. Um, and so I think that gets to the heart of your question, but I, I want to make sure that I answered it fully. Is there, is there another, uh, have I missed anything? Uh, no, that, I, I think, I think I, I no. I think substantively on the the claim, what the claims might entail. I think that covers it. I appreciate you uh, going over that. Um, I guess the other question that I do have, though, is um, in terms of, and I know this is you know there's a lot of possibilities here too, and a lot of variables. But should either of those kinds of claims be filed, what happens next after that? For the council to consider for the for your office to to do what would be the next steps? Like, do we, do we have time to you know would we go into settlement talks or would we try to I mean like would part of the ordinance still be you know could we sever then you know, I'm just I guess I'm just confused about the the potential there's process a, timeline. Yeah, it's, I think that no matter what the no matter the direction from which litigation comes, we would look to attempt to resolve the litigation through uh, discussions and negotiations. Um, and, and regardless, litigation does not get resolved quickly. And so, um, so there would be plenty of opportunities for us to have further discussions and possibly make changes as a settlement or um, maybe make changes um, based on guidance that we get from the court if this litigation so so that's that's a fluid process and it really depends on what the nature of the claims uh is and 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 what specific issues we're we're trying to we're trying to deal with thanks i appreciate you trying to help me envision the future here with uh you know a whole lot of unknowns but also I appreciate bearing in mind you know as an attorney who's accustomed to providing you know advice on litigation in closed session as as attorney client privileged communications, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to walk an appropriate balance be between having as much of a candid discussion as we can without like totally tipping our hand on, on potential uh, legal issues that might be used against us. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I do have some comments, but I think I'll, I'll let others uh, weigh in and um, hopefully I can come back around before we vote. Sure. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I just want to start out by saying again, I, I heard all the callers and appreciate and want to thank the callers um, for taking the time to engage and participate, um, as well as those who wrote letters in the last several weeks, um, taking the time to express your concerns. Uh, compassion was brought up a number of times tonight and and through the letters. Um, and I just, you know, I, I want to say that doing nothing is not compassion. And um, watching human suffering um, among those who are unhoused is not compassion. And watching the negative impact of our community members who are housed is not compassion. I understand that there are um, challenges with this current ordinance, and I'm hoping with our discussion tonight that we can make some significant amendments that address the concerns and challenges. Um, but sitting 
here and doing nothing is not compassion for anyone. I just, I really want to make that clear. Um, but that's, I feel strongly about that. Um, what the ordinance has done is it's given us an opportunity to engage. Although a, a very divisive issue, it's given us an opportunity to engage and to have dialogue with community members um, and among us, our, the city council colleagues that I have. Um, it's also allowed us to, in a meaningful way, talk about programming. Um, right now, as the ordinance stands, a safe sleeping program would be launched um, and stood up within 60 days. Maybe we need to look at that and expedite that. Um, right now, as the ordinance stands, there are opportunities for managed encampments. Um, I think that that piece of the language in the ordinance is confusing, but it's in the ordinance that managed encampments would be permissible in all areas of the city, um, even the ones that are outlined as prohibited, um, if we work with, with city, county, nonprofits, and I think the language of safe communities is missing, so I hope that we can add that. Um, again, there's work to be done. Um, there are issues to be addressed. Um, I hear the concerns around criminalization. I had some really um, insightful phone calls with some community members that work in the field, um, some people who I know, some people who I've never met. Um, and I think as much as we can, really narrowing in on the unacceptable behaviors and the rules that we all have to live by, as Councilmember Golder mentioned, um, to explicitly name those. Uh, those are expected of everyone, to explicitly name those and not criminalize being unhoused or sleeping, um, but hold people accountable for the rules that, that are here in society. Um, so I'm hoping that we can have some clarity around that. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just I'll just stop there with my comments. And, and I also have um, worked with Council Member Watkins to draft some potential amendments and changes, and I'll wait to see what's brought forward by my colleagues before sharing those. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Watkins? Um, I do want to thank my colleagues for their comments. I want to thank the community members who reached out to us um, who were on the phone today, but also the many who emailed us their concerns. I, um, I want to reiterate what Lee said and thank just the amount of work that's gone into this from various um, department heads and community members who've informed some of the modifications and changes. I think what we know is that there really is no single strategy or true simple solution to um, the issue of houselessness in our community. I think what we also know to be true is that really cities are not equipped um, to handle these complex issues on our own. And um, any time that I've observed being on council, um, a proposal to take action, you know, like a big action, um, it's been very, you know, controversial and polarizing and difficult and um, just to the point where it's paralyzed, it's really our, our ability to move in any way. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I really, when I learned about, for example, health and all policies, which I know has been brought up, you know, one of the things that really struck me is about how that framework really takes in the whole community um, is really balancing the health equity and sustainability of the entire community. It also really, it focuses on the fact that we have really complex societal issues before us and that no single entity can handle this issue on its own and we have to collaborate. And so it was brought up by one of the callers that it's almost like a tapestry of um, interventions and um, supports and mitigations and ideally continuous improvement. But what I also know is that large unmanaged entrench encampments are not healthy living environments. Um, they cause environmental and social concerns and they are simply unsustainable. So I, I actually had an opportunity to go down to the San Lorenzo Park after the first reading of the ordinance. And I actually invited some members of the community who um, shared concerns with me about the ordinance to, to come with me. I didn't uh, hear back from them as interested in wanting to come, but. I think people um, who may want to understand what it could be like um, just observing or talking to individuals down there who have it but have opinions, you know, I suggest they do and I'm sure our law enforcement, if they don't feel comfortable going on their own, would be happy to go with them. 
Um, but I want to just sort of share what I observed. And it, and I observed um, a number of individuals residing there. I spoke to a few of them. Some of them uh, said they were local uh, from Capitola and Aptos, from uh, out of state, from uh, Oregon and other areas of our uh, country. Um, some just wouldn't disclose where they were from. Uh, there was uh, a woman who looked distressed there. There was an uh, ambulance called there at the time. And I learned from our law enforcement who I was with that every time an ambulance comes, there's a, a law enforcement officer who accompanies that EMT to, um, to, the, to perform their services there. I also observed no children in the playground, nor do I think there could actually probably, you know, would be good for any children to be there in that playground. That's actually one of the more lower income areas of our community. So it's the low income families who are not able to benefit from their, their local playground. Um, I observed our uh, elderly uh, seniors who are there who are actually living in a subsidized complex for uh, seniors who are 62 years older and um, or disabled and, um, and them being impacted from the conditions at the park. So I can't, um, I can't say that that's a healthy, equitable approach to our entire community. And I think that we all sh share that, that our lower income areas of our city um, doesn't make it okay to allow us to ignore them or take any action whatsoever and say that that's what uh, we're willing to accept because that's where that is. And those are the areas that are most often impacted. I think that for me, this is, um, really about how do we improve and i know uh council member Kalantari johnson brought up that we have some amendments we'd like to share around um improvements and modifications to really address a lot of the concerns that were brought before us but about also balancing being in action as opposed to deferring to status quo um, because that is not what i would consider uh, a healthy equitable or sustainable community decision in my opinion so i know this is always tough and tricky and I have sat on the council for four years and it is never easy because there are um, human beings of all different sectors who are impacted, our entire community is impacted. And so I, um, but I think at this point we have to stay um, in action and willing to try things. And if it doesn't work, we tried and we'll improve and we'll continue to modify and track and we'll improve and we'll continue to modify and track. But we're going to continue to try because I'm not willing to throw up my hands and say that that's what I think is acceptable because it's, it's just it's not for anybody. And um, and I want to echo the, the comments made about the county. I think I appreciate them willing to step up. We're uh, in this together and we need to work together on these solutions. So those are my comments. And I know that the amendments in the um, motion are forthcoming in terms of how we're going to move forward with policy direction. Thank you, council member. Um, Council Member Cummings, if you don't mind, I might stick myself in here just for a very brief comment, and then I'll, I'll ask, I'll, I'm happy to have you continue. Um, yeah, I, um, I, you know, I echo a lot of what's been said. Um, I've said many things before. I'm not going to repeat them. Um, this is um, basically a societal failure um it probably 30 years in the making at least in my knowledge growing up here in california um and watching my mom hit the roof when uh, ronald reagan you know passed laws that basically decided to not take care of people who needed to be taken care of um and who needed assistance um and i remember i remember those conversations i remember reading the san francisco chronicle i remember her as a very staunch liberal um, Democrat who spent a lot of time taking care of people, being absolutely furious that that was going to be the destiny for you know the people of California and the future of California. Um, I have a dear, dear family member, um, a relative. He has been homeless for 20 years. He's a veteran. He's a father. Um, he's been off and on the streets. He's lost his home. He's lost his job. Um, he is disabled um, from 20 years of meth addiction. Um, he, um, so he's the guy I called. <laughs> he's the person I called this week. And I said, and he, 
and he knows this place. Um, he's been here many, many times and we've hiked in the woods and we've swam in this river and we've done all the things that you do with people you care about. And um, I said, well, what should we do? Should we do nothing or should we try to do something? And he said, trust me, start doing something. Start, stop ignoring us, stop accepting that this is acceptable. It's not. He lives in camps, he knows what they're like. Um, and he said, please do something, stand up and try to do something. Try to name opportunities, try to set behaviors, try to tell me that you expect me to do better. So I'm gonna take his words and I'm gonna try to do that tonight because that's my experience. And I trust him because he has been living homeless for 20 years, but he's a proud veteran, he's a proud father, um, and he was a very successful person. And unfortunately his substance abuse, he, it's just consumed him, but he can't find help for that disease. Um, and that's the problem that is affecting our entire society right now is we're not investing in things that are making people's lives fail. And it's not people that don't, that build big houses. It's not those things. It's disinvestment into our society and into our communities. And that's why we are where we are today. So when you vilify people who may have built a house or owned a house or did any of those things, I agree with my colleagues, please, do not turn this into a divisive community argument. We're only going to get there if we work together and nothing is going to be perfect when we push it out the first time. But I haven't heard anyone here tonight who's your elected official who has said that they are, you know, died in the, died in the wool around one thing or another. I think we're all trying to push something forward, trying to make the inertia stop and make something happen. So, um, you know, I second I seconded the motion. I feel very strongly tonight. We've got to we've got to put some on the books, and I think we already know we'll come back with an amendment. But I think something has to be put on the books tonight, and that's 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 what at least I'll be advocating for. Um, I really appreciate all my um, colleagues' comments, um, and especially um, all your concern for everyone involved and all the people who are unfortunately having to to be in the place that they are tonight with um, not having a home. So Council Member Cummings, I will um, call on you next and um, and then we'll go, I think, to the motion after that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna thank everybody for their comments. I did wanna make um, one comment very briefly. You know, we opened this and to the points that were made by Council Member Brown before we um, went to public comment. I think there was, um, you know, a real desire to try to allow as much time as possible for the community to speak to this item. And for that reason, I know Council Member Brown kept her, her question short. I did as well. And I know other members of the council, like, like so, probably did because we wanted to make sure we heard from the public. And when we opened this portion, I was ready to make a motion but wanted to wait to hear from my colleagues. And I know a motion has been made, and so I'm not gonna argue that point. I will just ask though, that as we move forward, when um, we are taking action and making motions, that those motions are read before a second or what have you, because currently we have a motion that was made and seconded, and no one in the community knows what that motion was. And so I think just for transparency, and as a part of our process that, you know, it's really important that when motions are being made that we read them, that it's clear for everyone that we know where this, what direction is being moved, um, you know, before we're, we have seconds and, and we're starting to move forward in the process. Because technically, if someone were to call the question, we could just move on to a vote. I know that's not going to happen, but just in terms of process, I think it's really important that um, we try to be as transparent as possible and stay true to, to the process. So, all in my comments, and I'm looking forward to seeing what is before us and the motion that's been made, and then ways that we can try to, you know, contribute and move something along that will help our current situation. I just want to 
want to make sure count yeah council member commentary johnson you're back in um you got kicked out it sounds like you got booted off yeah something weird happened everything turned off in my house i think it was the wind i'm back thanks okay uh is there um uh, do you want to put them is there any other questions i don't want to cut anybody's time short i did i was trying to honor listening to the public so um i don't know if council members have specific questions for staff or if we should just go right into deliberation okay um council member golder do you want to walk us through or i'm not sure if you gave this staff or I think you give it Bonnie's got it but I didn't know if you sure sure well, I'm happy to um I don't know if she wants to scoot it down and I'll I let um, I can read it or people can read it what would be Sorry, you should read it yeah. can you can you put it down a little then because they can't see the top okay so um is that the very top this is the very top right here I don't know what okay. you're I don't know what you can see. Oh, okay. Um I wonder if I, Oh there yeah, I could not see it. There okay, now I can see it. Okay. So um I'd like to make a motion um to amend um chapter six point three of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to the temporary outdoor living and direct staff to return by April 9th, twenty twenty one with an amended ordinance that would include the following and so the first was map amendments an amended map um, des designating more creek preserve poganip open space um, de la vega park arana gulch uh, closed during all for camping during all hours an amended map um, designating public property adjacent to the state parks when public property abuts a residential zoning district as closed to camping during all hours and designate um, Swanton Boulevard is close to camping. Um, amendments to 6.36040 at risk areas and daytime encampments. So um, direct staff to return by April 9th, 2021 with the following revised language designated public property adjacent. It's like, sorry, it was like I was trying to put everything together and so I might have duplicated some things here. Um, this is kind of just the same thing but as um language and not the map but um designating public property adjacent to state parks when public property abuts a residential zoning district such such as close to camping during daylight or during all hours and designate all of Swanton Boulevard close to camping as well as public right-of-ways such as sidewalks adjacent to city and state parks um when said property abuts a residential zoning district direct staff to return by april 9th 2021 with the following revised language to section 636040 at risk areas and daytime encampments section a8 to remove but not including open spaces um can you scroll up a little bonnie I'm wondering too if we could email it to everybody just so that they can read it. It might be easier to. I mean, I can. I'm happy to keep reading it to the public. You still need to read it out loud. You still need to. Yeah, read I'll it read it, and then they can, so that way people can read it on their own too. Direct staff to return by April 9th, 2021, with the following revised language to Section 6.36. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, zero four zero at risk areas and daytime encampments to include more creek preserve poking up open space around gulch de la viega and within all parks as defined by the parks master plan um direct so i had it kind of started and then i took some of lee's words that's why it seems so duplicative um direct staff to return by April 9th, 2021 with the following revised language to section three six three six zero four zero at risk areas and daytime encampments section A11 to include RT zoning district. Direct staff to return by April 9, 21 with the following revised language to section three six thirty six zero four zero at risk 
areas and daytime encampments, section B3, as city personnel encounter individuals who are camping in prohibited areas or at prohibited times, the city shall um, service of available to assist individuals with on-street transportation to storage facilities. Direct staff to return by April 9, 21 with how individuals will with physical disabilities will be addressed. And then further direction for city staff. City staff shall conduct a census of the homeless individuals at least quarterly if funding is available to do so. City staff shall return with operating and permitting guidelines for 636050 and 636050B. Sorry. The city staff shall issue a request for qualifications for nonprofit service providers for safe sleeping programs and temporary encampments in order to broaden the city's list of qualified organizations for providing such services allowed under this ordinance. The city shall not implement enforcement until amendments are made and CDC COVID tier is orange. City staff shall provide an amend amended map with clarifying legend and a statement that camping is not allowed pursuant to the state requirements for state parks. City staff shall seek opportunities, particularly when public safety life safety is not under immediate slash urgent threat through coordination with city, county, non-governmental organizations or faith-based faith staff for outreach to proceed or occur simultaneously to enforcement of prohibited living so that when feasible, non-enforcement personnel can contact identified individuals on a complaint basis with a structured proactive program. City staff shall seek opportunities, particularly when public safety, life safety, not under immediate urgent threat through coordination with city, county. Is this a, is this the same paragraph again? I think that might be a mistake. Thank you. And then um, finally, no action can take place um, no no action can take place in it it's supposed to say if safe sleeping spots are not available in the county and that was i was trying to get um if there are no safe sleeping spot, spots or so i was trying to capture what lee was suggesting at the end of his presentation um and then i wanted to put something here with the misdemeanor so this is uh that, that that only, and I think this is something Lee put on there. And I was trying to, to put it, but I don't know if I did it right. But that that the following could be um, mis, the following could be misdemeanors. And now I can't see it. Can you scroll up a little bit? No, I meant down. Sorry. Did I put okay. them on there? The bottom. Yeah. The oh, I can't see them though. I don't know. I can't read them. It just says misdemeanor six A is all I can see. But there was like a list of things that Lee said um, right sure. there, for, tie, to tie them to actions, fires, bike, chop shops, needles, camping, in specific locations. And so I, I know that that's something I feel like that we could work through. I don't I don't have it so much. And then the, um, and that's the same thing down there is that, that you part was the same thing I was trying to capture from Lee. So I, I understand that it's not perfect and I was hoping that through teamwork and friendly amendments we can make it better. Thank you, Council Member Boulder. Um, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Justin, you're muted. My hand was up from last time. Did you not? I didn't have, I don't think I lowered my hand from the last time. If not, then I'll take my hand down right now. Okay. Council member, uh, Colin Terry Johnson. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I was just going through council member Golder's motion and, and um, an amendment and looking through what council member Watkins and I 
um, put together and there's there are quite a bit of overlap so I was trying to go through and cross out the overlap but maybe I'll just send this to Bonnie as is that might be a faster way to do it so um, sorry just one second I'm gonna maybe yeah what's the best way to proceed yeah, I was going to say, maybe we'll take a five minute, maybe a, maybe a 10 minute break, um, which I'm sure okay. we'll use. And maybe Council Member Colantari Johnson, you could, would you mind doing a kind of a compare and, and maybe yeah. strike it? And then that way we could get to one document. Does that make sense? I hate to not give you the 10 minutes. And That's fine. Away. No, I'm, I'm okay with doing that. Yeah, I thought Council Member Cummings was going to speak, so I thought I had a little more time. Um, so uh, you guys take a break and, uh, and I'll try to cross out what's already been said. Okay. Council Member, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I did. I was going to mention that I, it's similar to uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and Council Member Golder. I also had recommendations for language to be incorporated, some of which I think overlaps and some of which I believe might be new. And so I guess the question is, you know, what's the best way to try to reconcile three sets of recommendations? Um, Why don't we start with Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Sounds like she'll go through and compare. I don't know, Council Member Cummings, if maybe you could do that to make sure there's not repetitive, and then we can work from Council Member Kalantari Johnson. We'll just have to work line by line through again to see what we can get to, if that's amenable. I'm not sure how else to do it unless, uh, Martin, you have your hand up, Martin Bernal. Oh, just a good question. Uh, with respect to the date, just to clarify that one, did you mean April 13th, which is the first oh, meeting is, in April? Is that the next council meeting? Yes, that's no, right. No, the next council meeting is the 23rd, March 23rd. Oh, what's the first one in April? I didn't want it to be April 13th. So it was like, it sounds like a lot, it sounds like a lot of work. I don't want to be a jerk, like it's just giving too much work. So I meant the, the first one in April. That's the 13th then. Yes, April that one. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah. Thank you, just to clarify that part of it. Right. Sorry. <laughs> that okay. Okay. Um, Council Member Cummings, is that, will that work? Where we just, pull, we're just gonna be pulling out new language. Um, is that is that amenable to you? I mean, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any, um, like a <laughs> clear direction on how to go through this process. So yeah, let's just try and see what we can do by going through language and taking um, this break and making comparisons. Mayor, it might be beneficial for council member Kalantari Johnson to submit um, what would be a friendly amendment, I assume, and then we could work with that. And then council member Cummings can do a, his friendly amendment if there's anything left, if 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 Councilmember Calantari Johnson doesn't encompass Councilmember Cummings' thoughts, okay, okay, that way they're in order and makes that it way easier to follow. Right. That yeah. way, yeah, you can record them as friendly amendments. Um, can, just, can we still take that 10-minute break? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's take 10 minutes and then we'll come Thank back you. and uh, we'll go hopefully with friendly amendments. Okay, if council members can um, turn on their videos and their, oh, excuse me, their uh, mic, uh, be ready. Um, great, everybody's here. Um, council member Kalantari Johnson, did you have enough time to look at your materials and council member Cummings, did you have enough time? Kind of, okay. I did, um, I may have missed some things, but I, I sent the uh, motion language to Bonnie, if Bonnie, if you could pull it up. And then I'll um, also just invite Council Member Watkins if I if I missed something um, to, to chime in. Um, okay, so the friendly amendments to Council Member Golder's um, amendments are, um, the first one is to, um, provide clarity on where safe sleeping is uh, permissible and explicitly identify those areas where the nighttime sleeping is permissible as opposed to um, listing where nighttime sleeping is prohibited. 
uh, in addition to the storage uh, program, uh, that safe sleeping program is up and running prime to, prior to implementation of prohibition. These other areas that I've crossed out, I believe were already covered by Council Member Golder's amendment. Um, uh, around outreach, there was a question by staff about the intention of outreach, and it is to connect individuals to available shelter, um, safe sleeping options, but also to provide education on where and when camping is permitted and not permitted. Um, the other one is um, moving down to number five, that families with minor children are not subject to arrest or citation. Um, and I believe Council Member Cummings has some more specific language around that, so we might wanna consider what he's drafted. Um, that um, daytime restrictions, um, this was part of Council Member Golder's amendment, but um, the suggestion here is to shift the language a little to um, state yellow tier or CDC guidelines change whichever occurs first. And um, again, this the misdemeanor enforcement piece was brought up by Council Member Golder. The language here is a little different. Um, I, th I think it's saying the same thing, but I just wasn't sure. And then there is policy direction to add to the policy directions that Council Member Golder provided. Um, and that is to stand up a managed camp at 1220 River Street um, and have staff report back to council on steps taken to stand up the managed camp at 1220 River Street um, by June, 2021. Uh, actively develop and pursue restorative justice programs as part of our enforcement efforts. Um, work with the County of Santa Cruz to fully integrate the city's safe sleeping and storage programs into the continuum of care, the regional continuum of care that was brought forward by the Board of Supervisors today. And, um, and ensure that all county managed shelter and housing resources are made available to eligible individuals that, con that are contacted by city law enforcement or outreach personnel. Uh, develop and implement with the assistance of um, the members of the Public Safety Committee, a semi-annual review and audit of the outdoor living ordinance, um, specifically around arrests and citations. Um, and work with the uh, city police auditor to ensure public transparency of enforcement um, of the court and, in, and adherence to its principles. Um, work with the two by two to explore expansion of shelter, transitional shelter programs. This was the piece, this was what the Board of Supervisors has brought forward. So it's really, it's just confirming that we are in alignment with the Board of Supervisors and that we will continue to work with them um, and, and contribute to the to their strategic plan in the ways that make sense for our city. Um, um, sorry, really quick, Council Member. Um, I think it would be good for you to read it verbatim. Yeah, sure. There are okay. People who have called in and can't see what you're... Oh, thank you. I wasn't sure that that... Okay, thanks for clarifying. Um, the city's two-by-two two members to work with their county two-by-two two counterparts to explore expansion of transitional shelter programs into the city jurisdiction in concert with the county's three-year strategic plan on homelessness and new policy, new policy county set forth on March 9th, 2021 to expand the county's shelter programming into the unincorporated urban areas of the county and direct city manager to return to council no later than June, 2021 with an update. Do I need to go back and read some of the other ones, Bonnie? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, the next one is to invite county staff to come to, the, to um, a future city council meeting to present, to make a presentation of the work plan that was passed today, and then ask city staff to serve as a liaison for future updates of how this work plan is moving forward. And um, finally, develop and implement an ordinance effectiveness review program to initiate nine months from ordinance initiation to track, um, there's a number of items, I'll read them, to track increased outreach and connection to services, including quantity, integration into the county system of care, including HMIS and coordinated entry results. Um, decrease high density, large outdoor living groups, increase access to safe sleeping sites, increase access to hygiene resources, decrease encampments in high sensitivity zones and open spaces, increase access to parks and other city resources by all constituents, decrease reports and instances of fire 
dangerous crime, ambulance visits, environmental degradation of highly sensitive areas and prohibited areas of the city, and a cost analysis comparing cost of encampment cleanup, first responders and staffing response to encampments versus implementation of programming and the new ordinance. Council member Golder, are you, um, are these uh, amendments, friendly amendments okay with you? Absolutely. And as the seconder, I accept them too. And can I just confirm um, these yellow, are these crossed out or crossing out? Right, they're not gonna be sure. part of the friendly amendment? Correct. Okay. And then the yellow was the same, but slightly different? That's correct. So um, number six, um, if Council Member Golder and Mayor Myers are um, accept that, then I that I I would like to see this shifted, the language shifted to tier yellow tier or CDC oh, yeah. guidelines change. Um, number seven, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what to do with that because I I, I think I think that Council Member Golder's um, language and this language is maybe we combine the two. I think it's it's saying the same thing, but. Each of us has something a little different. Maybe we can combine those two. I think it's lower. This one? Yeah. Yes. Mayor, I think I think they're pretty much the same, except there's a little bit more of an explanation within the amendment, but these are the identifying accompanying um, actions. Actions. That's how I read it. Yeah, I think so. So this would replace the other language that doesn't have as much explanation. Yeah, mine was just a bunch of like thoughts. And so I think this one's better. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I highlighted four, um, I, as I said, I think council member Cummings has, has more specific and maybe stronger language around that. Council member Cummings, do you have a friendly amendment we could work with? Yes, I was trying to get all my comments in. Um, so I, I don't know if I should start at the top or if I should, if I should send these over to you and maybe go through them and see where um, they fit. Some of them I was able to identify the appropriate areas and others. I think there's a few on here that I would need um, to continue trying to add in, just trying to find the, the exact location. But um, I, think, I think I can actually make my way through it. Um, one of the things in particular, if you could maybe show uh, Council Member Golder's language again, or the, whatever the most recent document we were working on, Um, so similarly, I think that Council Member, Member Kalantari Johnson expressed this, um, but explicitly having maps where, um, where camping will be allowed. Um, and I actually think that we could probably delete the two map amendments because I think that what's most critical here is the changes to the ordinance. And as we change the ordinance, that'll be reflected in the maps. So I think if we really put the emphasis on changing the ordinance, then we'll see those changes we made in, in the maps. But in particular, because we haven't had a, a map produced showing where people can camp, that in particular, I think needs to be called out and we need to explicitly have a map where camping can occur. And it might be worth just saying where it could um, occur, uh, should it be a sanctioned camp? So for example, we have said that the city manager will have authorization to designate where um, transitional encampments or managing encampments may go. And so if there's a map that can be produced to show that along with 
um, in that absence where people can camp. I think that would be appropriate, though I do have some comments around those two items. Um, so let me just, so I, I'm seeing Councilmember Colder sh shaking her head yes, so I think she's amenable to that. Um, Bonnie, maybe I, I'm just taking notes. So basically, I think we're favoring Council Member Collintard Johnson, where a map that would show where camping can be allowed would be would mm -hmm. replace maps, the, the current maps that um, that. And then Council Member Cummings, you also mentioned um, uh, you had what other adjustment to the map um, just then? Was that was that it? That it, it's primarily. Okay. Yeah, that's the main one is having a map where um, I'm kind of, and I'm also kind of going through the ordinance as well because there's some that are general comments and some I think that um, are um, specific to the ordinance. Uh, one was in um, it's six point three six point zero three zero private property under A four the language currently says in um and this is uh, private property it is unlawful for any person to on private property erect configure construct maintain or store an outdoor living encampment or to use a vehicle for outdoor living except as expressly authorized below and in number four it says inside a licensed and registered vehicle in a residential off-street driveway with the written consent of the owner and occupant of the residence where the driver occupant of such vehicle is in possession of a valid driver's license provided that no more than one vehicle shall be permitted at any one location no particular location shall be used for camping under this provision for more than three days during any one calendar month and i was going to as a friendly amendment strike that last sentence um and add in um um, sorry, really quick, if I can, um, I think it might be good to have a visual, so sure. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow Detective Butler to show the ordinance and kind of make red line changes as he goes. Okay. That might be better. Okay. So this is uh, 6.36030. Mm -hmm. And A, was it A that you were referencing? Yeah, it was four. It was A four, the last you. sentence. And it might be good to hear some comments on this. The, the concern that I have is, and I know some of the individuals who spoke tonight, um, there was at least one individual who I've known who lived in a camper in someone's backyard in their driveway. And you know them being able to live there provided them with safety security it allowed them to save money put down payment on the house and so long as there's no you know nuisance behavior or complaints it doesn't seem it seems to me that you know even if it was somebody coming in from out of town staying in somebody's rv for a month you know while they're visiting um the action of somebody staying in an rv in someone's backyard i don't think that that should be you know that should be against but there should be a law that we're creating that um, doesn't allow for that unless the people are creating nuisance behaviors and, you know, under which circumstances they need to be dealt with regardless. So that's one of the changes I'd like to see if it would be considered. Lee, is it possible that you possibly make your screen a little bit? There you go. All right. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> that's great. No, I just want to make sure that the public can see it. Yeah, so let me see if I can get uh section there yeah so private property so I think the language would be to the to, to remove the bottom or is there a revision to that last sentence council member coming we we'll just remove that sentence and I'm just looking below to see if there's um can you scroll up a little bit lee there we go this way yeah and i guess my question to uh, maybe this could be for those for staff but do we need to call out explicitly in this section you know if someone is creating nuisance behavior that they would need to 
leave under these circumstances and I'm just trying to check it. I think it might be explicitly stated somewhere else, but. It's, it's included. So this is uh, all of private property. Mm -hmm. And then it has uh, that these are the allowances and then we've struck, uh, your suggestion is to strike the three day limitation. And the second part of that is a is not permitted on private property where it's conducted in a manner to create noise, inadequate sanitation, trafficking, illegal drugs, et cetera. Private, and I guess, private nuisance. And to that point too, I was also going to suggest striking, if you can, yeah, to create, striking and create noise because, I mean, we have a number of noise ordinances and there's certain times when people can make noise and when they can't. And it doesn't seem fair if somebody's in a backyard and they're it's two o'clock in the afternoon and they might be listening to a radio that that could be considered creating noise so unless we can explicitly define you know what that is but i think that it's captured when we say um uh outdoor living or camping shall not be permitted on private property where it is conducted in such a manner as to create a public or private nuisance so i feel like you know if the noise that's being made is, is considered a public or private nuisance, then that could capture that kind of behavior. In fact, it's, it's a, it could be considered redundant, certainly. Is the maker of the motion? Okay. The seconders, fine with that. So we'll strike as to create noise and just re keep the remaining language there. Okay. Um, I might need some help from staff with where this should be included, but one thing in particular is explicitly prohibiting, explicitly prohibit camping in environmentally sensitive habitats near critical infrastructure and open space areas. And I'm not sure exactly where that would sit, but I think that's kind of getting to, um, and actually a good section might be 6.3, 6.040 at risk areas and daytime encampments. Eight, uh, letter A, number eight. Um, currently, it should say within all parks as defined by the parks master plan, but not including open spaces. And then to Council Member Golders edit to add to it, uh, just striking part of that and saying within all open spaces, parks as outlined in the parks master plan and sensitive habitats in the city limits. And I know that there's a number of members of the public who mentioned that sensitive species have been mentioned, but sensitive habitats haven't. And so it's just um, wanted to add that. And so be within all parks as defined in the parks master plan, open spaces and sensitive habitats in city limits. Does that work as I've um, I think you mentioned earlier that open spaces weren't included in the parks master plan. That's why I was trying to keep those two separate. Yeah, they are. Um, they're just separate from parks. They're not considered parks in the parks master plan. Got it. Okay. So I don't know if that's acceptable. And that's, yes, on me too. And then I, um, and then number 10, I would just strike that um, if that's amenable. But number 10, oh no, sorry, here it's nine, the 75 linear feet from either side of a designated trail in open space. If we're, if we're saying you can't camp in open space, then that wouldn't make sense. Um, and also, if we're going to say 75 feet off the trail, you know, what comes to mind when we saw the maps earlier, for example, that would mean technically you could camp, somebody could set a tent up in the middle of the golf course and they would be 75 feet off the trail in open space. Um, and so I think there's a lot of concern around the distance off a trail and the potential negative impacts that can occur when you're um, going off trail to camp. Yeah, I think um, for things like this, um, they're gonna, in response to the council direction at this point, there are gonna be a bunch of cleanups similar to this where we're gonna to need to go in and um, make modifications. And in fact, what I was hearing is 
that um, this may want to move to an affirmative um, uh, rather than a, a prohibited. So, you know, a lot of this area is going to need to change. In fact, you know, it might, uh, instead of unlawful, it might change to lawful and have mm -hmm. the areas that are okay. But, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge in the next uh, couple of weeks before we uh, prepare the next report. Okay, and then um, section um, 6.36040, uh, the language I had around um, homeless families, the language was the prohibitions in section, and let me see if I can find, uh, yeah, and so it would be, under that section, D um, currently says the city shall not enforce the prohibition above in sections 636040B1 unless and until unsheltered persons in the city of San Francisco have available access to free COVID vaccine. So I think there's two. Um, one suggestion would be um, the, that the, until the CDC changes its guidance around dispersing individuals experiencing homelessness and homeless encampments and or when the county or state declaration of a local health emergency has been lifted. That's, I'm gonna put that out there for consideration. Um, but then the other part, the other thing that I could see going in this section is prohibitions in section 6.36040B1 and 2 shall not be enforced against homeless families who have children and in cases of a homeless family, the city staff shall work with the county and state and or nonprofit partners to attempt to find the family's temporary shelter or housing. So I can send that to Lee if you want, if that makes it easier. Can you repeat it really quick? Sure. Uh, the Both sections? This is um, section C, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's D, I think, unless it's changed on. on uh... Sorry, uh, this is, I've got it on C and D, just as a note that it needs to be captured here, because <clears throat> I don't know that we've got the specific wording at this point. Okay, and so um, for the first part, it's, the city shall not enforce the prohibition above in subsection 6.36040B1 and 2 unless and until the CDC changes its guidance around dispersing individuals experiencing homelessness and homeless encampments and or when the county slash state declaration of a local health emergency has been lifted. And and the purpose behind that is that, um, I guess the concerns that I've been hearing is that if, it's, if the city acts too quickly in the, because currently the guidelines, even if people get vaccinated is to wear masks, continue to social distance, that's all changing. And if this is coming back at the first meeting in April, we might have new guidance then, but really trying to be, um, just really trying to build in the safeguards so that, um, you know, if we're saying orange or yellow, that um, that's not gonna trigger a, another lawsuit. The CDC still maintains that regardless of status, um, while the health emergency is in effect, that we need to um, not move homeless people in homeless encampments. So that's just the rationale and the basis for that. Uh, the next one was um, the prohibitions in sections 6.36040, B1 and two shall not be enforced against homeless families who have children 
And in cases of a homeless family, the city staff shall work with the county, state, and or nonprofit partners to attempt to find the family temporary shelter or housing. Can't type as fast as you can speak, sorry. Yeah, no, it's not a problem. Can, can I add one thing to that? I mean, I, I totally, is that okay if I add something right now? Can I interrupt or, or, or should I wait? Sure, go ahead. With that, I would also like, um, just from having dealt with homeless families for the last 20 years in education, that Child Protective Services also be involved because mm -hmm. they do every attempt in this county to keep the family unit together and they have a vast network of resources that they can provide. And um, I just wanna make sure that uh, the children are cared for in, 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 in the circumstances. Sounds great. Um, not sure the best place for this to fit in, but I think it might be good under penalties for violation that uh, the enforcement of the camping prohibitions will not occur prior to providing storage, which I think is included, and identified managed sanctioned sleeping sites. What section is this? I think I, it, I'm not sure exactly the best place for it, but I think it might go under penalties for violations. It's really just trying to get at um, conditions when, when this when this can be enforced. And I think we've expressed that um, in order for this ordinance to take effect, we'd need to have storage. And I wanted to add that a managed sanction safe sleeping sites that or my question is that different than what we had included last time, which was was the safe was 150 safe sleeping sites before the ordinance. Was that is that different than the language that was in before Lee? That is different. Um, so you can see here um, that. Um, Let's see, did I, did I find the right one here? Um, it's actually later in this section. So you can see here that it says, uh, prohibitions above in these sections shall not be enforced until the storage program is operational. Uh, at the last meeting, the council added the safe sleeping, mm -hmm. but they did not tie the enforcement of the ordinance to the safe sleeping. They only, the the tie to the enforcement remained solely with the uh, storage for this section. So I believe that Councilmember Cummings is looking to add something right here. the people on the phone, the prohibitions above in, section, in subsection 6.36040, B1 and B2 shall not be enforced unless and until the above described unsheltered person storage program and a managed sanctioned sleeping site are operational and reasonably available to unsheltered persons in the city of Santa Cruz. I guess the big push behind this is really trying to get us to have managed sites and to really try to get away from these um, kind of unmanaged encampments that have really negative impacts on our community. So, Council um, Member Holder? Um, wait, did you call me? Yeah, Do you, is, this, uh, is this amendment okay with you? Um, this is okay. The only thing I was just thinking, I don't know how much back we went, but as far as the CDC guidelines, I'm just concerned that the emergency declaration is going to go on for I don't know how long. And I would just like to stick with the tiers if that's possible. And I, I don't know. Um, 
think that was uh, council member coming like what are your thoughts about that like and i'm not i'm fine with like the yellow orange or yellow or whatever the next lower one is i'm just concerned that we're going to be in a state of emergency for five more years i mean i just feel like i don't know when it's going to end um what are your thoughts council member Collintari johnson i think you had language that tied it to the tears yeah i i tried to um i i asked that it would change to yellow or um cdc guidelines change i added both because i i share the same concerns as council member golder that um we, we may be in a state of emergency for years to come um so just uh, some more flexibility um around that i think i think would be best so that's why i added the yellow tier or cdc guidelines yeah and as a seconder i'm i'm more comfortable with that i agree i think the state of emergency could could remain for years i would just um I wonder if there is a way for us to get some kind of inquiry around that. I think the reason why I'm concerned too is because as, um, as we're aware of the, I think it was the South Salido case that came before us um, where <clears throat> it sounded like in that case, the judge asked when the city went to um, enforce the movement of a camp in that community and the daytime sleeping ban one of the things that the courts asked was that was whether the city had any other you know document or group that they had you know been in consultation with that suggested um you know anything other than what the cdc was recommending in terms of how to deal with homeless encampments and when the city couldn't provide any just any justification um, that might have contradicted the CDC, uh, the, the courts pretty much said, well, if you can't show us any other documentation that would suggest that what you're doing is okay, then then that's not, then we can't uphold your request. And so that's the concern that I have, is that if we were to move forward and we were asked, you know, what are we using as a basis for, um, you know, taking down encampments in yellow tier, I don't think we have anything um legally to back us on that and so that's a big concern i have is that that's one additional legal hurdle that we'll be faced with if we leave it in so i'm happy to leave it in for now because this is obviously going to come back to us again and between now and um between now and april 13th i imagine a lot of things are going to change so if we want to keep it with yellow and cdc guideline changes for now um, I'm fine with that, and we can see how that changes uh, when it comes back to us on the 13th. I have a couple of questions. Uh, I just have to see a couple of hands up. I have Martine Bernal, Martine Watkins, and then Councilmember Brown. Do you have do you have comments on this section, or Martine? Uh, with respect to the uh, discussion earlier about the conditions for enforcement around having the safe sleeping sites. Um, I just want to be clear because there's the managed encampments and safe sleeping sites. So I want to be clear whether you're referring to the safe sleeping sites or managed encampments or both. Uh, the distinction being that the safe sleeping sites are over places where people stay at night. Uh, a managed encampment, oh, and one night at a time, where the managed encampment is a place where people stay for a longer period of time. And it's also uh, much more uh, uh, intensive with, as far as staffing and as far as cost is concerned. So there's a big difference there too. So I just wanted to be clear about what the intent there was. It's just the managed sanctioned sleeping sites. So I read this as a, as a sleeping sites, the, the safe sleeping sites. Yes, and I, and I guess the question that I have then is, um, my understanding is that the sleeping sites would be managed. Is that correct? Oh yes, they would be staffed. Yes, yes. So they would be yes. They, they, yes, they're not right. Exactly. But uh, yes, that just distinguish it. But it's not a it's not the managed encampment model. No, and that's why I was just being explicit with 
in this section that this isn't saying that we have to have a managed encampment. It's saying that we have to have a managed sanctioned sleeping site. And so the site would need to be approved by the city manager. There would need to be staffing and it would be for the purposes of overnight sleeping. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's clear. Um, I had two more items. Um, one question, one item was um, in the last, when, when, when this item came to us previously, um, I don't think that one of the friendly amendments I made was captured appropriately. And so um, the timing for when people can sleep, I was wondering if that could be amended so that for all of the sleeping is an hour before sunset to pitch a tent and then tent must be taken down by an hour after sunrise. And so um, just, I, I think before uh, it was only changed in the safe sleeping site between, and it was between 7 and 8 a.m. And amenable to keeping that too, but I was just thinking that, you know, in terms of providing that flexibility around um, changes in daylight and when people could take put up and take down their tents. I was just wondering if that would be amenable so that it's an hour before sunset to put up tents and an hour after sunrise. My only concern is the same concern I had last time was kids biking to school. And I know certain areas are off limit, but off limits, but kids live in all sorts of neighborhoods and there's schools in down by Harpy West and I just don't want um, kids to have to ride into the street because someone's camping on a sidewalk, and so I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. sure what time the sun rises in the winter, but I do know kids bike to school every month that school's open. So I don't know if anyone has any other feedback on that. I I mean I'm fine with whatever the will of the council is. I don't want to be the only decider on this one. I'm wondering is, is Susie O'Hara available? Because I just want to maybe ask, and actually I can ask um, maybe Martine as well. I'm just curious with the warming center. I know that's been operating in the city for a while, and I'm just curious what their hours are because that's a program that's seen that's been pretty effective, and um, it seems like it's operated in neighborhoods. It hasn't had very major impacts, and they have people coming in at certain times and then leaving in the morning. And so I'm just wondering if we can set hours maybe similar to that of the warming center. Um, I think he's 8 a.m. to 8, or 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., I think. That would be for non, that, so you would, I think we're blending two different things here. Are we trying to set the period of time you can begin to set up your nighttime sleeping site? And take down. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with an hour before sunrise. Um, I think it's a seasonal issue. So, um, Martine, you had your hand up. Which Martine are you talking to? Uh, Martine Watkins and then Martine Bernal and then Council Member Brown. I am, um, I had my hand up earlier just because I wanted to speak to the amendments that Council Member Kalantari Johnson and I proposed and sort of really explain conceptually where they, um, I think, meet a lot of the concerns that I had and that members of the community had brought before us. Um, but I, I think what, I mean, I, I apologize, but I think what I'm hearing um, it's really duplicative of what we've already sort of prioritized um, within our amendments and, and within the main emotion. So I'm, I'm sort of seeing a lot of, unless, I don't know how many more, like I can I can wait on my comments. I don't know how many more changes uh, Council Member Cummings has, but I'm seeing a lot of um, overlap between some of these very specific things with what was already previously directed, which is great because I think we're, I think aligned in that way, but um, I'm not sure if it's appropriate for me to make my comments now in terms of some of those broader themes if we're, if we're gonna go line by line through some of these changes still. Okay, I'll, um, 
Council Member Brown, do you have a comment on this particular item? So that's a good qu comment. I agree. Maybe we can. Um, so, so go ahead, Sandy, if you have a council member. I, I actually, I don't have a comment on this particular element, so I'll just wait until uh, we've been made it through this. I have a, another item that I'd like to just throw in the mix. Okay. So we're we're debating um, right now a change in the um, the time change, which would would be would reflect. And I believe um, Lee, I think maybe this was in some of your slides this, this morning, this today earlier. Right. Do you have a recommendation for? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the council could do a number of things. Right now, it's one hour before sunset to 7 a.m. is the allowance. Um, what I heard um, was maybe a desire to tie this to um, the sunrise in the morning and allow some time after sunrise. And then I also heard a, a concern about um, individuals, um, children going to school and biking to school. Um, I wonder if there is... Uh, something uh, along the lines of, you know, an hour after sunrise, but um, no later than 7.45 a.m. I'm not sure what time the, low, the earliest school starts, um, but just thinking of how to get to a compromise there um, along those lines. And it, it could be a half hour, it could be an hour, or, you know, um, but I think that that upper limit um, could be established to address Councilmember Golder's concerns and um, some additional time after sunrise could be allowed to address Councilmember Cummings' concerns. I just looked it up. Sunrise and December 21st is 7.18 a.m. and next year school is not set to start till before like 8.30, I think, because of the new state law. So I think an hour after sunrise or 8 a.m. would be fine if that's okay with everybody. And by the way, uh, the, uh, the storage program, the warming center storage program, that's open from eight to 10, and then from five to 7 p.m. Great. And we would still um, have the allowances for um, safe sleeping, you know, the, those uh, the safe sleeping, could operate outside of those hours to address, um, you know, the potentially incompatible use hours. I'm, I'm assuming that's the intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Council Member Cummings, how, how many more changes do you have? Um, I, I, I have three, but I think that a couple of them are, are re probably redundant, so I can just double check to see if those were already made. And then I think there's maybe one or two that haven't been expressed yet. And so I'd just like to uh, get those. So one was, um, I believe that it was expressed in Councilmember Councilor Johnson and Watkins motion uh, or their language to create clear language and criteria for misdemeanor charges um, and including, but not limited to having an encampment larger than 12 by 12 feet that's strewn with litter maintain large number of dismembered bikes inside or outside tents, have needles left unattended outside the tent. And that's building off of the language that, the, um, that was in our agenda report, but really trying to not criminalize the condition of being homeless, but really focusing on the behaviors. And so those are three examples. I'm sure there's more, um, but you know, really trying to get at, if you're gonna be sleeping outside, you need to really, one, keep your area clean and our environment clean and the other, um, we're not supporting bike chop shops and bike theft, period. So. Council member Watkins, is that, did your language, I think your language captures? Yeah, our language captures that along with some of the specific things that you listed or that Council member Boulder had listed in her original motion. So that's already covered. The other was to create a city sponsored diversion process for misdemeanor violations of the outdoor living ordinance. And so I know it was mentioned that there's opportunities for community, that we could create opportunities for community service, if people are in counseling, et cetera. And for those, um, um, by engaging in those kinds of um, services and, and giving back to the community, that these misdemeanors can get wiped off their record. And so I think that that would be something that we could look into. And I think it was recommended by staff as well. Okay. 
and that was also in the in the amendments along with um looking at a restorative justice approach to it so that we're not further harming an individual who may have experienced um houselessness and then occurred uh, a misdemeanor and then supporting them exactly to kind of be able to clear that so that they can find success so that's already covered as well and then i guess the last one um i didn't, I didn't this kind of is a question before i kind of put this out there but i was just curious you know is i know that we laid out like all the different zones where we can't camp and i'm just curious would it be clear to you know have a language that's just saying that you know for example prohibition prohibit unsanctioned camping on all public city property and rights of way that are required by local state or federal law to be free of obstruction and on city property adjacent to state and federal lands when safe sleeping sites and sanctioned managed transitional campus are made available for the purpose of overnight sleeping and so I know that we've laid out all the different zones, but would just kind of, you know, when there's sites for safe sleeping and managed encampments available and when there's beds available, can we, is there a way that we can kind of have a blanket statement of prohibiting camping in all areas of the city um, that have not been um, identified for safe sleeping? Looking at Lee. <laughs> So um, let me see if I can capture your, you said you want to prohibit in all, when there, when there are spaces available in safe sleeping zones, you want to prohibit camping in um, all other areas, in all areas of the city that are not the safe sleeping sites? Is that, is that what you're saying? So if there are spaces in the safe sleeping, and manage the camp, and then there would be no camping elsewhere. I mean, because I, I, my understanding is the objective of this is that if we have places for people to sleep, you know, and we're trying to have indoor shelter, and now we're trying to have overnight sleeping, and we have managed encampments that we really want to encourage people to go into those services where we can connect them to the county services and where we can, um, you know, kind of get people out of some of these sensitive habitats. And so it would make sense if we have beds available, our objective should be to get people into those spaces and not have people camping throughout the city and in places where we have identified we would prefer people aren't camping. And so I'm just kind of wondering what people's thoughts are around that or, and, if, and if that's something that we can do. I think I'd, I'd like to uh, hear Tony's interpretation on that. Well, from a, from a legal perspective, the Martin versus Boise decision stands for the, the principle that um, the city cannot enforce a prohibition on camping on public property uh, against a person who is homeless if they don't have a realistic alternative to sleeping on public property. And so if we could demonstrate that we have um, real realistic alternatives to sleeping on public property, then yes, a citywide camping ban is enforceable. And the key there is that a court would have to look at it and say that it's a realistic alternative. So low barrier, um, shelter, um, you know, ADA accessible, no restrictions on admissions based on, you know, religious affiliation or instruction or that sort of thing. So yes, those that, that's the key to having an enforceable citywide camping ban is for homeless individuals who have no alternative access to shelter, either because they can't pay for it or um, because it's not actually reasonably available to them for free, um, that, then it's difficult to enforce. But if we have those spaces available, then yes, we can enforce a citywide camping ban. I guess my my question for staff is, I, I mean, I don't know that we're gonna ever have those number of, I mean, I guess, I'm not sure we'll ha ever have those number of beds. So I'm, I'm just a little bit confused about, so I guess if, if you have eight, whatever it is, 450 beds, I mean, I, I just worry that you start to get into 
the number of beds and are we going to be chasing? I, I, I'm just wondering about that. Martine, maybe you, Martine Bernal, you, you look like you have a comment. Yes, what I was going to say is that uh, I think we don't we don't have the data to really know at this point uh, because uh, you know the census has approximately what is it 800 to a thousand uh, unsheltered in in the city of Santa Cruz. We've got uh, uh, you know the armory facility um, and then we've got the hotels. Although some of those are not necessarily long term because some of the funding will run out on on the. Uh, the hotels for the the uh, uh, hotel program um, in another county uh, after the because some of that is pandemic related funding um, and then if we add safe sleeping sites the the ordinance what you've directed is 150 so whether that'll be sufficient or not is is we really don't know for sure it's certainly it's certainly data that we will we'll, we can will be able to collect uh, more of uh, as the safe sleeping sites come up and. And if we can direct people there, that would be the first thing to do is, is, is uh, an enforcement that's necessary is to direct people there. Um, but if they're full, you know, we'll, 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 we'll know. And if they're, if they're full, we need to be able to uh, give them options. Um, so I just think we just, we just don't really know whether uh, that would be ideal, I think, if we could direct somebody to, to a site to, uh, always. Um, but I just don't think we have enough information at this point. Just following up on Martine's comment, just given that where we are today versus the point at which we could say that there's a re, you know there's a shelter option for every homeless person in the city of Santa Cruz, um, I think when and if we get close to that point, um, it would be perfectly appropriate for the council to consider, um, you know, modifying the language to to make that um, clear in the ordinance. At that time as well. Okay, I'm just. I guess I'm just a little confused then with how like enforcement of this is going to work. If um, so, I guess is the idea that we're going to create these safe sleeping sites, and then if we come across individuals who are camping in unpermitted areas, we're really going to just try to warn them so that they find alternative places to go. Um, I guess I'm just kind of confused. It, it seems like if someone is, if we have beds available, my understanding of what we've been trying to work towards is if there are beds available, we want people to utilize those beds and we want to try to fill that capacity. And um, if there is capacity and people are refusing to go, then potentially they can, I mean, my understanding is that they can actually be cited for not going. But if we, so I, I guess that's what I was trying to get at with that language. And it's just to reaffirm that, but I'm happy to not include it as well. Um, no, I think that's right. Right, Tony, that if, if yeah, if, if there's shelter capacity and it's made available to them, they, they can be cited. Uh, uh, what I was trying to, to get to is if, if, if they're full, mm -hmm. uh, then then we have to provide an option. And I guess that's that's a question we don't know whether the additional capacity is going to be added by the, uh, because right now that is a challenge that we have is that the current shelters are essentially full, at least there's just really no possible way, for example, to, that's a challenge that we have with uh, the current encampments. There's not enough space to offer to those individuals. And so, uh, you know, whether the, I thought your question was if, if we added these uh, uh, additional uh, uh, safe sleeping sites for the ordinance and, it all, and perhaps added a managed encampment as, as, as suggested, would that put us in that position to be able to enforce? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the answer is we don't know. Um, okay. Those are all the changes I had and um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but Thank you all for your patience. Council Member Golder, did you have a thought on that last amendment or accepting? I'm just, maybe we should just leave that one out for the time being, if that's okay, since we're all, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Council Member Brown. Thanks. Uh, so I, uh, I just wanted to follow up on the proposal to include direction about 
uh, uh, restorative justice in the case of misdemeanor uh, offenses. And, uh, you know, I, I, it occurred to me, I, I didn't have this thought when we were just talking about the ordinance because I don't know that it's, it's part, which would be part of an ordinance, but um, given that it's come up as additional staff direction, I'm just wondering if we could also think about um, a process that, that extends to uh, situations where people have tickets that are just piled up and may, may not be missed in here, but um, you know, a system for clearing those tickets. I know that uh, other cities have done it. Well, LA did it, um, Oakland has done it. And um, I know that uh, you know, it, it's, it has been helpful in uh, providing you know, a, a little bit of relief for people who are trying to you know, move forward uh, it's very difficult, for example, to, you know, it, it affects your, your work, uh, your, your employment qualifications, it affects obviously your ability to um, get housing. And, uh, you know, when those tickets pile up, they just end up going to collections, as we know. And so there are uh, systems that have been set up where uh, people can opt to, you know, to try to do this, but it requires that they also have, you know, meet certain criteria and have, you know, like a case manager who vouches for them or, you know, I, I just feel like if we're going to think about the misdemeanor uh, piece of this, that there's, there's also the bigger issue, um, which I know we've, it has been kind of raised from time to time, but it just feels like that might be worth also thinking about in, as part of a restorative justice approach. Mayor, if I if I may, um, having done restorative justice, I I completely share your interest in wanting to go in this direction. I think we should absolutely explore it. I do think that there will be additional partnerships that will have to um, enroll in that regard because they've already been to the court. They're kind of already in the system. My understanding is that what we can do at the local level is hold it and then have the restorative justice. Um, process occur and then not necessarily file on it and so there's that then there's just that's how we can do it at, as an intervention at the police level and, and I could be wrong but that's how I interpreted it but I, I do follow your interest and I, and I share your your you know your passion about wanting to go in that direction thank you yeah I, so I, I yes I hear you and but I think there's also uh, and I you know Chief Mills I don't know if you have any um, anything to add here but I know we talked about it at one point um, that this this would this could also be applied in cases where the tickets have just been on the books and, and you know and are, are never cleared and they are just clogging the system so that wouldn't necessarily be holding it but you know um but i i, I agree that um you know it, it needs further exploration to to move forward but i'd just love to see that in the conversation i share that chief did you have something to add yeah, just real quickly, Mayor, and uh, thank you for that, Councilmember Brown and Watkins. Uh, we certainly can do some research to find out um, with the City Attorney's Office how many tickets are currently outstanding, uh, who they are assigned to, and develop a process where we could uh, take a look at those tickets and see what can be done to expunge them or to remove them uh, from, the, from the system. Um, that would take a little bit of research and we could report back to you on that. You know, our thought process was to make sure this process is pre-arrest or pre-citation diversion, because uh, that would actually be a cost savings uh, for both us and the city attorney's office not having to process uh, an enormous amount of paperwork uh, that virtually um, is less than effective. So uh, we could certainly take a look at that and report back to you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think the benefit of having a, uh, a program like that would also, um, I mean, if, if we were able to get people into services um, in exchange for dismissing or expunging uh, citations, that would still be a good deal for the city, I think. So that's certainly worth exploring. And is that, ca that, 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 that that's captured in the intent of the restorative justice language that Councilmember Watkins and Kalantar Johnson offered, correct? Okay. 
No? Yeah. Yeah. What well, was that? I don't have the language right in front of me, but so essentially what we have is actively develop and pursue restorative justice programs. So I think it, you know, such as homeless court to incentivize positive behavioral change among those subject to the outdoor living municipal ordinance citation and or arrest. So I guess you could, you could potentially expand that. And I think that basically covers it as long as we have it on our checklist to follow up on it. Okay. Okay. Um, Bonnie, do you have a version that we could look at to try to take a vote on? I do. <laughs> I just have a couple of clarifying questions. Um, I did see a difference between the friendly amendment and Councilmember Golders was the date that it's supposed to be returned. One said April 13th and one said March 23rd. Can we just, what? I don't, like I said, I didn't want to be a, um, a jerk and put like a lot of work on the staff. So can we ask staff or maybe Martine can say what would be doable? Yeah, I think, uh, and I would also uh, defer a little bit here to, to Lee since uh, he and, and the team will do, do the bulk of the work. I think April 13th is, is probably reasonable. We can certainly uh, 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 try to shoot for sooner if you prefer. Um, but April 13th is, is, is fine. We can it, make these changes happen by then. Is that okay with, with, uh, with you, Councilmember Walken, and everybody else? Okay. And then my other clarifying co question was the CDC friendly friendly amendment from Councilmember Cummings that was not accepted, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Councilmember Golder, I think you were the one who. I would be more comfortable sticking with the tiers. And okay. I think we changed to the language that Councilmember Colantari Johnson provided. So it would reflect uh -huh. what's there. Yeah, there's their language. Um, and then, I, well, we'll get there. I had a, okay, here we go. And uh, Mayor, I had also one uh, clarification also um, uh, with respect to, uh, this is to clarify just expectations on the one uh, direction from uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson about the managed encampment, the, not, not the item specific to the ordinance, but the additional directions. Uh, with respect to the, uh, I think it said staff shall uh, pursue a managed encampment at 1220 River Street. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's further up. Uh, there it is, set stand up a managed camp at 1220 River Street. Um, again, just to uh, clarify expectations, uh, uh, obviously we can pursue this. I'm, I'm assuming, just to be clear, that this is uh, obviously contingent on uh, soliciting and, and finding uh, uh, both uh, operators uh, or, or, and uh, uh, funding uh, to be able to, to, to pursue this. Yes. Yes, that's right. Okay. okay. Yeah, and we'll work on our work on it, and then we'll give you progress on the on, in June. Is is what you're expecting then? Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Did you have a question? Oh. Councilmember Watkins, did you have anything to add? I did. I just had a few. I just had a few comments, but I, you know. I'm happy to, to reserve this till later before I keep going through the ordinance or some of the, okay. the final on this. Yeah. Anything else, Bonnie? Um, to clarify, no, I don't think, not unless when we go through it, no. Okay. Are we, um, are we ready? Oh, yes, there was one other thing. Um, I, I think, the maps amendment was maybe struck. Those are, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me delete those. Yeah. Because okay. instead, I believe we're going to direct that a, a map, basically. Well, a map will, will result because we're now going to, to find people, places where people can be. 
correctly? Those, those provisions, I think, may have been needed. Could you pop those back up there, Bonnie? Yes. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, so those provisions might be need. They are needed in order to um, identify the affirmative places. I think they, they may actually be redundant, but um, rather than checking for their redundancy, because I think um, farther down in the motion it also lists those. Um, but we can um, we can adjust that accordingly um, when we come back. And I do have, um, I'll, I'll mention since we're talking about the map, I do have a, a map that I um, threw together, a rough map, I will say, that shows um, what I believe to be the affirmative areas that the council is um, uh, looking at right now. So I can share that with you if you'd like to see it. Um, yeah, let's take a look at that. Okay, Bonnie, can you stop your screen share for a moment? Okay. Okay, um, very rough, but these are just polygons that I threw together, you know, at a high level showing um, the commercial and industrial areas. So these white blocks here are um, areas that would be under consideration. That, that removes the open space areas um, and focuses just on the industrial and commercial areas. You can see some interspersed, but mostly along the corridors, Harvey West and the far west side. But the no daytime camping um, component is in effect, at least until uh, until a lot of the other things, I mean, not in, immediately, but according to COVID and other, those other things. Right, following right. either, yeah, the- uh, Sometimes when, okay. Or tier or, um, CDC guideline changes. Okay, um, Tony, what's the most efficient way for us to go through the motion? Is it line by line, or do we can we adopt it as a bent with the uh, intent of the the thing here? I, I think is that the council has, I think, by consensus, framed the motion that's in front of you right here. Unlike um, making these changes to the ordinance as part of a first reading, you know, we still need to go back through the ordinance and translate this into the text of the ordinance. So I don't think you need to go line by line through it because we're going to have to work with this to bring back a red line for you uh, when we bring it back. Okay. So are we adopting, we, so are these amendments to the original ordinance, so we are adopting the ordinance tonight and then um, and then directing staff to come back with these amendments as a first, as a first reading? That's, a, that's how I read the language. Right. Okay, I just wanna make sure. Sorry, what, can you repeat? So we're adopting the ordinance that was introduced last time and directing amendments to come forward. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So do you want me to scroll through these or? Um, Tony, do we need to go through each and every one or? What I think Bonnie just scrolls down through it. Okay. Um, and anyone can say stop if, if you need to catch up. Wait, I think I saw something that said orange and then something that said yellow for the tiers. Sorry to interrupt. Huh. I think it says yellow down here and it said orange up higher. I don't know if I'm wrong. This is a 
copy and paste, so I don't. Go up a little bit further. I think I might have seen the same thing right there. Tier is orange. Yeah. And then it says yellow down at there at number five. Maybe just erase that thing. I, this was from Calendary Johnson and Watkins friendly amendment. So mm -hmm. I'm sure which, I don't know which one is the orange or the yellow. Erase the orange, right? Yeah, I believe you yeah. erased the yeah, exactly. Did you say erase the orange? Erase the orange. And make it yellow? Sorry, it's actually further down. It's, I think it says here, yeah, um, uh, number five right there. So it's, it's the yellow and CDC guidelines, whichever occurs first. So that's the language. Yeah. The one above, um, Bonnie, I think goes away altogether. Yeah. Um, yeah. This one, all of it? Yep, all of it. Bonnie, I don't know if it's captured further down, if I may. I don't know if it's captured further down, but I know when we were discussing the maps, we did explicitly state needing to have a map that shows all the areas for camping. And I don't know if that language comes back later, but I know that it was mentioned at the top. And so well, language around the maps was included at the top. So I just wanted to put that on our radar as we're going through this. What What's the language? Uh, the language was to... Um, provide a map of all um, sites where camping will be allowed. Oh, I did have that somewhere. Yeah. I think. I think I have it somewhere, but I'll add it. I think it was part of what um, Councilor Watkins and I might have proposed. Um, so it's, I think it's like number one under what we proposed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or keep, I'm sorry, keep going out. It's, yeah. There we Clear, go. For the clarity. Uh -huh. yeah. One date that says March 9th. I wonder if, if we could. Oh. That was acknowledging that, that the county had taken action on March 9th. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I forgot, did we decide to erase the, the 25 or 75 feet from the trail? Oh, so. Yeah, we did. Uh, down below, Bonnie. I think she actually wrote strike above it. Above it. Oh, she did. Yeah, yeah the, the whole thing, right? Yeah, sorry, Bonnie. I didn't see that it said strike after I read that. Movie. And this is this is my note taking. Duplicates. Okay. And and did you put th that other part there about contacting like social workers or C and CPS if there's kids? In D right there. No. No. That's not work. I would. I don't need to like this one. Yeah. I think also, I, we, maybe we want to, I don't know if we need to, but 
just acknowledging that the county had already really set forth priority for families for their sheltering and rapid rehousing. So I don't know how that fits. I mean, maybe it fits into the continuum of care, but I just want to acknowledge that that's a priority. Yeah. If, if I could speak to that, I think part of that would staff show work um, with the county and the state to attempt to find families temporary shelter or housing. And that was to get to that point that this is, you know, the county's already put that as a priority. And so working with the county and the state and so state agencies, I think that includes all the above child protective services, you know, whatever is necessary to have those conversations, but just any state or county agencies. So just to confirm, that would mean I don't need to specify CPS. Is that what you mean by that? Well, the, the, yeah. the county CPS is actually a county function. So well, if it's okay. covered in the county, yeah. County yeah. Mm -hmm. I Well, the only thing I think is that I have concern that let's say a family is unsheltered and the parents don't want to go to the managed encampment or don't want the shelter but the child through no fault of their own is now homeless and they're the outreach workers the social workers are offering it and they don't want to take it and let's say these kids are not in school or not of school age if cps isn't involved then there's no one there to specifically advocate for the children and their welfare and so i really i think we can yeah, no, I follow you. I think we could add it. And I just, I think that also those guys, those folks are generally mandated reporters. So if they're okay. observing what you're describing, then they're required by the law to actually report it to CPS to at least open an investigation. Yeah, because it's like, as a mandated reporter, sometimes I have to report. It's not my place to judge. It's not my place to exactly. follow. It's just report. And they really do an excellent job of advocating for what's best for kids. Absolutely. So I'm happy to say, and uh, yeah, I, we can definitely spell that out. Can I get some language? So work with the county, including, you know, child protective services. I think that's, I mean, I think that gen generically covers it. It's, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, can you please email the uh, current language? Is this the end? No. Nope. It is the end, but um, I didn't know what we landed on here. I think that was it because Councilmember Goldberg pointed out that in the winter, the sunrise is at 719 and since schools aren't going back till 830, that that was, um, mm -hmm. that, that was okay. So long as it was, I think, before 8 a.m. is what she had mentioned. or before 8 a.m.? But no later than 8 a.m. Oh. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Um, Here, I will lower my hand. Can I just make a few, a few brief comments with one suggestion and then I'll lower my hand? <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. I just wanted to do, I wanted to make sure we got through this before I did, but, um, I guess, I'll just say sort of in general, I don't wanna keep everybody any later than we need to be here, but I just wanna say thank you for all of your work and attention to the details of this and really extend our gratitude to the city staff, but also the community members who spoke up and shared their concerns with the specific aspects of the ordinance. And as you can see that um, the issue is complicated and the ordinance is complicated as well. And I feel really, I feel really good in the direction that we're going in and the clarifications that we've made this evening is particularly around the misdemeanor, the families, um, around identifying the locations, the sensitive areas in our community, around some of the accountability metrics, um, but also having just really observed a lot of conversations. This is really big for our community. This is actually, this is a big step in a direction to provide a lot more um, services and resources, and that's a really big deal for a lot of uh, unhoused individuals here in our community. 
um, and those impacted. And I wonder, and then I'll leave with the, just the brief suggestion, is I wonder if when we're thinking about communication strategies, if we can have some sort of quick kind of like fact sheet of what what this looks like so that the community is really aware of um, some of these nuances and um, it's, just, it's just, you know, um, adequately communicated to the community all that this entails. And I know it's gonna be forthcoming and, and iterative, but um, some sort of, you know, clarifi clarifying document I think would be beneficial to the community because I heard a lot of misinformation this evening as well. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings and then I'd like to, if we can, take a vote. I'm gonna make a quick comment. I've already mm -hmm. given my uh, comments on multiple occasions about uh, the kind of the ethics and efficacy concerns that I have uh, with moving in this direction. I just wanna say, you know, um, Council Member Watkins, you said earlier that um, and others kind of alluded that um, we have we need to be in action, and I totally agree. I, um, you know, I've been hoping for some action for a long time now on this issue, um, but uh, you know, I also think that there, you know, there are other actions that we can and should be taking. I'm glad to see that uh, safe sleeping programs and managed encampment. Uh, you know, possibilities are now on the table, and I totally support that. Um, you know, I, I, it, it I would have loved to see that happen uh, or sooner. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and now I think, you know, we just are where we are. Uh, I, you know, I think that investment in those kinds of programs is gonna be a much more effective way to uh, provide relief for, uh, you know, our community, both housed and unhoused, um, than, you know, investing money in uh, defending uh, the lawsuits that I believe are uh, are coming. And so I'll just, you know, and I think that, that in partnership with community and faith-based organizations, this could actually be a much more affordable than the cost that we've seen, um, you know, the projections. So um, I, I guess I'll just, I'll leave it there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased about some of the changes that are being made and, and yet I cannot support uh, moving forward in, in this direction at this time. Okay. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, I had um, one comment to make. I think that the second to last that prohibit camping in all areas of the city that are not safe sleeping sites, I don't think that was accepted. And so uh, I think that should be stricken. And then, um, Bonnie, if you could scroll back to the top once you've removed that, I did have a question. Like, so if you can go all the way back to the top. So I do want to see if we can separate. I didn't see that um, part of the motion tonight was to adopt what's currently before us. Um, and so I would like to see if we can separate the motion because I'm supportive of the changes that we've provided and the direction to move back, to, to bring us back um, on April 13th. However, I'm not, I, I'm not supportive of adopting what's before us. And I also have a question for the city attorney. Um, regarding um, that action. So at the last meeting, I think even before the meeting started, there were uh, changes that had been suggested to the ordinance by staff that um, were not included in the packet. And then the council went and made significant changes to the language that was before us at the last meeting. And having had discussions with other members um, of the public, uh, one of the, I think a lot of people would see what's before us tonight as a first reading rather than a second reading, and it wasn't published as a second reading. And so I'm wondering, legally, can the uh, council adopt um, the ordinance that's before us tonight since it wasn't publicly advertised as a second reading? And given the substantial amount of changes that we made at the last meeting, it would 
my my understanding and obviously I've only been doing this for two and a half years now, but um, my understanding is that it should come to us at the first reading. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Well, um, <clears throat> let me see. Yeah, so the, the, the uh, recommended action is consider adoption of amend of Ordinance 21-03, amending Chapter 636 of the Code, and consider potential modifications as part of the current ordinance as drafted or as part of subsequent amendments. So I do see this as uh, teed up for adoption tonight if that's the direction of the council. And I'm familiar with arguments that were made that um, somehow staff recommending that the council consider additional changes before it was introduced at the last meeting and then the council making additional changes before it was introduced somehow um, was improper or was even a Brown Act violation and I just don't buy that. Um, the council has the ability to make changes to an ordinance before its introduction and then it's published and, and um, and, and the charter says that you can't finally adopt it until uh, at least five days after it's uh, introduced uh, for publication. So um, I, I don't see any procedural uh, impediment to the council taking final action tonight. I would like to make a comment about one thing that I, I guess I missed uh, during the discussion of the amendments um, incorporating um, the, the recommendations from uh, Council Members Watkins and Callan, sorry, Johnson. Um, and if this is not the appropriate time, I can I can defer that. But um, yeah, I don't see a problem with the council taking action tonight. As a second reading, Tony, just for clarity. Okay. Um, Tony, do you want to go ahead and just if, and then I'll go back to Council Member coming. I, if there's something that we need to clean up, is that yeah? So. Yeah, if I could just very briefly, uh, the original language that was proposed by the, the initial maker of the motion, um, uh, Council Member Golder, was that the city staff shall not implement enforcement until amendments are made and the CDC COVID tier is orange and the council by consensus uh, changed orange to uh, yellow I got that, but what I did not realize is that the, the amended language only refers to the daytime restrictions, and there are a lot of new prohibitions in the ordinance. I think it just makes more sense if it just if the language stays as initially proposed by Council Member Golder to say that implementation will not occur until. Uh, the CDC guidance changes or um, we enter the yellow tier. So just throw that out there. This one right here? Right. Yeah, that makes sense, Tony, to um, take out the daytime restriction and, and have just implementation. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. All right, and so just, just to be clear, the language that was proposed is that uh, implementation shall not occur until amendments are made and the CDC COVID tier is yellow. So also the amendments are part of that. Did you say yellow? Yellow. Yes, that's what, so, the, that's what I understood. So this should be yellow, okay. Yeah. I really appreciate I'm sorry, Mayor. I, if it's okay, I just really appreciate you clarifying that because they are really in tandem, right? In terms of the adoption, really is contingent on us also moving forward with these amendments before actual implementation occurs. So, by adopting tonight, is also acknowledging that these amendments have to occur before it's ultimately implemented, but keeps us moving in a direction of action. I guess, yeah. Well, I have to admit, at this late hour, um, I probably would have overlooked that if. Cassie hadn't been giving me a nudge uh, with text messages. Thank you, Cassie. 
everyone for all your comments. Lee, I see you have your hand up. Yes, if you could go back, Bonnie, to number five um, that we were just working on. City staff shall not implement enforcement until uh, amendments are made and um, either CDC guidelines change or COVID tier is yellow. I think that was the intent. Good catch. Correct. And Laura caught that behind the scenes. Thanks, Laura. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Whichever is sooner. <laughs> yes. Good. Bonnie, I'll um, 
I'll go ahead and call for a roll call vote. Council members Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? No. Cummings? I have a qu clarifying question. Is this the first, because the motion's been separated, and so I just want to make sure that we're voting yeah, on. This, this would be the ready. motion to adopt. The second reading. Okay. No. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Are we voting separately on the amendments? We're, right now we're voting on the adoption of the ordinance introduced last meeting. And then there will be a second vote for the amendments. Yes. Right. Okay. And Tony, can you one more time explain the time, the timing of this, either option? I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand your question, Vice Mayor. Uh, the uh, adoption of the second reading and right, then... So the adoption of the second reading uh, would, would take effect 30 days uh, from from final adoption tonight. However, the direction that would be given should the council adopt the second part of the motion, which is next, would be to defer its implementation until the council has amended the ordinance uh, consistent with the follow-up direction with all of these elements that we've been discussing. Um, and, and, uh, or until CDC guidance has changed or we enter the yellow tier. It sounds like, the, so that makes it that the 30 days is kind of out the window. Well, that's, yeah, it won't be in effect in 30 days, but I will just say that, um, you know, um, I won't say that city city council legislative time is like geologic time, but it, it's a lot slower than uh, regular time. And so if we had something in place in 45 or 60 days, I still think that would be uh, a big step forward for the council. And then, oh, sorry. No, please go ahead, Vice Mayor. And then the other um, scenario is that this goes back as a first reading, you were, you were saying, and then that process starts over again. Yeah, you can't, you couldn't even do a first reading on this tonight because we would, we would spend the next four hours trying to figure out how to, how to, to convert this motion language into the actual text of the ordinance. So at a very minimum, um, we would have to bring back the ordinance for introduction at a subsequent meeting. Or unless you wanted to stay here all night and hammer out the, all of the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So my vote is aye. And Mayor Myers? My vote is aye. So that motion passes with five. Let me grab my script. I got this right. Sorry, everybody. Too many papers tonight. Too late. Uh, Bonnie, give me the language that I need to. So the motion passes with five. It passes, yeah, with five to two. Council five. members Brown and Cumming voting no. No. Okay. Now, Tony, we need to, to vote on the the following the amendments next. That's right. And we can do that as as the amendments. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, I think the second part of the motion is to um is to the following the direction set forth in the in the text. 
Okay. So the motion is to direct staff to return by April 13th, 2021 with an amended ordinance to include the following. And we've reviewed all of those. Right. As well as the additional staff direction that's contained in the written motion. Okay. Do folks have questions on this? Like lots of hands up. There was just one bit that was missing, whichever comes sooner for phrase, on phrase number five, but I think Bonnie, you just added that. Yes, okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, Lee, did you have a comment on this? No. Okay. I think everything was captured. Okay. And council member Cummings? Um, I actually have a pretty major concern. So if you can scroll down to that language, the number five. So the way that I interpret this is that if, because looking at the calendar, it looks like uh, April 13th is probably less than or more than 30 days away. And if that's the case, and we, I mean, if we continue at the rate that we're at, we could end up in yellow before this comes back to council with the amendments. If that's the case, then technically we could, this, the ordinance that was just adopted tonight could be enforced. And that enforcement would include many of the open spaces that we heard from the public that they said they did not want to see outdoor living in. So I don't that think that's, that's not how it reads to me. It reads to me that it shall not implement enforcement until amendments are made and either CD, CDC guidelines change or the COVID tier is yellow. So the guidelines can change, the COVID tier can, can turn to yellow, but the amendments are made in addition to that. So one does not preclude the other. Okay. So essentially by adopting what we did tonight, we're sort of acknowledging that we're not gonna go into the details of it, but we're not gonna enforce it or have it be applied until these amendments are made. So we're, you know, essentially process-wise saving time. Okay, thanks for that clarification. I think um, Council Member Cummings, if it is helpful, it says, when they're made and instead of and not or. Mm -hmm. I just, and I want to just make sure that that was clear to having not having it before me, I was concerned. So thank you. Glad we were able to. Werner, did you have a question? I had another clarifying question. I think um, it would be helpful to maybe state what, when this, comes back these amendments, will there be an opportunity for public comment input? And that pro what does that process look like so that everybody's clear? It's a complete do over. So yes, there will be uh, opportunities for public comment, both uh, assuming that it's introduced on the 13th. And then when it comes back for final adoption, just as just as we've gone through uh, over the past two meetings. So that's great. I think there's a lot that happened tonight. And so I think um, that that's great to clarify. Thank you. Okay, so Bonnie, I will um, uh, ask you for a roll call vote. Council Member Watkins. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Brown. No. Hi, sorry, I was muted. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. So that motion passes with um, six voting yes and um, one voting no. Uh, Council Member Brown voting no. And I believe we almost beat, beat our record from last two weeks ago, but not quite. Uh, anything else? Um, let me look at our, I believe we are officially adjourned. Um, just wanna thank everybody for hanging in there. And um, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, did you have another comment? No, okay. 
Well, we are officially adjourned and thank you everyone and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Good night everyone. Thank you.